All right. Um, I'm Shireen Joshi. This is joint work with Sandeep, Daniel, Peter, and Shashank. Um, I'll jump up. The starting point of our research is to note that polluted water kills more than a million people a year, and that's a conservative estimate based on end of um, you know based on end of use um, points rather than source. We also note that executive and legislative policies have been inconsistently effective across the world, and that concerned citizens have increasingly turned to courts for um, for protection and environmental conservation, right? So there is something like two and a half thousand environmental courts operating in the world right now in more than 70 countries, right? According to the most recent estimates. Judges are under pressure to step up and rule on these cases. As we were talking yesterday in the Q&A, this is hard because judiciaries don't always have the kind of data that, that we would ideally like to see to assess which direction to kind of rule. So, so that gets complicated. And the real question that that is that is important to note is, or that people ask is whether judges even have this kind of agency. Can they enforce environmental justice? Does what they do matter, right? In terms of reducing pollution. We study India to answer this question. It's a uh, high toxicity, high water stress, setting in which policies really have been inconsistently effective. Michael Greenstone's work, um, a, variety, a, a lot of papers that followed since then, including some of my own, have, have documented this. And really courts, you know, public interest litigation, courts have stepped into the limelight. Courts are some of the most trusted institutions in India, even an era of, you know, executive and legislative polarization or gridlock. And increasingly, we see courts step into the space of defending environmental regulations. To um, you know, quickly give you a preview of what we're going to find, we find that pro-environmental rulings do read, lead to reductions in peak toxicity levels. It's it's small and it's short, but it's there. We don't see any decrease in mortality for children, and post decision, we actually see both pollution and mortality exceed pre-decision levels. So that's both good and bad news, right? So there's some effect of judiciaries, it's just not as big as we, we thought we, we might find. Okay, so how do we do this? We use a new data set. Uh, we have 978 pollution cases, which I'll say more about, which we compiled ourselves. We have a data set on um, indicators of water pollution that come from the Indian government, as well as the water resources information systems, which is kind of the new, um, you know, one shop stop for, for water toxicity data. And we have demographic data from the largest population surveys. Right? So we use an IV framework. We acknowledge that green judgments don't just happen randomly. They emerge from somewhere. And we study the random assignment of judges. And we look at how judges ruled in all the cases before the environmental case to generate a prediction of how they might rule. And I'll have to convince you that this works, right? So, so that's the paper. So just a caveat, we're looking at the impact of green rulings um, conditional on the presence of environmental cases in the districts of India, right? So it's, it's um, caveated on that. I'll skip this um, contributions to literature in the interest of time. We can come back to it if, if we need to. But to jump into data, um, we extract, we, we started with the universe of 74 million observations from the Supreme Court, high courts, and green tribunals that exist through the entirety of India's um, legal history, which, you know, um, green rulings only arrived very recently, right? So the Water Act, the Environment Act are, are recent. So most of those, most of that history is, is not of value to us here. We scrape orders from Indian Kanun. We have a separate paper looking at the impact of Indian Kanun, which is a free legal search engine on, demo, on the rule of law in India, but that's for another day. We extract the judge names from the corpus of rulings, 
And then we kind of look at those judges going back into the, you know, we leave out the environmental case and look at how they ruled in previous cases, right? So we then um, identify all court orders that are related to, so we identify cases that cite basically the Water Act, 978 of them. There is a puzzle. We expected to find much more. I was surprised that we had just 978 ruling or you know orders related to water toxicity. Maybe we're being conservative and looking at you know real meaty orders, but this is actually an interesting question in its own right. Is in a large country like India with this level of water stress and toxicity, why don't we see more? And actually, we're doing a current project on air. We find many more cases on air pollution than water. And strangely, the cases don't seem to come from the locations where there's the most pollution. So there's a lot of interesting puzzles. This is, you know, I know I have half hour, but part of what I'm trying to do here is open up slightly new questions, right? And I'm hoping some of you will, will come talk to me after. I think we need a lot, a lot of a lot more research on this. Right. So anyway, we also extract location. We study each case. We look at geographic locations of these cases. Um, but we had a team of law students hand, you know, read these and hand code them in the pandemic. Now, of course, we have ChatGPT, and that's another research project we're doing: is comparing human coders to ChatGPT, and that's a paper in its own right as well, because actually ChatGPT does really well, but so do the human coders in different ways. Right, so that's interesting in its own right. Um, we study BOD and COD. We study the max values of BOD and COD. These are commonly used measures of industrial pollution. We also use some additional metrics of pollution that are largely going to be measuring domestic pollution. Yeah. Can I just clarify, question the morning. Can you have or can you exploit variation in the type of? I don't know anything about this type of ruling, but is it, are there some that are associated with criminal sanctions or financial penalties or whatever? Can you look at? We're doing that. So I'll show you some of that data. These are think what you should think of is these are largely rulings. More than half of them are involving firms. So the typical ruling, more than half of them, is the firm is polluting. It's non-compliant with the CPCB, kind of like Michael Greenstone's papers yesterday, right? And it's not compliant, and the they, they, the court wants to either issues an order saying either clean up or shut down. That's the kind of thing. But having said that, there are other types as well. And we can, you know, we, we haven't gone more into that, but we do plan to at some point. So, okay, for infant mortality, we look at three different indicators. An infant died during the first year, first month, or survive, died during the first year, conditioned on surviving the first month, because that's the way we understand the vulnerability toward water toxicity works, right? And in terms of that's the child health literature. So here's some maps of our data. Now remember we're studying surface water pollution. Um, we'll have more data from where the rivers are, right? And these are scattered all over India. Um, to, to answer your question there, in terms of we have some data on order characteristics. The red line is the total. There's interesting, there's so much to be studied here. The fact that this is going up over time. Right, it's not like it starts in around the 1980s, which is really when the Bhopal gas tragedy, the, you know, the Environmental Act of India comes into being. So the ports have something to work with, right? They really didn't have any laws on the books that they could enforce in that precise way before that. So that's the total. Most of it involves the government. There are some appeal cases at the Supreme Court, but largely these are. Firm X is polluting, it won't comply with regulations. We've tried many times and the government wants to take them to court to either force them to clean up or shut down, right? So um, there is public interest litigation on the rise, but I thought it would be higher than it is, right? This is largely, um, so we'll look at keywords, but again, firms are the biggest keyword, right? Um, we have another work stream of this project, which I'm not showing you today, where we actually extract the names of firms from these cases and we try to look at the effect of litigation on those firms. Now, we don't have great sample size and, you know, Namrata is not here, but we don't have great firm level data to get at the, the end up. But we, we can do it better for air pollution than we can for water pollution. So that's something we, we are also working on. Okay, so jumping into the kind of meat of it, our basic regression model takes 
pollution or mortality in district D at time T as the dependent variable, we look at the fraction of green verdicts in that district. So we're taking everything to the district level, right? So we're looking at a district, how many green verdicts were there? What fraction of them went green? Sorry, how many environmental cases were there? And what fraction of them went green, right? That's our independent variable. Um, an institutional question, how are judges appointed in this context? So that's a good question. Um, judge appointment is complicated in India. It's based on the collegium system, right? Judges appoint each other. They're not politically appointed. And the collegium system is a little of a bit of a black box, right? Like it's complicated. I won't say that politics doesn't matter. It's through the collegium and politics absolutely matters, but it matters indirectly. But even there, I'm gonna try to persuade you that judges may be appointed, um, you know, um, with all sorts of unobserved processes that might matter for us. But within the within the set of judges on a court, who's assigned to an environmental case is much more random, right? And there's a kind of roster system that works at the courts, and we can come back to it in Q and A. But it's, there, we observe very few judges coming in multiple times. Almost everybody's there once, at most twice. I, I think the max is three. We just don't see the water pollution judge, right? Which is what I thought we would, but we don't. So, yeah. How many cases distributed across districts? Because I guess you said you have 900. Yeah, cases. so on the right. So there are a small number where there are many. Yes. Okay. Yes, and that's, you know, the, the good news is they're not all in one location. They're scattered across India. But yeah, it's it's a it's it's not what we thought it would be. There's 150, which in India, you know, gives us a decent N. But yes, we don't have all 600 Indian districts having environmental cases. Yeah, there are more than 150. I think it's more like 180 districts that have it. But it's large enough, but it's not 600, which is the number of districts in India. Yes. So are there any ones where they're not? Pro or anti environment? Yeah, there are neutral ones. So, in theory, the anti environment could encourage pollution and mortality? Yes. Um, so, we made the decision to go is it green or not? We didn't look at the kind of anti green, right? Because it's, it's complicated to measure that in the sense, and we could, right? So by the way, this is human coding in the pandemic. We had 27 law students of India read these and in the we, we got them to score cases between minus two and two, a kind of Likert scale. But right now we're saying, is it above zero or not? We could certainly exploit the negatives, but what we found is there was much more disagreement between our teams on, the, you know, is it, anti-green or not. There was very little disagreement. You could know a green case when you saw it, but is it working against the environment or not was much more complicated. Yeah. How localized is water pollution in these contexts? Especially like riverine rightwise. You might imagine that action in a district has a positive impact on downstream districts. Yeah, and I've written that paper on the Ganga River, right? I've showed that shutting down tanneries in Kanpur affected downstream pollution and mortality. So the answer to that question is in Kanpur for the tanneries, you could trace pollution downstream, but that's an exceptionally polluted spot, right? Kanpur is one of the most polluted areas. Your average um, firm in these districts we, we're not looking at downstream pollution right now. We're not exploiting the flow of rivers, which is what we did in Everett. For every pollution location, we had an upstream and a downstream location in buffers, and we were able to do that. But that was just such an egregious form of pollution that we could do it. Here, we haven't done that because it is quite localized. The average case here is one firm, you know, and we're averaging it across a district yeah. year not district month, we just don't have that kind of power. So it's district year. Whereas to exploit the flow of pollution, we need to go much more granular. And we just haven't done that. The science gets a little bit harder to do. 
Yes, did you have a question? I'm sorry. Some hands somewhere. All right, I'm gonna move on here, right? So um, I've already said this, it's conditional on the presence of a green case, right? This is our, our fraction variable. So of course the concern here is that, well, green verdicts don't just happen, right? Like they happen in response to so many things that are affecting both the Y variable um, and, you know, and, and the quartz. So what we, what we really want to do is we want to look at a first stage where we model the green verdicts as a function of something else and then look at the, the predicted value of green verdicts. Mm -hmm. Now that something else is what, you know, I was saying we use the kind of history of judges. For every judge in our sample, we gather data on all their previous rulings in the corpus of all Indian you know, judicial cases. We leave out the environmental case that we're studying. We also leave out you know, all the environmental cases they've ever heard. However, there aren't that many, right? Like we have a maximum of three of, of our highest um, incidence of, of <laughs> case judges. So this is basically a equation that says we use a an algorithm called Doc2Vec, which essentially uses, um, it studies the full corpus of cases that are heard by a judge in our sample. And, can, and you know, we, we do um, the, the kind of textual analysis of how they write and represent their writing in the form of a set of 25 numerical vectors, right? Each one of those vectors is not meaningful. They are only meaningful as a collective because together they represent how judges write. And, and in the paper, I try to convince you that constitutional judges cluster in one area, you know, those who track environmental jurisprudence at the international level, that's like a thing among Indian judges, cluster in another area. So I can't see, I, we can't use each one of these vectors individually. We can only use them as a collective. Yeah. When not far along, there's seven and a half thousand of those. We haven't yet done the maths for all the judges in that sample, and think, and that's something we will do down the road. So, but if there's overlap between the samples, I meant you could use this behavior and have there's many more acquisition cases. And maybe yes, but so we will do that at some point. Right now, we didn't have that sample of the seven and a half thousand with the accurate judge look, you know, IDs taken out because you know, um. Amit Singh occurs multiple times. It could be a different Amit Singh. So we will need to be careful with this. We haven't done this before. Yes. Uh, yes, about uh, judges and their writing style. So there is a judgment. And as you know, uh, there is an operative part of the judgment where the order or what, what the um, actual decision is. And then there is the reasoning. So why would you sort of go back into the reasoning of it and why would you not simply take the order which would be a much more accurate representation of what the final is? We are interested in the reasoning of it. Mm -hmm. we, we really are. We actually think environmental jurisprudence in India was evolving over this time period. You know, judges didn't have a lot of precision to work with. They were doing this as they went so, along. So so ju just as a follow-up, uh, looking uh, sort of st stepping out of the presentation, so have you seen the reasoning of all by using this mm -hmm. algorithm? You've seen that the, the pattern of, uh, you know, yeah. reasoning change. So you can see the Dr. Vec algorithm. What we can, I can show you if you'd like, you know, it's 25 dimensions, so you can't see it properly. So we use a method called s and &E, um, which takes 25 dimensions and reduces it to two dimensions so that we can see it. And you can see there are constitutional judges. They always invoke the right to life in the Indian constitution, or you know, there are about three areas of the Indian constitution which have environmental implications, right? So you, they use that. There are some who really track international law, maybe because they have personal objectives to go serve in tribunals and all that, they use that. We think it's actually important. Now, we're excluding environmental cases. If the judge has heard an environmental case, we're excluding that environmental case and we're just looking at how they think, how they rule in general, right? But some judges are much more, they're, they're routinely delving into the constitution rather than precedent, right? So we want that variation. That makes it kind of, that's interesting in its own right, I feel, right? So moving on a bit, what I would say is, oh, and we make the assumption 
that cases are randomly assigned to judges and courts, right? Which is my co-authors have worked on this. There's a new paper by our, um, a new book by Aparna Chandra, which came out just about a, a couple of weeks ago, which studies court um, case assignment at the Supreme Court of India in a pretty systematic way. And she supports, or their team supports largely. It is really difficult to mess with case assignment. There are these roster systems. There's a not before me list which means if you have any personal connection, you know, to any of the litigants, they're excluded. So it's as good as random, uh, you know, in, in terms of, so at least you'll have to grant us that in the interest of time. Yes. Um, so you could also imagine a form of selection, I think, in which if you have stricter districts, you know, where the, the population kind of demands more strictness, judges might be more strict and prosecutors might also bring cases that are on the margin weaker. And so you might have on average weaker cases before the court that lead to more losses. So I'm gonna try and convince you that that's not happening. Give me one minute, right? Okay. So I've already said this, so maybe I can skip it. And actually I can show you this. Here's Maharashtra, the state. The blue dots, which are the stable non-wobbly line are the predicted uh, pro-green decisions based on all the available judges at the court. So you take everybody at that court, to your point, maybe a court is just a conservative court, and you predict whether they would rule green based on that. The red is the actual green orders, and the green is our prediction of the green orders. And what I what is nice is, you know, I know you can't see it properly, but the point is the red dots and green dots are idiosyncratically, erratically above and below the line. That's my only, what you're saying might be true, but it's not true systematically, right? And that's the advantage of us using our econometric tricks here, right? I have some other randomization checks, but in the interest of time, I'll maybe come back to that in, in Q&A. Here's our core result. Right, all our estimates are negative, but the one that we really observe statistical significance for is biological oxygen demand. That's the one we have the highest N for as well. And basically, if the fraction of green cases goes up by one percentage point in our sample, the max observed BOD in a district year goes down by about 0.21%. I don't know, that's big or small. To us, it looks small, right? We've got a whole bunch of robustness checks. We've got three-year moving averages, which shows largely the same. We have, um, you know, oh gosh, where are we? We have obviously adjusted for the AR confidence. You know, we, we have AR confidence intervals. It survives that. Yes, sir. I guess moving on Anna's question, if your measure of how likely uh, a judge is to vote green or not, or rule green or not, is sort of noisy because you're also drawing on all of these non-environmental cases, the metal with the measurement bias, maybe that's attenuating your results. Yeah, it's possible, of course, right? But we'd rather have a humbler result, right? Like, of course, there is so many sources of measurement error here. I'm not going to camouflage that at all, right? Just look at how much data we're layering on top of each other. So, you know, there's there's a lot of issues here. We also have to deal with clustering. The clusters are not the districts, but that the districts with common, you know, where do rulings apply? We've got to look at kind of, you know, that kind of small pond rather than the, the district itself. So there's a lot of econometric tricks we've got to apply to this, which I probably don't have time to get into. You say that you prefer to have a humbler results. Why? Why this is the case in this case? No, 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 not strategically for, you know, publishing better. What you're saying is that actually it doesn't have a strong effect, which maybe it is. I think it's good to start there. Remember, we're not working off of a lot of previous literature. I think it's better to start here and then keep on going, which we will in terms of, you know, to this point that I made about using air pollution cases, look at how judges rule there versus here. There's a lot we can do to fine tune, but this is the basic result that we want to start with. Yeah. Can you just push back a little bit on the, the small result? So you had a, you, you were normalizing by one percentage point. Yeah, 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 which is pretty big. So if all the cases go green in a district, yeah. right, but, that's a big result. Right, and, but most often in your data, you have, 800 cases spread across 170 
in a short amount of time because this stuff really only appears, you know, in the 90s. But, but, but still, I mean, yeah, but, so exactly. But, 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 if all cases, it's a 20% reduction, if, which is not, which is not a trivial. If all the cases go green, sure, right? So again, we're not having, we're not taking a stand on smaller things. But if it's one case and one case goes green, then it's 20% reduction. That's what the data says. Sure. That point sure, 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 exactly. Yeah. But that's again this point about the noise in our data, right? I don't want to anchor on that. Yes. Yeah, just a question. I should have asked this before, but I was a little bit confused by the unit of observation here. This, uh, this literature, year. right? So that this literature on leniency of judges usually looks. I know. At, you know. I know. The outcome should be at the firm level of the case. Yes, level. and so that's why this departed from that literature. So when I said in our lit review, we are deviating from the literature on judge leniency, and we're adapting it to this kind of pollution context, right? But I mean, the random assignment of judges really works in your favor if you're looking within districts across judges because there is this particular firm that got assigned to a green judge relative to a non-green judge. So it's like going to compare still... the two and see what happens to, uh, you know, their outcomes after the the, the you know the judgment. It's a little bit it's harder to look at that. that in the district because you know some cases go to the green, some cases not to the green. And, and in a follow-up paper, we're doing exactly that, right? So we're matching the cases to firms and we're trying to look at before and after what happens to pollution mitigation, what happens. We don't have emissions um, you know, here, but we can certainly look at firm reaction. So that is something we're looking at. But right for this, this is our kind of kitchen sink approach, right? So yes. On the magnitude, are, are you thinking about these as contemporaneous effects? Are there yes, so, okay, thank you for that question. Of course, right? Dynamic effects. Since the common law system, a ruling at time t is going to have take time to have an impact, and it's going to become precedent, which means it's going to have impact over time, right? So that's another reaction to the small or big question. What we see is, and this is a decision date. If you look, we had to think a lot about decision dates are not the right date, right? There's also a filing date. The average case in our sample is in the courts for about three years. So we don't see pretrans, right? So this is the pretrans of, of pollutants, BOD and COD um, prior to the filing date, but certainly dynamic effects of pollution, we start to see there's a reduction in pollution right before the decision date and nothing afterwards, right? And this is again, classic what you'd expect in India, this is like a period of intense scrutiny on firms. When a firm is fighting a case, the cameras are there. After the court rules, there's this very big publicity event, but within a certain amount of time, that anchors. And I've I've written some papers on the actual rulings. They use common effluent treatment plans. These are very, the Indian government wants costly end of pipe technologies adopted, which almost never work, right? This public private partnership system doesn't work well for what, mitigating water pollution because the shared responsibility system basically breaks down, right? So we can talk about that some more as well, but for now, to, to, this is the answer to your question on dynamic impacts, right? We, we, we do see um, a kind of dynamic effect over here. Infant mortality, we really get very little. Um, this is a complicated thing. We can again get into that, um, you know, in Q and A or over coffee. We have to study infant mortality differently because infant mortality has to be measured at the year month level, not the kind of year level, right? But we do it in a variety of different ways. This is the year level. And the point is we never really get anything, right? So here's our monthly data you never really see any effect on mortality, right? So, and so maybe that's where I should stop. We've tried to ask, can judges enforce environmental justice? We've tried to put together a new data set. This was our pandemic activity. Um, we've used an instrumental variables framework and we've tried to convince you that judicial policies, they lead to temporary reductions in peak toxicity levels. Whether they're big, whether they're small, I'll leave up to you. Maybe this is, um, you know, this is the, the starting point, at least, that we'd like to work with. We don't see any decrease in neonatal or infant mortality rates. And actually, several years post-decision, pollution and mortality go above pre-decision, right? And I've written some papers with some political scientists where we think this is a political economy story, right? The, the courts rule, they advocate for adopting very expensive, you know, large, um, technologies like common effluent treatment plants, 
They cost a fortune to build, so the private sector gets involved. The World Bank almost always gets involved. And they build these enormous white elephant type projects, which work really well for a little while. But in the long run, there is weak accountability, weak monitoring, weak enforcement. And actually, it becomes a perfect screen behind which people can actually pollute more. At least that's what we see in Kanpur, in my hometown of Jaipur, right? Like the existence of this technology it is a license to do worse than you were doing before. So I'll stop there. This is a provocative um, thing to say at the end, but I'll uh, stop. Uh, so we'll go to Melanie. So hi, everybody, and thank you very much for attending. So maybe a quick presentation. Uh, I'm Melanie Gitar, and I recently defended my PhD at the Paris School of Economics and Industry Red, and I'm currently going on the market. And the paper I'm going to present you today is entitled Mainly Leaks, Water Pollution and Child Mortality in Africa. It's co-authored with a fellow PhD candidate at the Paris School of Economics, Hélène Hu, who is currently at the OECD now. So why is it important to study industrial mining activity in Africa and its effects? First, the increase in commodity prices has intensified industrial mine and industrial mining activity in Africa, which is facing a mining boom since 2000, as you can see on this figure. So here I am plotting the number of mine openings through the years, and you can see an increase in trend since 2000. We can also see that the opening of mines follow the price, the commodity prices, and you can see here a drop during the 2008 crisis. So, however, the um, effects of industrial mines on uh, local populations' health are ambiguous because first, the opening of a mine can um, trigger positive externalities through increased access to jobs, to health facilities, um, and local industrial development, but it can also generate negative externalities such as increased exposure to conflict or increased exposure to corruption, or here, what we are interested in is to uh, pollution and water pollution. So indeed, throughout each stage of a mine cycle life, its activity can release chemicals that are prone to contaminate the surrounding air, water, and soil. And each individual living nearby an industrial site are exposed to high, exp uh, high concentration of heavy metals. And indeed, the separation of minerals from significant volume of rocks um, generous waste, and those weights are stored in retention ponds, and these are these retention ponds that can leak within the environment. So here in this uh, satellite image, satellite image, you can see the site of uh, Estacan mine. It's an open pit gold mine in Burkina Faso, and you can see here in 2005 through the discovery phase to the development phase and the start of production. And what you can see is that there are like retention ponds that are created. And these are these retention points who store the waste that can leak within the surrounding environment, and for instance, within the nearby river. So here, this paper is interested on in the negative externality, and we intend to look at what are the effects of mining induced water pollution on child mortality in Africa. So we're going to look at other health effects and outcomes and mortality, but the result will be on child mortality. So on the literature on the effects of industrial mines on health outcome or socioeconomic outcome, so the way to proxy the exposure to a mine is to rely on distance. And the papers compare people that are very close to the mine to those who are not close or further away of the mine. And for instance, there is the Tolonet's paper public in the, published in the Economic Journal that find that, that compares individuals that live within zero to 10 kilometers to those who are living to 10 to 100 kilometers before and after the opening of a mine and actually find a decrease in child mortality for the individuals that are living very close to the mine. So uh, the Van der Gold and Bernwald paper is not contradictory, but gives evidence of more the negative externalities of mines. And it is, compare, is comparing individuals that live between zero to five kilometers to those between five and 20 kilometers and actually find increased stunting in young children and anemia in women. So here, the challenge of this literature is, of course, to know what is the distance threshold to proxy exposure to mines. And also, um, the problem is that sometimes when you rely on distance, then you might aggregate, um, do an average between positive and negative externalities. And here in this paper, what we want is to uh, distinguish, really identify the negative externality to see whether it exists and to look at water pollution. 
and so not relying on average effects. So the contribution of this paper, the first one, is that we are building a new database through an intensive handwork. I will explain you it later, where we extended the database on Africa on industrial mines. We extended the sample from Tololand, who has um, mines of our eight countries, in, in, mostly in Western Africa. And we, by hand, extended the sample. And the first step of this paper was to replicate this paper using our extended sample, where we extended both the number of countries and the number of mites and the type of mites. And we so uh, replicated this paper. And actually, we found uh, zero effects when we were comparing individuals between 0 to 10 and 10 to 100 kilometers throughout uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And it was even though we were uh, just isolating to gold mites. So this was um, this goes into the direction that actually we uh, relying on distance, average, post, positive, and negative externalities. And the second <laughs> contribution of this paper is to take account the uh, topographic position of villages by comparing villages that are downstream and upstream on the industrial side in order to isolate the water pollution mechanism. So this paper in a nutshell, so the question is, what are the effects of water-induced pollution by uh, industrial mine on um, child mortality in Africa? For the data, we rely on the demographic health survey in Africa, where we have 26 countries over uh, the 80s to 2018. For the industrial mine data, so we rely on the standard, uh, the SNL data, mining and metals from standard and pores, uh, plus our handwork. And at the end, we have 2,000 mites crossing our GHS villages. For the metal, so it's a staggered difference in difference, where we compare uh, villages that are upstream to those downstream before and after the, the industrial site has opened. And our results in a nutshell, so what we find is that being downstream of an industrial mine that has opened increases by 25% the uh, mortality, the under 24 months mortality rates in comparison to living upstream. So we find overall no increase in the under uh, 12 months mortality rate, but we find an effect for the children that were so not exclusively breastfed. I will go back on this later. And this corroborates the mechanism of water pollution. So we extruded those our mechanism and show that our result is not driven by any changes in uh, women's uh, fertility or behavior or else outcomes. And for the heterogeneity, uh, our result seems to be mainly driven by open pit mine that is in line with an extractive, intense extractive process, and by only foreign owned by mines. And I will go back later on that, but this is also maybe in line also with uh, intense and large scale industrial mines. Yes. To um, sort of cross that with the income results. So the suggestion from the earlier literature was that there are also potentially these income channels which one might also expect to affect mortality. Yeah. Um, obviously the upstream downstream is trying to yeah. identify the inclusion channel, but can you also talk about whether at different distances this is being kind of ameliorated to some extent by the income channel? Yeah, so we had a trade-off where we were uh, working of people telling us you should look at the wealth index with uh, DHS to, under, to look at the uh, this, the result of, across the income or wealth index distribution, but uh, the wealth index has some uh, problem as it's not comparable through well, survey wave and countries. So we had this problem. And the way we do uh, that to control for the income effect is to include in our control group, not only the upstream subbasins, but those that are within 100 kilometers without any topographic relationship. Yeah, it's not, it's not so much a control thing in some sense. It's a net effect. effect yes. is, is, is interesting in its own right. It's, it's more from a sort of policy perspective. Yeah, it's the implications might be different if, if these two channels are having offset yeah. effects at some distance from the markets. That yes. I think that we should do like the exercise with the wealth index, even if it has some uh, problems. But uh, I think it's the only way we could do that with the changes. Thanks. So for the data, so the standard and poor's uh, database. So it's a privately owned and unlicensed database that we had to purchase. It gives information on the uh, site location, startup and closure years, commodity type, the main commodity type, and the production. But we don't have enough enough. Um, information on the production at the end. So it's intensively used in the literature. And for us, for instance, we had overall 3,000 industrial mines in Africa, and we had only 2,000 who were uh, crossing within 100 kilometers of the village. And just to tell you, for instance, 
we had to do a handwork, why? Because at the end, we amongst these 2,000 mines, we only had 200 who had information on the uh, opening date of the mine, uh, which is very important for our paper. So at the end, what we did is that we did a intensive handwork by retrieving the opening dates of each mine uh, through the pandemic. We were only two doing that. And actually, we read uh, the reports from industrial mines in order to uh, retrieve the date of opening. And when it was a noise, noisy signal, we were looking at uh, retrospective image, satellite images uh, to check whether it was more 2005 or 2006, which are the satellite images I showed you before in the a second mine uh, example. So here, it's here. So uh, about the DHS, so the DHS data, so for the socioeconomic data, it's a cross repetitive uh, cross-sectional survey uh, over uh, 1986 to 2018. And we have six, two, uh, 26 countries out of uh, 54 African countries. So we restricted our sample to the countries who had at least two waves in order to have a comparable temporal variation. And this excludes actually South Africa in our sample. So here on this uh, maps, I plot the temporal and spatial variation of the um, under 24 months mortality rates. Uh, here you can see that over decades, so it's the first decade, second decade, and third decade. So there are like some red plots that are uh, occurring. It's just because in the 80s, uh, DHS were mostly surveying Western Africa. So it's like new countries uh, coming in the DHS. So here we plot South Africa, but actually South Africa is not in our sample because DHS only surveyed once South Africa. And actually it's also um, because it's a very uh, specific country and the handwork was very, very intense. So maybe it's another work to do the handwork on South Africa. But so what, what you can see on this map is that there is overall a decrease in trend of child mortality in Africa. And so the last database that we use is the hydrobasin from Hydrochet, and it subdivides the earth into subbasin and gives the connectivity of each subbasin in between each other. So whether they are upstream or upstream downstream, according to the concept of Fabstetter. And here uh, in this paper, we rely on the at the subbasin level and we choose the find the uh, most granular uh, substantial level, which gives a basin of 100 square kilometers. So this has some comparative advantage. The first one is that we take into consideration both the surface and groundwater pollution. It also helped to deal with uh, the problem of the DHS random reshuffling. I don't know if you work with DHS, but uh, the DHS are in order to make them anonymous, are uh, randomly uh, reshuffled between 0 to 2 kilometers and 0 to 4 kilometers. So, OK. So further empirical strategies. So the main challenge in this literature is to do the pairing between the DHS villages and the industrial sites, because some villages, villages might be paired to uh, several sites and some are in like low density mining, mining sites and are paired to zero sites. So the way we uh, change, so and as I said, relying on distance to proxy exposition to exposure to industrial mine uh, has some uh, drawbacks, some caveats. And one of them is that it introduces unbalanced sample. So in our pairing strategy, I'm not saying that we completely uh, um, uh, corrected the unbalanced sample, but we tried to uh, correct it as we could. So how we pair the DHS villages with the site. So here you can see, so we have here a mine, and first what we do is like a 100 kilometer buffer, and we collected all the DHS villages within this buffer, and then we checked uh, whether um, the village was uh, downstream or upstream, thanks to the surfacing connectivity, and uh, we did it for each mine, and if we had the DHS village who were downstream and of mine A and upstream of mine B, then we put automatically this DHS village into the treatment group being the downstream of mine A. Once we've done that, uh, so after if uh, DHS village was uh, linked to two mines being downstream of mine A and mine C, then we were pairing it to the closest mine. 
right? And at the end, we have our uh, treatment and control group, so the upstream villages and the downstream villages of the mine here in uh, the yellow triangle. And so here we have the example of this DHS village that is in the same subbasin of the mine. In the bearing strategy, here we consider this as being downstream because at the end, we dropped all the DHS village within the same subbasin of the mine. First, because we do not know whether it's upstream or downstream. And second, it's because, so we had this problem of DHS reshuffling and we wanted to avoid having, uh, because of this noise, uh, villages that are treated but go into the control group and to affect controls or affect treatments. So, and here, what you can see also in, uh, in white is within this 100 kilometers, all the subvention that have no topographic connectivity with the mine that are neither downstream or upstream. And for the moment, the control group is the upstream villages in the green. And after in the robustness check, we include all this white um, subvention in the control group to control for labor and income effect. Um, and so at the end, what we've done is that, so this is not the 100 kilometer buffer, actually it's much bigger, because we selected at the end uh, the villages that were up to the third next uh, um, sub-basin downstream. So you can see we went up to the one, two, and third uh, sub-basin downstream. We have uh, intensity exercise that I, um, that I will uh, um, show you after when we go uh, through uh, more sub-basin uh, uh, levels and that we see that our effect actually fades out with distance and uh, like that's a level. And at the end, we calculated the average um, larger uh, distance from the mine to the extremity of the third basin downstream. And it was on average for, uh, 45 kilometers. So we took all the uh, upstream villages up to 45 kilometers. So for the identification strategy, so it's a staggered dif difference and difference where our uh, dependent variable is at the under 12 and under 24 months mortality rates at the individual level and where we interact. Um, so whether it happened is uh, whether the child month was born before or after the mine opening and downstream is whether the uh, individual lives in a downstream village or a upstream village according to the pairing strategy I just explained to you. So we include the vector of child and mother uh, controls, and we include the subbasin fixed effect, subbasin trend, and a uh, birth year trend, and the country birth year fixed effect. Yes. Should we think of the mines as being roughly similar, or are they different in terms of size, volume, toxicity? So we do not have the size. We, what we uh, try to do is to look according to some data on production, to proxy the size, but we have not enough information. Uh, we have a too small sample. So first you have different types of commodities, right? It's gold or cobalt or copper. Uh, so we try to do some heterogeneity and what we found is that we do not have that gold is driven award. And in terms of size, uh, actually that's why uh, I think this is proxied by uh, the results that we have, that our result is mainly driven by the only one on the mines. And I think that these are the larger scale mines, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but um, we are trying to check for, so of course at the beginning, what we wanted to do is go deeper into the uh, satellite image uh, work, uh, maybe to do like some machine learning exercise, looking at the um, size of the mine, and also to look at the specific position of the retention bones. So it was too much work for two people, <laughs> uh, but maybe it's a work in progress actually to, not for this paper, I mean, maybe for another paper to look at the size of the mine. Yes. What's the regulation on this type of activities? Like, you know, the how can you manage the waste? Is there, does it vary in your sample? Or can you look at that? So, yes, it's both like, so it's licensed mines. So, um, of course, there are differences between uh, domestic mines and only foreign mines. So, what we try to do, I can show you if I have time, is that we try to heterogeneity heterogeneity according to the countries that have signed the extractive industry transparency. Uh, I don't know, E-I-T-I. And actually what we found is that our results is mainly driven by the countries who signed this agreement. So it's an agreement that was signed in 2002 by 55 countries uh, to be more transparent about their the way they were uh, using the mines. And, uh, but this is also, I think, because it's the foreign <laughs> countries that go and dig the mines. So uh, I think it's really dependent on, on the, to the context. 
and from what I've read in those reports, uh, uh, sometimes it's like uh, the local governments that are like uh, uh, checking, and sometimes there is no checks at all. So it's really different. <laughs> so if you put variation in like birthdays, could you look? Could we be looking within DHS clusters or even within mothers? Or rather, yeah, could we have more yes. So here we do not have mother fixed effects actually, so choice, but maybe uh, we really introduced that in the robust metric because it's a good idea. But uh, why we didn't do that is because, so here we just um, focus on the five years um, called the uh, module of the DHS. Uh, so we take all the children that were born up to five years before the start of round, and we didn't choose the retrospective question on mothers because we were kind of that's the discussion we had yesterday. Uh, very um, worried about the out migration uh, bias that is our, in our sample, and it's true that if we go back to twenty years after before the survey round with retrospective questions. We're first worried about the noisy signal because it's uh, self-reported data and the out migration. So losing much more mothers. So that's why we did the choice to just focus up to five uh, years. Uh, but that's uh, an exercise we should do. Could you, and you, without going down to mothers, could you go down to within DHS cluster? So the problem is that it's a cross-repeated uh, cross -repeated sections. So if you have, it doesn't matter, but you, you, you do have variation potentially with the kids that were born before and after. Oh, yes, so yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, like household specific and the comparing siblings, you mean? So, yes, or yes, I yes, yes, <laughs> I know. <laughs> no, but yes, I agree. The, uh, actually, uh, why we didn't do that is that the problem when you have DHS is that you do not observe the same ages or uh, the same uh, household per years. And uh, what we did is that we hesitated to main, to do the main agency strategy with the balanced sample. And uh, we did like a balanced sample of sub basins that were surveyed uh, each time both upstream and downstream before and after, and to really rely on the balanced sample. And I think that if we could do that, but uh, we are kind of worried with this unbalanced, uh, but we could, yes. Do you find any residential sorting after the mines open downstream versus upstream? And could that affect child mortality? So yeah, of course, we are worried that there is a strategic migration of individuals being downstream going upstream. And what we uh, we did is to control for in-migration. So in the DHS, you have a question, have you always lived there? So it's a way to exclude in and control for in-migration. So that we do, because we do that also for upstream regions. It is that we do not know if we lost people both upstream and downstream, because we could not uh, control for out-migration. But this strategic behavior or residence or sorting, we control for that. Okay, so for the results. So here, uh, colon one to four is the under 12 months mortality rate and five to eight under 24 months mortality rate. And what you can see in column five is that being downstream increases by two percentage points, the uh, likelihood of dying under two years old if you're downstream compared to upstream people, which is um, linked to a 25% increase. Uh, so we uh, distinguish between the total population and the rural population, and we see an even more uh, uh, bigger result uh, for rural population. And here you can see that we have a zero result for the under 12 months mortality. So we checked for other health outcomes, and we had no effect on studying, anemia, diarrhea. We had actually an effect on underweight, and it seems that underweight for downstream people after that the mine opened, uh, seems to decrease by 3.8 percentage point. And our interpretation is that this our health outcome on the surviving children. So that goes into the direction that actually the weaker um, children has already died and that's the previous result. So we checked the mechanism. So as, uh, yes. On the two slides previous, yes. the it looks yes. like the downstream. Yes has lower mortality at baseline. Yes. What, is, what do you think is going on there? So, uh, of course, so we did a lot of balance table to understand whether the downstream and upstream table um, uh, sub-basins were comparable. So uh, what we found is that in the levels, uh, there were like a difference in terms of mortality rate downstream and upstream. But actually what you see from the balance table is that what happened is that maybe I can show you maybe more of that. Uh, as the even study, how do I do it? 
This is working actually. Sorry. We go back like that. <laughs> I don't know what happened. We're still back. One should be fine. Okay. Okay, that's weird. Okay, so I can't show you that. Uh, so actually, I had a lot of <laughs> appendix. I don't know what happened. But when you look at the event study, you do not see pre-trends. So actually, it's just that. So it's true that at the beginning, the downstream are more rural than the upstream, actually. And also what we had is that uh, there seem to become more and more urban after the mine opens because we have some in-migrants coming more in the downstream area than the upstream areas. And that's why it's really important to uh, like uh, distinguish between rural and urban. And that's why we like check just on the rural population. And that's why we have this exercise by controlling for in-migration. So that might explain that. And that's why it's like the defendant that is. So here, so no effect on that. And here, so the table, so I guess it won't work. I don't know why, but too much link to the on that, and it might work. But here, so what we did is that overall, we didn't have any effect on the uh, on average on the 12 months mortality rate. And what we did is an heterogeneity exercise, a triple defensive, where we checked for individuals that were uh, breastfed or not the uh, previous days before the survey round. And what we found is an increase in the mortality rate under for the 12 month mortality rate for those that uh, were uh, not exclusively breastfed. So those who uh, consumed plain water, and this corroborates the mechanism of water pollution. Thank you. Um, so we also checked whether the effect was not explained by a change in women's fertility or health. And we show, but I think it's not working. Can I just? Okay. Maybe it didn't. Yeah, maybe it didn't. That's weird. Um, do you have the second presentation I sent you? Or? And the first one? Did you put it or? No? Oh, okay. So, well, is there a red? Um, so, <laughs> you have, we'll have to believe me <laughs> and take the tables and the paper. So here we show you that the effect is not driven by any change in women's fertility or health. So we have no effect on fertility behavior, no effect on miscarriage. So it seems that it's not like a miscarriage that are driven our results. We have also no significant uh, effect uh, for uh, increased access to uh, facilities or health facilities. So we checked whether like we did a triple definitive and we checked whether uh, the change in the electricity access uh, was changing the mortality with no effect, the increased access to health facilities. We checked also whether being vaccinated would change our results, and actually it doesn't. So this is like to corroborate the fact that it's mostly water pollution and increased access to health facilities, yes. So if I understand the argument correctly, the idea is to compare downstream and upstream to net yes. off the economic effects, right? And to just have the pollution effect. Yes. But if the downstream community is poorer to begin with, the economic effects might be different, right? Yes. So I'm wondering how you think about it. So the way we try to control for that is that uh, we have this exercise where we uh, uh, include in the control group the subbasins that are neither downstream or upstream. And so we include more, like, I don't know if you saw at the beginning, is the white subbasins I showed you in the figure. And that is to control for some labor or income impact. And actually, so for the baseline um, uh, levels, uh, what you can see in the descriptive stats is that actually both upstream and downstream have decreased, are decreasing their uh, mortality rates, right? Just that the downstream uh, spillages have less important decrease, which shows that it is 25% linked to water pollution. Yes, so decreasing the mortality relative to the surrounding area. In trends. Yes. Do you check if the probability of exclusive breastfeeding is affected by the mine opening? Sorry. Uh, yes, yes. And that is not. No, it's not. No, no, no. Okay. It's not. We really have and no no behavior of women's that changed with the mine opening. The only thing that changed, as I told you, is the in migrants that are more green downstream, and we control for that, and um, being more yoga. And 
Yes. So how, again, going back to the size issue, give us a sense of how big an employer is a mine yes. is, like, typically. Yes. So <clears throat> what we did is that, I don't know if it will answer your question, right? But so uh, we cannot count the number. We do not have the labor environment. We do not have the number of trucks or stuff like that. What we did is that, like, so because here uh, in this paper, the only thing that we do is like to check before and after a mine opens. And actually, we also have the effect of a mine closing, right? And our say is that even if a mine closes, then the retention point leak even more into the environment because actually there is no maintenance and no. But what we wanted to check is also, but actually that is not what we find because what we find is that we restricted our sample to the mines for which we had the, the closure dates. And also we didn't retrieve the closure dates in our handwork because it was a much more noisy uh, signal and a mine opens then closes. So it was hard to have one date. And actually we find that our effect is even more is even stronger whilst the mine are active. And maybe that goes into the question of being more productive. Um, and, uh, and we also did a triple diff different, a triple difference in difference with the uh, community prices to check for uh, mine activity. Yes, I was going to maybe to get a bit more of a handle on like the differential size. Is there any information in the BH on some occupation? Mm -hmm. If you could look at like change in number of mine or like so um uh, there is no I don't remember if it is in some specific ways. Actually, you do not have for each way whether individuals are minors or not. Uh, that's why we have this control for in migrants uh, in the hypothesis that actually the minors are the in migrants. So in the paper, we control for in migrants and then we subdivide the uh, sample between the migrants and in migrants, and that would be you know, but yeah, maybe we but that we we could control for that. Actually, you have some papers looking at the change in uh, agricultural activity uh, or the education, uh, like um, individual living schools. Mm -hmm. But this is not really. Well, you say maybe get the sample that they put the sample between mines that sort of big in, a big change in migration after the very plain versus the new market. That would be that would yes. be another yes. yes, yes, we could do that. We could do that. Yes, actually, when we uh, that's true. Thanks. That's a big breath. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, yeah. There we go. Cool. Okay, great. Uh, so to motivate what this paper is about, I'll start with these two kind of prominent examples of global <laughs> agricultural markets mediating local water scarcity issues, which is what we're trying to study in this project. So the first of these, of these examples is in my backyard. I live in California. We grow a lot of really water intensive crops in California. Almonds are the world's second most water intensive crop. There's avocados, there's lots of things like that in California. Uh, and meanwhile, the water tables in California are dropping really precipitously. They've fallen like 10 meters over the last several decades, which is a lot. Uh, people who know about water tell me. Uh, okay, and then we're growing all these water intensive crops and we're shipping them all around the world. So actually, this is kind of a crazy stat. 80% of all the world's almonds are grown in California and 70% of them, of them are for export. So this is one example of kind of these global agricultural markets playing an important role in this local water scarcity issue. And then the second prominent example is in northern India. And so these parts, these dark red areas of North India, I'll tell you more about the data later. These are basically the places in the world that are losing water most rapidly of any arable land region. So this is like the 99.9th percentile of water depletion. Uh, and in these locations that are dark red in North India, this is what the allocation of arable land looks like. About 95% of all croppable acres are cropped. In these locations, and about 50% of them are cropped with wheat and rice, which are the two most water intensive staple crops. And to just give you a benchmark of what uh, how this land allocation compares to the world, this is kind of the average air, uh, acre of arable land in the world. Uh, we're cropping about a third of the of the acreage that we could crop in the world, uh, and about 11% with, with wheat and rice, which use a lot of water, relative to this is what it looks like in this rapidly depleting part of India. Uh, just one second, Claire. Uh, and then, like in California, a lot of this is uh, has to do with what? If you meant me to, I didn't have my hand up. 
Oh, I thought you had your hand up. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay. And then, uh, like in California, a lot of this has to do with global agricultural markets. So India is the world's leading exporter of rice. Rice uses a lot of water. They're sending it all around the world. And meanwhile, they're running out of water really uh, rapidly. And so, uh, okay. So, uh, so, so what are we studying in this paper? The key idea is that while water is non-tradable, you can't really ship, ship it across long distances. Water is implicitly traded because it's embedded in the trade of agricultural goods. And so we think to understand water depletion issues, you really need to be thinking about global agricultural markets. And then the second thing here is an important piece of the economics underlying this is that uh, it's not actually obvious what optimal output market policy is in this setting because the input market is distorted. A lot of people's access to water is like an open access common pool resource where they're not paying a cost that's equivalent to the social cost to extract water. So in the presence of this input market distortion, we don't actually know whether trade is good or bad for efficiency uh, and welfare. And so that's what we're trying to study in this project, uh, agricultural and trade policies how those map into the global agri uh, the global allocation of agricultural activity and what that does to long-run water avail availability and long-run welfare. So these are roughly the questions we're trying to ask in this paper. How does global trade and agriculture affect water resource depletion? How do existing, and, and uh, this is kind of the, the question we have an answer to today. And then we're also trying to answer uh, in this paper kind of existing and potential agricultural and trade policies. How do those map into water depletion issues? And eventually, uh, because one of my co-authors is super good at math and these complicated trade models, we're going to try to solve the social planners problem and ask kind of what is the optimal allocation uh, of agricultural activity given these water resource uh, constraints. Okay, so what do we actually do in this paper? I'm going to show you, but the first thing is we try to compile as much data as possible, global spatial data on water resources, agricultural activity, and agricultural policy. And that's going to allow us to, before we get to a model, just establish a series of facts about kind of where the water is, where the agricultural activity is, and where what the agricultural policy uh, is doing to map into that. And I'll, I'll get into these more, but the first thing to, to, to note about the facts is that these property markets, uh, property rights failures in the input markets, we find those are like really ubiquitous around the world. It really seems to be the case that in most places, farmers are not paying uh, a cost of extracting water that you might think is representative of the social cost, which means that it's really important to study these output market uh, interventions in this setting where the input market uh, is failing and to think about kind of what optimal policy might look like. And then the second fact is, uh, or the second thing that I'm going to show in this fact section is that in contrast to these prominent examples that motivated us to write the paper, like California, where I live, and India, where my family's from, we actually find those are like extreme outliers in the data. And that for the most part around the world, water intensive activity is concentrating highly in the places that have a lot of water. Uh, and so there's these few locations like India and California that are kind of the exceptions, but by and large, that's actually not what the data looks like, uh, which surprised us, but did not surprise my colleague Stephanie because she had a much smarter prior than us. Uh, okay, and then we're going to take these facts and we're going to put them into this quantitative dynamic spatial equilibrium model. Uh, of trade and agricultural activity and water depletion over time. And so in the model, there are going to be farmers uh, who are cropping uh, roughly every uh, deciding what to plant on roughly every acre of arable land in the world. There's going to be trade in those crops across consumers across all the countries. And then there are going to be local aquifers that uh, have a stock of water that draws down or up over time, depending on how much you uh, use in agriculture and how much recharge of water exists in that location in the world. And then with this model, we're going to try to use model simulations to answer kind of the big thing questions uh, about how trade and agriculture is, is affecting these water resource issues. And kind of as a function of this bullet point here, where the water intensive crops are actually where there's a lot of water, uh, in contrast to I think what we thought we were going to find in this project, we're finding that global trade and agriculture is actually super critical for preventing water scarcity issues. If you take away trade and agriculture, places that are importing food are all of a sudden going to have to grow their food uh, instead of importing it. And we're going to find that over time, they're going to really rapidly deplete their water resources. Uh, and that's going to lead to a, a large welfare loss over the course of, of a few decades. And that's kind of the, the model counterfactual I have to show you today. We have, hope to have more results uh, soon. OK, so let me start by telling you more about this data. Uh, I have actually no time, no idea what time I started or what time it is. Uh, okay, uh, so this is the first data set. So we compile like several big global spatial data sets on water resources. So this is the first of these, just like a 
fun note for the many PhD students here, there's like a tre treasure trove of awesome data and science journals that economists aren't using. And so that's kind of a lot of what we did in this paper is go read the science literature and find these data sets. And so what this data set is, is basically like an estimate of the, a, it's a cross-sectional estimate of the level of the water table everywhere across uh, across the world. And so what these scientists did is they collected observations from a couple million uh, well sites across the world, and then they interpolated them, interpolated between those using a hydrological model to get this estimate of how deep the water table is everywhere and where there's a presence of local surface water like uh, lakes and like lakes and uh, rivers. Okay, so that gives us a cross-sectional estimate of the levels, but it doesn't tell us anything about the trends. And so the second data set here uh, is going to give us information about the trends in water resources everywhere. So this is a data set collected by NASA in collaboration with a different agency in Germany whose name I can't remember. Uh, and what this data does is basically uses slight variations in the Earth's gravitational pull to in, from each pixel of land to infer the change in water stored there. The scientists have written a bunch of papers about this data set. It turns out that changes in gravitational pull over time are driven by changes in water resources. So you can think of this as like all possible water resources that are in that location. It's like uh, groundwater. If the lakes are being drawn down, if there are ice caps, you can see the ice caps melting. Uh, in this data set, although we're not studying the ice caps in this paper. Uh, okay, so now we have one uh, data set about the, the cross-sectional level of, of water resources and one about the trend over time. And then we're going to combine that with, yeah. Yeah. Use that and think about how the kind of trajectory of changing comparative advantage might be. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it actually turns out to be the case that uh, exactly 50% of arable land in the world is gaining water. And exactly, it's like 49.97% or something like that uh, is losing. And exactly that is, is gaining. Uh, and so that's going to be an important part of our story. Um, yeah. How are you thinking about precipitation? Is it just like increasing the stock of rainwater, but that can also then not need less groundwater at all if you have to cooperate better? Yeah, so um, because the model is like a little bit stylized, we're basically thinking of uh, water is kind of interchangeable. So you have like precipitation is going to recharge how much water you have uh, in a given location over time. Uh, but if you have surface water or groundwater, you can use either. Uh, if it were if we were trying to model like the agricultural activity more deeply, we would have a different cost of extraction of ground and surface water. Both. Yeah. So it's just maybe it's like super weird question, but it's so striking that it's balanced. There's yeah. no way that they're actually measuring it relative to like a baseline, which is like somehow the average. Because if it's like variations in gravitational field, yeah. it has to be relative to some. Uh, so for the world on a whole, it has to add up to zero. But what's striking is that the arable land adds up to zero. Uh, like there's no change in water resources in the world. Water is right. like uh, conserved or whatever the right word is. Uh, but what's striking is that half the arable land is so that you could easily have like uh, the ice caps are melting and other places are gaining or vice, you know, something like that. The oceans are gaining relative to not the oceans. Uh, so, yeah, but there's nothing that forces the arable acreage to add up to zero. That's just interesting occurrence. Yeah. Did you try to change the temporal window that you have? Because, for instance, I know in Santa Fe, the 2000s. So this data set, we have it from 2003 to 2016. Uh, it's recently been updated to include up to 2022, and we're trying to add that data, but yeah. we don't have that yet. And to yeah. change the, the, the average. Yeah, yeah. So we're actually writing a shorter uh, like PNP paper that's just yeah. about these trends. Uh, yeah. okay. But in this paper, it's what we have now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, OK, cool. Uh, so we have these data sets on water, uh, and then we're going to combine them with a lot of data sets on agricultural activity. And so this is a data set that uses a combination of census data and remote sensing to estimate for each arable acre on Earth uh, at kind of one moment in time that's around two, the year 2000, uh, the proportion of uh, that lands that's cropped with each of 175 different crops or that's uncropped and is used as pasture, pasture land. When we take this data to the model, we're going to use the union of cropped land and pasture land as our definition of arable land. We're going to say you could have cropped the pasture if you uh, if you wanted to. And then we have some data on agricultural policy. And so the World Bank collects this really helpful data set called the nominal rate of assistance. 
uh, for each different crop in each different country for 80 farm products in 82 countries. Uh, and what this is, is basically there's so many different agricultural policies that this database is trying to uh, combine them, boil them all down into one summary statistic. That's like, what is the net subsidy or tax on each crop in each country when you account for a variety of different policies like subsidies, tariffs, taxes, et cetera, uh, quotas. Uh, okay, so we have this data set. And then in order to calibrate this model, we're also gonna have a lot of other data that I'm not gonna cover in detail in a 30 minute talk, but we have these potential yields of each crop in each place. And so when you run model counterfactuals, you wanna be able to know what if someone had planted some other crop in this location that otherwise wasn't, uh, that, that's not observed in the data. And fortunately, some people have estimates of those, those what ifs. We have data on kind of standard uh, production and trade uh, across crops, across countries. And then in order to calibrate this model, it's in a stylized way, but we're basically trying to model like every drop of water in the world over time. And so the water law of motion in the model is gonna require a lot of these other data sets on kind of what sort of soil was everywhere. You had a certain amount of uh, water change over time. How does that map, map into groundwater table depth and things like that. So we have all these other data sets uh, that are gonna go to the model. Okay, so I'm gonna start by showing you these five facts about water agriculture. Uh, and agricultural policy uh, in the world. Uh, okay, so the first fact that's really important for thinking about trade is just there's a tremendous amount of heterogeneity uh, in water resources across arable land. This might be sort of obvious uh, to people who, who think about agriculture a lot, but uh, when we think about water depletion, we really should think about that as being really a different issue in different places, because there are some places we saw that are gaining and some that are losing. And so this just shows you, uh, again, this map of groundwater table depth across the world. About 15% of the world's arable land is somewhere where there's uh, surface water available, like they can irrigate from a river or a lake. Uh, and about another 15 or 20% has water within one meter of the surface that's pretty easy to extract. But about 60% of the world's arable acreage has a groundwater table that's deeper than eight meters, which is like pretty hard to get groundwater out of. Uh, okay, so the cost of extraction are gonna be really different, different places, yeah. So this is 20, 40 meters here. And I think when you showed us the changes, the scale was in centimeters. Are, is, are these numbers important? Yeah, uh, that's actually something I wasn't gonna get into in this talk, but it's actually really something we were surprised by in this paper. Uh, the trends are like incredibly small relative to the levels. Uh, and so when we're looking at like the places that are most rapidly depleting, the really extremely rapidly depleting places, like over a few decades, it's gonna matter for the levels. Uh, but in general, uh, I'm forgetting the exact numbers that would put this in context off the top of my head. But yeah, it's true that the, the trends are actually like pretty small in most locations. Yeah. Maybe that sort of partly answers it. But you, you're talking about the world's arable land. Is yeah. there some question of extensive margin change here with these kinds of uh, magnitudes? Uh, oh, like there are places that are not arable that could become arable? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, or that are converted into development. Yeah, yeah, uh, that definitely, and then there are wildfires. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Does that two centimeters a year, is that, does that align with what people would think about rolling like, the groundwater in, say, in like super water stress areas like we have? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't think they'll align exactly because no. that's going to be averaged over like a pretty coarse grid, the numbers in there, and some of the really, like you could have it drop a lot in kind of one part of the grid. Uh, so yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, yeah, there's like once you pull it out, it starts flowing towards an even less, but it's, yeah. still, it's still like, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, that's it. I don't think the way we're defining arable land here, uh, I don't think we're gonna account for that mechanism. Uh, although I guess we're also taking the definition of arable land from kind of these potential yields in some sense. So if like there's a potential yield somewhere, we're saying someone could crop it. Uh, and so there'll be a little bit of extensive margin, but it kind of depends a little on the semantics of what you call arable. Uh, okay, we talked about these trends. Uh, okay, so there's a lot of heterogeneity. And the second important fact is that really, like when we're talking about water in the world, agriculture is the whole ballgame. And so there's this is just a citation from a prominent paper in the science literature. Uh, that when you kind of follow the supply chain all the way through, agricultural activity accounts for 92% of the world's water consumption. Uh, something like, not this is not important for this paper, but something like a third of that is for uh, livestock. Uh, and out of the remaining 8%, it's about evenly split between commercial and, or residential, commercial and industrial activity. Uh, 
Okay, and then of that, uh, of the world's water consumption, about 22% of it is embedded in international trade. And so we think this is like really quantitatively important mechanism. Yeah. Um, sorry, I don't know. But this seems super high. Like, do they just think it's between like because I think there's a distinction in your context between extraction and just passive accumulation. And it's so like we can elaborate on what that looks like. Uh, yeah, I think it's going to be the combination of both. And in our context, there's actually not really going to be a distinction in this sense that we're going to have some, well, talk about this a little bit more when I get to the model, but we're going to have some cost of extraction in each location. And that's going to be a function of like the groundwater table depth and also how much rainfall you get. And so we're sort of treating them as like not necessarily interchangeable and that they're both going to map into this cost of extraction, but uh, they're also not like totally separable in our context. It's like, yeah. 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 Sorry, those numbers in the sense that they always weren't sure that like all these double counting, but they basically, mm -hmm. I think they just assume that you pour water on a field and it's like disappeared, but it doesn't, right? Some of uh, I don't think they, some of it. they don't assume that there's uh there's a, so we have a parameter in our model. That's like if, when you, when a crop uses I'm water, it, doing that. no, 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 but, like some of the, the, some but it some comes of from their paper. Numbers, yeah. Okay. Uh, the, uh, yeah, so we have a parameter that's basically like if the rice uses like X acres, then uh, what, or, you know, the, uh, meters cubed or whatever, there's some proportion of that that's going to filter back into the uh, into the uh, like groundwater stock and is not going to be evaporated. And that perimeter comes from this paper, I think, or a calibration of it or a closely related paper. So I think they're actually accounting for that. But then, okay, if you're really going to get into specifics, then it's like the rice itself, the amount that you're going to pull off and then dry, like the, 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 like the, then the, the rice residue, the moisture from that doesn't like disappear either. Like I, I just think it's a really difficult problem, and I'm and like I, I, I'm sure that's an overestimate. Is kind of my, is kind of my. Uh, uh my co-author Tamba is the person who knows a lot more science on this paper than I do, so uh, I'll uh, yeah, maybe I'm, ask her I'm, the Junior Bell. But uh, yeah. it's kind of we think it's the best estimate out there in the that's, science literature. Yeah. It's not super important for okay. our context as long as it's kind of a lot of water consumption. That's the only point we're trying to make. We're not using this number directly anywhere in our uh, calibration. Okay, cool. Uh, and then the third fact that's really important for our context is that we think the first best in this setting, we sort of know what the first best is in a theoretical way. We think the first best has proven really hard to actually implement in practice. So there's some really great papers by a variety of economists about how when you set up tradable property rights for farmers for water, that's like really awesome and creates a lot of surplus. Uh, and it really improves the efficiency of local water use and, and uh, reduces kind of depletion issues over time. But in practice, we haven't really been able to set up these sorts of really efficient markets in very many locations. And so we did this kind of really comprehensive reading of the literature on local institutions for water extraction all around the world. And this is a number that is very debatable because it depends on context a lot, but you know, roughly speaking, like 94% of the world's agricultural production is somewhere where there's no local property rights for the farmers over the water. It's just a, an open extract, open resource extraction. Uh, and so we think this fact is important, you know, depending on how you count, maybe it's 80%, maybe it's 94%, whatever. Uh, we think this is important because this really accentuates the importance of policy on the output market side. We know how to solve this problem in kind of an economics way. Uh, you fix the input market distortion, and then the optimal output market policy is an undistorted output market, but we haven't really been able to fix the input market distortion. So that's why we think it's important to study the output markets. Uh, okay. And then the fourth, sure. yes. Just a quick point. Just, yeah. uh, no formal market doesn't necessarily imply open access, right? Uh, I probably agree, but say more about what you mean. Well, like Nick Ryan, for example, has a paper on India rationing is like the way that water is used there. And there are lots of places where there are all sorts of customary or informal arrangements. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So that number is going to be not including the informal arrangements. If you yes. include those, it's going to just, I wouldn't say like that implies open access. Like okay, that. fair enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I really need to improve my vocabulary about water issues. Uh, I think Tama nails this when she presents that for, uh, for the record. Okay, uh, speaking of Tama, she has this great previous paper that's kind of directly measuring the importance of agricultural policy uh, for these water resource trends. So there's a lot of variation in the historical data in the net subsidies and taxes that countries place on agriculture. So this just shows one example of South Korea over time. This is their nominal rate of assistance is measured 
uh, by the World Banks. It's like the net effect of all their agricultural policies. Uh, and you can use that historical variation in a panel regression to see what of these agricultural subsidies do to water. Uh, and these are the estimates from Tama's previous paper. Uh, basically, uh, I'm not going to get into magnitudes too much because it gets to kind of Claire's question uh, and Milan's question, which uh, about about how big these these trends are in the first place. But to the extent that there are trends in water storage over time, these agricultural policies seem to be playing a really important role in them. Uh, and so, if you increase the uh, I think the interpretation here is that the, the centimeters of equivalent water height, uh, if you increase the agricultural subsidy by like 100 percentage points, then every year that's going to cost you like five centimeters in equivalent water height, which is very, very large as a share of the trends we see. It may or may not be large relative to the stocks, as we talked about earlier. And you see basically a zero for uh, the uncropped land uh, for these agricultural subsidies, which is helpful to think about the mechanisms. OK, so we think these agricultural policies like really, really matter. So maybe we should study them. Okay, now the fifth fact is kind of the one that feeds into the, the important model result that, that we have so far that I'm gonna show you today. Uh, and that's where are these water intensive crops actually locating across the world. And so first I'm gonna start by showing you almonds because this is where we were getting our wrong intuition. It's we're not as smart as Steffi with the right intuition. Uh, okay, so this is what it looks like for almonds. The share of global crop acreage in almonds is on the Y axis. And on the X axis here is the decile of different measures of water resources. And so on the left here, this is groundwater, and on the right, this is rainfall. So to the right, these are like the rainiest places in the world, and to the right here, these are the places with the most easily accessible groundwater in the world. Uh, and what we can see here is that we grow a lot of almonds in places that are like not that rainy and don't have that much groundwater. Uh, this third decile here of groundwater and rainfall is actually like a lot of California, for a lot of the almonds in California. Uh, and so we kind of thought the world looked like this. But then we put rice in there and we grow like almost all of the rice in the world. Uh, it's something like half the world's rice is grown in the top two deciles of groundwater access. Uh, so we grow rice in like really rainy and wet places. And so that looks great. And so then we had this for 115 crops and we were like, okay, but this is a lot of graphs and we don't know how to think about this or communicate it. So then we tried to uh, make it more a, a more systematic measure. So we basically created like a very simple index of the average water intensity of arable land. Uh, that paper, that science paper cited earlier, gives us these estimates of the water used per acre on average by crop. Uh, and then we know the allocation across acres of the crops. So we just took the, the average water intensity of each uh, acre of land across the world, where we counted uncropped land as a zero for the purposes of this agricultural water use. Uh, and so what this shows you is the average water intensity of land use across the deciles of the world's groundwater and the deciles of the world's rainfall. Uh, so we haven't actually solved the social planner's problem yet in the model, but you might imagine this is kind of what the social planner wants is like, we're actually on average putting the water intensive crops in the really water abundant places. Uh, and so that was kind of cool uh, and surprised us. Now to the slides that were in the introduction, you can also see that in the data. And so this is the same uh, graph, but now on the x-axis, it's the trends instead of the levels of groundwater and, and average rainfall. And so for the trends, it's kind of like, uh, uh, okay, so you can see that, that the rice and the almonds are grown in these locations that are really rapidly losing water. This is significantly, uh, this is a lot of Northern India and parts of California that are in these first deciles and they grow a lot of almonds and rice. So you can see the dots from the famous examples in our, in our data, but they're just not the systematic pattern. Uh, it is the case actually though, that this first decile of the trends is kind of an outlier relative to the world. There's a lot of super water intensive land use in the places in the world that are losing water most rapidly. That's kind of where we got our intuition coming into this project. Turns out that's like the outlier dot, not the systematic dot. Uh, but it's going to actually matter in the in the model counterfactual. So though I don't know that I was time to, I have actually no idea how much time I have left. Oh, five minutes. Okay, cool. Yeah. I mean, is it worth splitting up between staple crops and cash crops here? I was just wondering. I mean, because maybe almonds are grown in California because that's where the big market for them is, and they happen to also just have water scarcity. Uh, well, they're exporting seven, like eighty percent of their almonds. Uh, but that's all going to be in the model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Did I think of your thought for like for almonds in California being where they're losing water fast as a causal thing? Mm -hmm. Is like that's why they're losing water, or that like the climate is you know moving away and that area is just getting less rain and that's driving the reduction? The grass not causal; it's just a correlation. Uh, 
in the model, it will be causal in the sense that there will be some water use of each crop that's going to map into that area's trend. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, has it to do with the crop itself that, you know, water is not the only factor which actually determines where the crop is to be, you know, yeah. grown. There, there may be some other, like temperature, for example. Yeah. So you're taking California and India worlds apart. But still, they are being grown in a, in a region which are water scarce, but it uses a lot of water. Is there something else like a climatic factor or a temperature factor which allows for a, a high yield normal growth in these areas? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we're going to take that into account in the model. We're going to have these potential yields that are based on temperature and soil quality and all the other things. So it might be optimal to grow the really water intensive crops in places that are not that water abundant, depending or on. Almond, Places like that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, cool. So this is just a summary of the facts. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the model. I'm sure you like a couple graphs from it in the remaining time. Uh, okay, so there's a lot of math in the model, but that doesn't fit into a 30 minute talk. Basically in the model, there's gonna be a farmer on each parcel of land in the world. The parcels are allocated to fields. Each field is going to have different potential yields for each of the different crops in the model, depending on their local soils and their local temperature. Uh, each field is going to be in a country, and it's going to be an aquifer, which overlaps across countries. Uh, the definition of aquifer is going to be important here, because that's basically the level at which the externality is going to hit, the externality of farmers using water uh, and making it not available to future farmers over time. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that at that time. Uh, okay, and then the farmers are going to choose which of these many crops to plant or whether to work in the in the non-agricultural sector. Okay, and then each farmer in, on their parcel is going to get a productivity draw for each of the crops that are based on a distribution for their field that comes from what the uh, soils and, and uh, temperatures and other uh, determinants of productivity are in that field. Uh, we're going to have this different water intensity of each of the crops, and so uh, we're going to take this from the science literature, basically uh, we're just using the global average here. Unfortunately, no one has good estimates of how this varies kind of across space. It does vary some across space, although we think that variation is small relative to the variation across crops and how water intensive they are. And then there's going to be this extraction cost of getting water in each, in each location in the world that's going to depend on uh, the rainfall, the surface water, and then this dynamically evolving water table depth. Then importantly, there's going to be this law of motion for water in each location that depends on how much the farmers and the model used in that location and what the recharge is. Okay, and then the output side of the model is pretty standard. There's like nested CES across this bundle of crops. You can trade the crops across countries, uh, but trade is subject to some cost uh, that depends on which country you're shipping it from and which country you're shipping it to. And then we're going to take this data uh, that I showed you from the World Bank on the net subsidy or tax to agriculture, put that straight into the model uh, as, as a net subsidy or tax to each crop in each country. Okay, so let me just give you a brief picture of how we uh, calibrate this model. Really importantly, we're going to calibrate the model out of steady state because the world isn't in steady state. And so in the baseline of the model, we're going to match the trends everywhere and what the water resources are. So we know which places are getting completed over time. We're at like two minutes or something. I'm out of time. Oh, okay. Uh, all right, well, okay. So we calibrate this model. We calibrate it. I'm just gonna go like another 30 seconds. Uh, we calibrate this model for all the world's farmers uh, roughly across uh, a lot of different countries. We're gonna have 22 crops in the model. Uh, to the point about cash crops, we're gonna have a combination of staple crops here and some really water intensive cash crops and some really low water intensity crops. So there's kind of room for a lot of allocation. This just shows you that there's a lot of variation in the average water intensity of different crops like grapefruit and bananas use like 10 times more water or whatever than uh, the least water intensive crops. Uh, okay. Uh, let me show you a couple graphs to end on. Uh, what we find here is that if you take trade and agriculture away, uh, this graph is like not super uh, intuitive yet, but basically the global water tables in the most depleted regions deplete like way, way faster. What this red line is telling you, because all of a sudden these food importers uh, have to stop importing their food and grow it at home. And then their water tables decline a lot over time. And that really reduces welfare. Uh, because as their water tables decline, their yields of agriculture fall as it gets harder to extract, raises food prices, uh, and makes people worse off. So these food importing countries get a lot worse off uh, in the absence of trade. Uh, and that's kind of the one counterfactual we have now. We hope to have more in the future. Uh, thanks for letting me go a minute over. And yeah.
once I play around with the welfare weight, so let me think about a government that's controlled just by consumers. So they think only about consumer surplus and government revenue. Sorry. They think only about consumer surplus and government revenue. They don't think about producer surplus. Now what happens? What happens is that I end up with an optimal tariff that is negative. So it's actually a subsidy. Okay. That is to say that a government that really cares about consumers is now going to subsidize imports because when I subsidize those imports, I'm going to increase consumer surplus. I'm going to hurt producers, but this government doesn't care about producers. They only care about consumers. And so they're going to subsidize imports. And so I can think about uh, what happens in a world where, given a shock, for exam example, now the government reacts with trade policy. We think that consumers are more salient now because consumers have complained. They're going to move now from doing nothing to doing something. This is a subsidy. This is just the opposite of an export ban, but this is a pro-consumer policy, just like the Indian case. So the way to think about the Indian case a bit here is if now the consumer surplus becomes more salient for political reasons, the government is now going to implement a pro-consumer policy, and this is how to see it in the model. But what's sort of interesting here is how that plays out over time. So suppose now that shock puts you in this world where you're doing this pro-consumer policy. What's interesting is that if you continue to live in that world, now you're in that state where you're doing this pro-consumer policy. What's gonna happen is as that shock, that negative shock increases over time, it gets worse over time. What's going to happen is the following. Here I have import subsidies to help consumers. I need to pay, subsidies are costly. As I have more negative shocks in this economy, the amount of imports is going to rise. Why? Because the amount of domestic production is going down. As imports rise, the cost of subsidizing imports goes up. The cost gets higher and higher. And so optimally, the government's going to have to reduce how much subsidy they're giving over time because at a certain point, it just becomes too costly. So now I've moved to this world where the shocks are getting worse and worse. And what that's going to do is lower the subsidies, which are in effect, putting in a tax, and that tax is going to impede the amount of imports coming in. It's going to impede adaptation over time. I can think of, I can think about this in an even more direct way by looking at a producer-controlled government. Here, the government only cares about producers, and then the producers are on the hook for thinking about the government revenue because the government uh, is composed of producers that implement some policies. They're going to do things that are good for producers and bad for domestic consumers. Why? Because they don't care about domestic consumers. Here, once I optimize uh, over the tax and solve for the optimal tax, you get this expression here. This is going to be a positive ex expression. A producer-controlled government is going to put in a trade barrier. They're going to put in an import tariff. Why? Because domestic producers are competing with foreign producers. Those imports are coming from foreign producers. By putting in an import tax, the government can shield those domestic producers from their foreign competition. And so a government that only cares about producer surplus will want to do that. And this actually is going to increase over time as those shocks get worse and worse, the amount of imports goes up. So the non-import share goes down. And so then the total tax goes up. This tariff is going to also increase over time. This tax will increase over time as those shocks get worse and worse. That is this endogenous trade policy not only puts in a barrier initially, but over time can ramp up uh, and get, uh, can be more of a barrier that gets stronger and stronger over time, which is exactly the opposite of what you want if you care about trade being a means of adaptation. Okay, that is to say that protection is going to increase with these shocks. It's gonna put in a barrier, that barrier is going to impede adaptation that would otherwise naturally happen if we were in this neutral government world where there's just free trade and therefore no trade barrier and therefore the adaptation happens without any uh, any barrier. So that'll close and then have some time for questions. The point of this paper is that endogenous trade policy <laughs> impedes global adaptation with important distributional consequences across countries but also between consumers and producers within a country. And so where we're going with this is to 
and put together a quantitative model to be able to run these simulations, endogenous, exogenous trade policy, and think about wel welfare loss from climate change. I, I really like this. I, I think that to, to further develop the, the comparative statics, uh, I mean, it might require either some functional form assumptions or, or doing an approximation. Consider a uh, mean preserving spread of the omegas. And I think you'll be able to derive some sufficient statistics formulas for the actual welfare loss areas. Uh, that I think would be really nice. Yeah, on that theory, I showed you just the importers as a small open economy. You can also think about exporters that are a small open economy. I can think about large open economies as well. And then the terms of trade will come in and complicate things further. I think actually, you're right. Even just in this very simple case, uh, I showed the comparative statics, but I should do the comparative static on welfare. Can we use the model to... Kind of through the lens of the model, show whether over the last 20 years trade policy became more consumer focused because there are due to climate change, there are more crises, and then they have to focus on consumers. I think so. Uh, I mean, if I take the model really seriously, I can back out these lambda weights, I can get an index of how consumer biased or producer biased a government is over time, subject to those import tariffs being able to be adjusted freely every period and no stickiness there, for example. Right. But then I can I can add that tweak to the model to think about capturing that uh, that momentum. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, well, it's great to be here. Thanks uh, to the organizers for putting this on the program. So this is also uh, fairly uh, early work, so any thoughts would be uh, very much appreciated. Um, so the question that we're tackling in this paper is, how should governments design policies uh, to support households in the face of large and unexpected price rises? Um, we're particularly interested in the context of sort of um, heterogeneity across consumers when this heterogeneity might be both across incomes so with you know rich and poor households experiencing these shocks differently but also conditional on incomes as well which potentially makes it then much more challenging to target support through sort of existing tax and benefit systems. So in a situation we're going to have uh, you know different policies are going to come with different trade-offs so one uh, option available to governments is to consider price subsidies. So an advantage of these is that they can effectively support very heavy consumers of a good, but they can also act to encourage overconsumption, especially if people are very price responsive. And depending on the distribution, again, across the income distribution of, um, uh, sort of who are the, the main consumers of different type of the good in question, they can be largely incident on the well -off. Another option available to governments are targeted cash transfers. So these are going to be less likely to distort consumption decisions in the sense that they're not adjusting the price mechanism. But depending on their design, it's possible these are not going to necessarily be targeted at those with the greatest need for the good in question. So this is kind of the general question that we're interested in, but the focus in this paper um, is uh, this is applied to the huge increase in global energy prices that we've seen since uh, 2021. So this actually has led many governments, including the UK, which is going to be our focus, to actually subsidise energy prices. Um, but this has come with a really large revenue cost and has also been sort of highlighted as potentially not um, the most sort of efficient way of designing support. And, you know, comes at a time where governments are also trying at least saying they're trying to actually reduce um, energy consumption. So what this graph shows is just the uh, UK's, uh, the, the wholesale gas price um, in the UK going back to 2019. Um, so you can see that, you know, this was sort of basically starting around the middle of 2021 as the kind of the 
pent up demand due to COVID relaxed and then also global tensions with Russia um, got worse. You've just got this really sharp increase in global energy prices that then translated into an increase in the price uh, of energy in the UK. The UK government uh, very broadly had sort of two parts of its policy. It both subsidized the price of energy, which I'll tell you more about in a couple of slides, um, and it also implemented transfers to households to support, uh, to basically to try and sort of mitigate some of the effects um, of these price rises on, um, on consumers. I think it's important to emphasize the scale of this policy, which was yeah. really pretty large. So the estimated total cost of the whole package, including both the price subsidy and the transfers, is around 70 billion over two years, and this is about 1.5% uh, of GDP. So this means there's you know big gains to trying to think about how to get this right. What we're going to do in this paper is use bank data that comes from uh, bank statements of a sample of just under half a million UK consumers to try and quantify the distributional impact of both the shock and the government uh, policy response. Um, so we're going to start by doing uh, by just describing the exposure of different types of households to these energy price shocks. So particularly kind of zooming in on both differences across income. Um, but also conditional on income, the variation in sort of the amount that people spend on energy, and therefore sort of that gives us a sense of kind of how how different types of households might be differently impacted by these shocks. What we're then going to do is estimate uh, price elasticities for energy using um, sort of exploiting both this uh, rich data and the fact that the UK institutional setting means that we have large step changes in the price of energy faced by consumers, which means that we can kind of, you know, again, sort of uh, think about these being uh, plausibly exogenous changes in the price of energy that they face, which allows us to estimate the, the elasticity both in aggregate, but then also, again, given the size of the sample, allow for a lot of heterogeneity across different types of households. And then the final part, which I will sort of tell you what we're planning here, this is still very much sort of in progress, is to then think about using a flexible model of energy demand that's able to reproduce these patterns, but allows us to separate out the income and substitution effects, which are both important for thinking about welfare, but also then using this framework to think about uh, optimal policy design um, and how the government, depending on its preferences, could possibly uh, do better than they did uh, with, the, with the policy they introduced. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about the data. Um, so this is collected by a company called ClearScore, which are um, a company that essentially provide a range of services to help consumers improve their financial health. So it includes things like credit scores, but also a whole package of things. The data essentially are pulled from bank statements. So you can imagine that the data that we see are essentially lines on the bank statement that you would see if you looked at your bank statement each month. So we know inflows, outflows, the merchant, whether the type of payment. Um, so this means we can very cleanly identify you know, the amount that you're spending on energy um, in each month. But also we know things like what you're spending on um, other uh, types of goods. So we've, we've been looking at non-durables. And we can also construct measures of income. So, you know, we really do see the basket of consumer spending, and we're going to aggregate this to be user year month. Um, one thing I should just say, one of the nice features of this data relative to sort of other similar data that maybe come just from one bank is that consumers are encouraged to link in all of the accounts that they might have with different banks, including both current accounts and credit cards. So we think we have a pretty comprehensive measure of consumer spending. Um, unsurprisingly, the sample is not representative of um, the UK in that it's uh, skewed towards younger and more northern regions. So what we've uh, done is reweighted the data to match the UK population. On the next slide, I'll show you some um, validation uh, that we think we're doing a pretty good job of capturing energy spending in the distribution and across time. Um, okay, so this gives us great measures of spending and specifically energy spending, which is going to be our focus. What we're then going to do is exploit the fact that um, 
from mid uh, 2021, everyone faced essentially the same price of energy that was set by this price cap. Um, and this allows us to then convert spending into usage. Now, of course, for a lot of people, um, in fact, the majority of people in the UK, so sort of 60% uh, or so, pay for their energy in the form of direct debits, which means that they pay the same amount each month. So you kind of, you end up paying, this. so this smooths essentially your consumption over the year. So you would pay um, uh, more than you're consuming in the summer and less than you're consuming in the winter. There are, however, um, uh, a set of consumers, so this is about 40% of the sample, that have variable billing, which basically means that the spending on energy in a given month corresponds closely. We can basically <laughs> infer from that what your usage was in that month. So we're going to be using this sample um, to estimate our quantity responses uh, to the changes in energy prices. Okay, so these are just two pictures to illustrate um, that we think the data are doing a pretty good job of capturing the distribution of energy spending and then the aggregate trends in energy spending uh, over the period of the shock. So the left hand picture shows the distribution in blue of monthly energy spending uh, in our sample in the clear score data. And comparing this to the UK's um, cons consumer spending survey, which is shown in red. Um, and so you can see that broadly these distributions line up. Actually, if anything, you've got more sort of spikes of round numbers in the LCFS, which is sort of what you would expect. Um, but also I think gives us, you know, it's encouraging that actually our clear score data is sort of uh, a bit of a smoother distribution. The right hand side shows the change in energy spending relative to uh, the, or the first quarter of 2019 in the national accounts shown in red, and then again in the clear score data shown in blue. So you can see that actually we are capturing this kind of broad increase, you know, uh, it was sort of flat and then really started to increase. And actually by 2020, by January 2023, uh, people were spending almost twice as much on energy as they were back in uh, 2019. Okay, so what do we know about exposure of households to uh, price increases or energy price increases? So look, what this is showing is the average monthly energy spend, um, conditional on average monthly income on the left-hand side, and then budget energy budgets and shares on the right-hand side. So there's kind of two takeaways from this. The first is that, um, Richer households spend more in cash terms or in level terms on energy. Again, not surprising. So sort of, again, in level terms, they're gonna be more exposed to a price increase. Um, but as a fraction of their overall budget, richer households are spending less. So, you know, the very poorest households are spending sort of 13, you know, 12, 13% of their budget on energy, whereas, um, richer households are spending less than 8%. Now that's all on average, but there's also really significant variation in budget shares, even conditional on um, income. So this is showing the cumulative distributions of the budget share of energy by um, the bottom income quintile up to the top. So you can see the fact that, you know, we've got the, on average, um, the bottom income quintile have a higher budget share. But there really is a lot of variation um, in budget shares, conditional on income. So this reflects the fact that you know we're not going to be able to perfectly target high or high energy consumption households um, just by you know taking sort of um, those households that have high and low income. So twenty percent of the poorest quarter of consumers spend more than fifteen percent of their budget on energy, and I think this is worth bearing in mind when you think about policy, in that these are the households that governments were really concerned about that actually you have a sort of a minority of poorer households that really are spending a lot on energy and potentially given the share of their budget they're spending are going to be uh, subject to large income effects. Okay, so what happened to the energy price over this time period? So in the UK, there was an energy price cap that limited the price that suppliers could charge um, uh, based on estimates of the cost. So this is shown in the red line. In October 
2022, an additional subsidy was introduced that capped the price that consumers paid. Um, and the subsidy was the difference between the price the supplier received and the price that the consumer uh, paid. And so what we're gonna do is focus on these discrete price changes and estimate how the quantity that we demanded um, fell when the price cap went up over each of these periods. And that's what we're showing on this picture here. So the blue line just is repeated from the previous graph. It just gives you the scale of the price rises um, on the right axis. And then you can see the estimated uh, change in quanti quantity relative to the pre-cap, oh, sorry, the, the relative to the, to the pre-crisis period um, over each cap change. So this was the first, second, and then the third. So what you can see from this is just, you know, by the by the time of the last um, or the most recent cap change, there was almost a, sort of a 22% decline in the amount of energy consumed, um, given that uh, at a time when energy prices had uh, more than doubled relative to the pre-crisis period. Um, we can also estimate heterogeneity here. So what we get here is that higher income consumers are um, more elastic. So this is shown by the sort of the vertical differences between these uh, colored lines and consumers that spend a greater fraction of their budget on income are also um, more elastic. So I'm running out of time, but let me just very briefly tell you about what we're gonna do next. So what we want to do is you um, estimate a model of energy demand in order to try and separate. So these elasticities are gonna capture a combination of both income and substitution effects. And this matters when thinking about the welfare effects of the shock and the government policy response. So we're planning to use a, uh, to estimate this flexible model of energy demand um, using the approach developed by Lugel and Pendiker that allows both for rich heterogeneity across consumers um, and flexible uh, uh, income and substitution effects. Uh, so this will allow us both to think about the welfare impacts of the shock itself and the government policy that we actually observed, but also then think about sort of optimal design or uh, of, of um, various different compensation packages. So we're very much still sort of flushing this out. But one of the things we're interested in is saying, okay, how could, what would have um, a, a package that perhaps varied the size of the price subsidy relative to the amount of cash transfers that were given, holding the overall revenue cost of the package constant have looked like, um, and thinking about this in the context of depending on the government's preferences over vertical equity, so how much variation there is across the income distribution, and also horizontal equity, so conditional income. Um, but we can also think about more flexible policy instruments um, as well. So I think, you know, this is very much at the moment we're sort of focusing on understanding the distributional impact of this large increase in energy prices and the government response to this. But I think this is also informative for thinking more broadly about climate change policy, the green transition. There's a huge amount of sort of um, political opposition to certain you know, to, to policies that increase the price of energy, often because people are concerned about the impact that this has on the needs of households. So thinking about what we can learn from the heterogeneity and the demand elasticities that we estimate, um, and then again, thinking about what this means for sort of reducing carbon emissions more broadly while limiting the kind of welfare costs. So, thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you so much for having me. So I'm going to present some very preliminary working progress about the political economic determinants of nuclear energy. And this is John Tork with Maxim Carrier from MIT and So basically, if you look at the global data over the past three or four decades, we see this massive decline in global nuclear energy investment. And this has at least two very important implications. So first, most scientists would believe that Nuclear energy should be an important part of our solution to climate change. So by not investing enough in uh, nuclear energy, we're holding back our progress in terms of climate mitigation. And in addition to that, the lack of investment in nuclear energy also has important geopolitical implications. 
that the kissing colonists would have been seeing over the past two years. But Europe would not have enough nuclear energy to relying on Russia for fossil fuels. So in this paper, we want to understand you know, what caused this massive decline in global nuclear energy investment. And this is something that people have been talking about for a long time. So what swaps out is that you know, there's an economic explanation to this. Which is, you know, in the 1980s and 90s, there was a period when fossil fuel was very cheap. So that made nuclear energy not as appealing at that time. But most people believe that there is also a very important political angle to this problem, which is, you know, after Suriname Island, after Chernobyl, there was mounting public fear against nuclear. And the regulators responded to that public sentiment by regulating nuclear energy to the point that it was no longer profitable. And many people believe that. In this process, the fossil fuel industry also played important roles in facilitating this campaign against nuclear energy. Right? So there has been a lot of discussions on this, but most of the evidence has been uh, qualitative and impressionistic. So what we try to do in this paper is that you know, we try to provide among the first systematic empirical evidence on the political economic determinants of nuclear energy over the past uh, three, four decades. So what we do is that, we focus on the Chernobyl accident, which we consider as a natural experiment in the sense that it triggered a lot of public fear over nuclear while not altering the underlying um, fundamentals related to nuclear energy. But we compile detailed reactor level data to track nuclear investment globally over the past decades. So we're going to first document some descriptive patterns of nuclear investment globally. And then we're going to try to unravel some of the underlying mechanisms and talk about some of the potential consequences of these patterns. So specifically, in this very short talk today, I'm going to discuss uh, three main sets of results. So first, I'm going to show you that you know, after Chernobyl, there was this massive decline in global nuclear energy investment. But what's interesting is that if you look at different countries, this, this global decline was much more salient in the democracies relative to the autocracies. <laughs> and so a natural interpretation is that you know, maybe the democracies, they're just very accountable, they're more responsive to the safety and health of their citizens. That's why they responded more to Chernobyl. And we think this is likely a big part of the story, but this is unlikely to be the entire story. But if you look at the global data, what you see is that the democracies that responded most strongly to Chernobyl also happened to be the ones that had richer endowments in fossil fuels. And you don't see similar patterns for renewable energy endowments. So this, so there are many ways to interpret that result, but one possibility is that you know, maybe the fossil fuel industry also played a role in this process. So to see whether that's the case, we zoom in to specific countries and conduct some case studies uh, with different countries. So in the paper, we studied the US, the UK, Soviet Union, and China, but in the interest of time, in today's talk, I'm going to be really discussing are the results from the UK. Right? So in the UK context, we try to analyze you know, whether the fossil fuel industry played a role in shaping the debates about nuclear in the parliament. So what we do is that we collect the universe of parliamentary speeches in the UK, and then we use machine learning techniques to label those speeches as you know, pro or anti-nuclear. And we document that the members of parliament who were sponsored by the coal mining unions they suddenly became super anti-nuclear right after Chernobyl, right, which shaped the discussion that happened in the parliament. And that's consistent with the fossil fuel industry trying to leverage this opportunity to bash nuclear. And um, I'm going to also very quickly discuss some of the US results uh, as we talk about this. And in the last part of the paper, we try to talk about you know, the consequences of this massive decline in global nuclear energy investment. So one consequence is that you know, by not able to uh, build nuclear reactors, many democracies have to keep uh, relying on fossil fuel, and that increases uh, air pollution. Right? So by linking our estimate of the relationship between nuclear reactors and air pollution to the estimates in the house uh, literature, we calculate massive losses in life years due to the underinvestment in nuclear energy. And the second more striking consequence is that you know, we show that in the democracies, because these countries cannot build new nuclear reactors, but they still need the energy. So they have to keep delaying the retirement of old nuclear reactors. And in the data, we document this convex relationship 
between the age of nuclear reactors and the level of risk. So this means that you know, the democracies by not being able to build new nuclear reactors, they're actually being exposed to higher levels of nuclear risk compared to many of the target authoritarian countries, which had you know, shiny fourth generation nuclear reactors. Okay, so that's the main idea of uh, the, the current results that we have. Okay, so let me give you some brief uh, institutional background. So nuclear energy is generally believed to be uh, very efficient. And it doesn't need a lot of land. And it does generate some radioactive waste, but it can be recycled and reprocessed in a relatively uh, easy and, and safe way. And despite the massive decline in nuclear energy over the past four decades, nuclear remains to be a very important source of energy. There is 10% of the global energy supply and you know, 20% of the US energy supply. And in general, the newer generations of nuclear reactors are much safer than the earlier generations. And uh, within a generation, there's a convex relationship between the age of the reactor and the, the frequency of accidents. And all the major accidents that we think about, you know, Surma Island, Chernobyl, Fukushima, they all happen to second generation nuclear reactors. And the main focus of this project is on uh, the biggest disaster, which is uh, Chernobyl. It happened uh, on April 26, 1986. And so uh, Chernobyl located to the north of Kiev and, and, and the south of Belarus. And in Chernobyl, there were four nuclear reactors designed by the Soviet Union. So one of those uh, had an explosion and caught on fire and spread it uh, across that area. And the toxic fumes you know, flew to other regions all the way uh, to Sweden. So at the time, you know, 200,000 people had to be relocated and people believed that you know, this generated massive uh, health consequences, but we don't have very concrete estimates of those to this day. And after this major accident, there were very heated global debates about nuclear energy policies. So here I'm giving you an example that happened in the UK Parliament five days after the Chernobyl accident. So on May 1st, 1986, there was this uh, Mr. Lofthouse who represented a mining district uh, in North England. So he made a speech trying to attack nuclear energy, seeing that you know, is the prime minister satisfied that a nuclear accident similar to that happened in the Soviet Union could not occur in this country? So if not, will she assure the house that the government will discontinue their interest in pressurized uh, water reactors? And so you can see that, you know, he was trying to attack nuclear energy. And the prime minister at the time being Mrs. Thatcher did not uh, you know, let him off easily. So he should give a very strong response to this comment saying that, you know, no, I can give no such assurance. I know that the honorable gentleman has a specific interest in coal, so referring to his origin from the, the money union. You know, but there are other people who work in the electricity and nuclear industry that work very effectively. So you can see that you know, the people who represent the interests of so the fossil fuel industry, they were not shy about using this accident as an opportunity to attack uh, nuclear energy. And then you know, Mrs. Thatcher was very outspoken about the special interest politics that was involved in this process. And this is not an isolated example, as I'll show you in the data, this happened very systematically uh, in the UK and in the US as well. Okay, so uh, let me talk about the empirical stuff that we have. Uh, so the first step of the empirical exercise is that you know, we want to understand or you know, describe the impacts of Chernobyl on global nuclear power investment. So the main data set that we use for this is a data set that comes from the IAEA, which documents all reactors ever built in the world in any given year. And we link that to the policy model of those countries in uh, 1985. Right? So if the country's policy democracy score is above median, we call it a democracy, and you know, it's below median, we call it uh, autocracy. And this figure plus the raw data of all the operating nuclear reactors globally in any given year. So you can see that you know, before Chernobyl, there was a very rapid rise of nuclear energy investment. And after Chernobyl, globally, it just flattened uh, afterwards. And you know, we can document this in a very simple regression uh, where we regress the number of uh, the new growth in uh, nuclear reactors on post-Chernobyl dummy. And you know, the results are robust to controlling for country phase effect, country specific trends, and, and you know, uh, national GDP. And so this is not very surprising, right? People always knew that after Chernobyl, countries stopped investing in nuclear energy. But what was less well known was that this pattern was actually very heterogeneous. But if you look at 
the democracies, which is a blue curve, versus the autocracies, which is a red curve, they had very different responses to Chernobyl. Right? So the democracies after Chernobyl, they just completely stopped investing in nuclear, and then it declined over time. But in the autocracies, they stopped for a while, and then things started to pick up again. Right? So if you compare the end result, there is a number of reactors today to 1985. You see in the democracies, things decreased on that. In the autocracies, the total number of reactors almost doubled over the past four decades. So we see very heterogeneous responses to the same shock. Uh, we can document this in a simple uh, regression where we regard the growth in nuclear reactors, um, you know, the interaction between the post Chernobyl dummy and uh, the democracy score of those countries controlling for the conventional uh, fixed effects. So you see that you know, after Chernobyl, the democracies were much more responsive uh, to that shock and the results are robust to controlling you know, country fixed effect, year fixed effect, country specific trends, the dynamic impacts of distance to Ukraine, the dynamic impacts of you know, fossil fuel endowment, so on and so forth. And this pattern is also not driven by any <laughs> So you know, from the sample, we can draw the outliers in terms of prior nuclear development, or we can draw any of the biggest players. We can draw the US, uh, the Soviet Union, or China, but the pattern just remains. And so one possibility is that you know, maybe the democracies were more responsive because they were more accountable, but right? they really care more about the, the well-being of their citizens. That's why they need to regulate nuclear more stringently. So we think this is very likely to be part of the story, but there may be other things going on at the same time. So if you look at the data, the democracies that responded most strongly to Chernobyl were the ones that had rich endowments in fossil fuels. But if you look at the endowment in renewable energy, you don't see similar hydrogenities. So this is a cross-country regression. There are many different ways to interpret it. But one possible interpretation is that you know, maybe the fossil fuel industry also played a role in competing against nuclear. And so to see whether that's the case, we zoom into the country-specific uh, case studies. So uh, the main uh, example I'm going to give you today is uh, the UK example. So the data that we use for the UK is the universe of parliamentary speeches. And then we link that to the sponsorship for all the Labour Party MPs. <laughs> And so for every Labour Party MP, we know whether that guy was sponsored by a coal mining union or not. And then we, we, for every speech that these people ever, ever gave, we can use machine learning techniques to label them as you know, pro or anti-nuclear. And then we run a, a very straightforward diff and diff regression. The outcome is the number of anti-nuclear speeches that you gave. On the right-hand side, we have the year dummies. We have the year dummies interacted with whether the MP was sponsored by a mining union or not. And then we control for uh, the MP fixed effect and year fixed effect as standard error source cluster and the constituency them. Okay, so this figure shows you in the in the uh, gray dots the first difference, which shows you you know after Chernobyl everyone became more anti-nuclear. Everyone started to talk more negatively about <laughs> the red curve shows you the second difference. Right, so the guys who were sponsored by the mining units, they were particularly anti-nuclear after Chernobyl, and the, the magnitude is almost an order of magnitude larger than the other MPs. And so this is consistent with you know, the fossil fuel industry trying to use this opportunity to really hit the nuclear industry. And you know, we can use different outcome variables, such as you know, the frequency of talking about nuclear safety, or you know, the, the frequency of mentioning coal and Chernobyl in the same speech, you see very similar patterns. Right, so in this table, uh, in the first three columns, we just quantify what we saw in the figures. And then in columns four to six, we use other alternative measures of uh, sentiment against nuclear. We see very similar patterns. Uh, in the last column, we conduct a simple placebo test. We look at the speeches that mention nuclear, but they're talking about nuclear weapon in terms uh, instead of nuclear energy. And we see no differential patterns between the, MP, uh, the, the, the common sponsored MPs and other MPs. And so one possible story is that you know, maybe the labor, the, the, the common uh, sponsored MPs, they just became better human beings after 1986. They really started to care about the health and well-being of the citizens. So we could see that we can test uh, the speeches where they mention health and environmental issues. Uh, and we don't see similar patterns, uh, similar changes before and after 1986. So this is less consistent with a political accountability story, but more consistent with a special interest politics story. So we're working on uh, the US right now, but, but we see in general a very similar pattern. So after Chernobyl, you see 
the fossil fuel firms started to donate a lot more to the congressman compared to other non-energy firms, uh, which is uh, uh, similar to uh, what happened in the UK in terms of special interest politics. And finally, in the, in the paper, we very quickly discussed the two major consequences uh, of this decline in global nuclear energy. So one thing is that you know, we can conduct simple even study estimates of you know, the opening or closing of nuclear reactors on local air pollution as measured by satellite data. We see that you know, by not being able to build new nuclear reactors, you delay the phasing out of coal, which generates higher pollution. And we can link that to uh, the estimates in the house literature and we see massive, massive losses in life years due to the underinvestment in nuclear energy. And another thing we can do in the data is that you know, we can document this convex relationship between nuclear age and uh, the frequency of accidents. And we can link that to the age of nuclear reactors in different countries. And we can calculate the overall exposure to nuclear risks between democracies and autocracies. And you see that you know, the, the democracies are more exposed to nuclear risk out of their fear for nuclear risk. I think I'm out of time, so I'll just leave this page. So our last presentation before lunch. I'm Filippo Anello, I'm a PhD student at the University of Bologna, and I'm happy to be here to present this joint work in the battle of air conditioning with national electricity consumption across poor countries. So I think that we all know that global warming is making hot extremes more frequent and more intense. And we have a huge literature on climate metrics showing that this extreme heat we have important welfare costs. So costs in terms of impact on health, like neutrality, morbidity, mental health. We have impact on past productivity, learning achievements. So there are many outcomes that are here. At the same time, we have a little bit suggesting that agents are trying to shield themselves, so to cope with these negative impacts, how by adopting heat adaptation technologies, particularly air conditioners. Air conditioners indeed have been found to be very protective, to be very effective at protecting individuals from extreme heat. There is a very nice example from Barrett and Waters in John Bay Economy, where they found that basically the damage function of the between temperature and mortality in the United States has been flattened by the boom of air conditioners in the country between the 60s and 80s, and founding an 80% reduction in heat rate in the country. But there are also other examples in the literature, this protected. And clearly, given that this the extreme heat is becoming more frequent, rising income, especially in the developing world, and also this effectiveness on the good, demand for reconditioning is projected basically to skyrocket, especially in the developing world. Really, the benefits that comes from this adaptation strategy is one side of the coin. There is also another side of the coin, and maybe the cost that this type of technology might entail. So in terms of repercussions of the, what, this widespread use of the technology is an energy, energy intensive technology. And so for this reason, it might have other type of, some type of implication. And in this project, we and some other projects related that we are conducting right now, we are trying to go to answer to this rich question. So what are these type of implications and what will be some of the cost of the improvement? So what are the potential relevant, some of the potential relevant precautions that we are looking for? So first of all, we have the impact on households expenditure, meaning that if you adopt the good and it's an energy testing good, you have to use it, you want to use it. This will have an impact on your budget allocation, especially if you're poor. This might lead to problem of energy poverty. So there's not anymore just really the heating, might be related to also food in this case. Then you have the impact on electricity systems. So we have we hear, we hear, even in the developed world, we hear that there are power outages during the summer because of the um, contemporary use of air conditioners in that area. It happened in Italy two years ago, it happened in Texas, it's in the United States, it happened. So it happened everywhere. Think about what might happen even in developing And then you have the feedback emission of renal gases. So clearly cooling might have a social cost, let's say, that comes from the increasing use of the good in terms of additional greenhouse gas emission that comes from the use of the good. Um, so what we're going to do in this paper. So in this paper, we do like a, to understand before what are and understanding what will be the repercussion. The first thing we have to do is try to understand the impact that reconditioning has on the residential electricity demand. So understanding exactly what is estimated basically and elasticity of the impact of reconditioning. 
And if we do that by collecting household survey data from 25 countries, representing around 70% of the global electricity consumption, so you know, the airport, and then we model the framework in a discrete continuous way, in a way that we can both measure the intensive margin response, meaning how households react to changes in weather conditions in their electricity consumption, and the extensive margin response, meaning how they change whether to have an air conditioner to, to not have an air conditioner to have an air conditioner. So the technology determines how they can, if they can react and how they can. Then we are going to use hour coefficients also to provide a uh, estimate of the electricity used for air conditioning, just for air conditioning. And we are going to make projections of this electricity use. Uh, and projection will not take account just of income and climate, but also take account of other socioeconomic drivers and social demographic drivers that we include in the analysis. And then we provide for this project simple, it is an empirical work, simple to be able to calculation of what are might be these implications I discussed before. So on one side, we are looking at impact on household by the share, so in terms of energy poverty. Then we are looking at some engineering back then have a calculation on the changes with peak generation and faster generation. And then have what we call the social cost of which is basically the monetary values of these additional CO2 emissions come from. So let's look at the data very quickly. So it's difficult to find, as you might know, data on both air conditioning and electricity consumption if we usually panel data. So what we usually are able to find is cross-sectional survey data. So we collect cross-sectional survey data from 25 countries and this Cross-sectional data might have two main variables that we're interested into, indeed, the ownership of air conditioning and the electricity consumed, plus a set of household economic characteristics and social demographic drivers that we um, we uh, let's say harmonize to create an our hypothesis. We then merge these data sets with information using the immediate level information of the main data set, population weight the climate data from era five. The main variable that we use from era five is temperature in order to construct cooling and heating degree days using a type of threshold of 18 degrees. Then we have the recommendation of shares and the literacy priority that comes from the national national uh, level from various sources. Sometimes we have also direct at the household level, because it's including this. So this is the country coverage. We have been able to include uh, basically all the continents, okay? And covering itself more than 70% of the uh, electricity consumption worldwide. So I will be very brief on this one, just to explain why we use a discrete continuous framework. The idea is that if you have a, a household that maximizes in a typical production function framework on the household, the household, so decide to allocate resources between a consumption good and uh, in this case, we say they invest in thermal comfort. And thermal comfort depends on the weather condition outside, so if it's hot or not today, and the quantity of electricity that he consumes. Here, you are not taking account without, it is an unconditional utility factors and natural problems, and not take account the technology you might have in order to produce this thermal comfort. So the idea here is basically to assume that the household not only decides how much to consume in terms of how much to allocate for electricity consumption, but also it decides whether to not having a portfolio of appliances which includes an air conditioning with respect to another one that does not. So this means that he's able to produce them more comfort if and only if, you know, this is our strong assumption, if and only if he has an air conditioning. And so you reach at the end a final conditional demand for electricity quantity. So not anymore an unconditional, but so how do we this translate into the empirical framework? So the idea of the empirical framework is that you have simply we start from the log of an electricity demand in Alaska in country C, and then our coefficient of interest are beta one and beta two. So AC here represents a dummy variable, zero one, indicating when a household at least an air condition is totally swelling. And we have interacted also to measure utilization along with the distribution of uh, of the current uh, um, drive up cooling degree days, the uh, impact of, so to make the impact move across the uh, CD distribution. And this is a function of CD that we decide to have a second degree polynomial. And the reason why we choose a second degree polynomial is because we expect the response, this adaptation response function to be concave. Why concave? So two reasons. First of all, we might expect houses to have some sort of risk point in the production of thermal 
So they re so we expect diminishing returns to adaptation. So at the point, you keep producing pooling, but you already reach somehow some sort of satisfaction. And the second reason is because usually this type of technology have limit, they are bounded by technology, they have limited capacity. So they have a capacity. So if you run your condition at maximum power during a day, you will consume more than 17 kilowatt hour. Right? Because they, they cannot consume more than then we control for uh, income, prices, uh, house of characteristics, country, et cetera. We have also specification way the administrative levels, et cetera, it was even more stringent, et cetera, but uh, they are all consistent with our results, but I'm showing you just the, 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 most, the most simple uh, expression. So now you might imagine that the coefficients for air conditioning are likely to be endogenous. There might be, first of all, some unobservables like ventilation house that you cannot control for, or there might be uh, selections creating the type of house that owns an air condition. Okay. So for this reason, we use the approach of W. McFadden and Yen 4 from Africa, which suggests that you can construct a sort of control function approach. You can construct a correction term that you then insert in the second day demand equation. And this correction term is constructed using the predictive probabilities from a logic, regret, logic regression on the decision of adopting the approach. The main difference also you might know this respect to demand is that we assume that air conditioning depends not on the contemporaneous screen degree days, but on the long-term average. And the reason is because these type of goods are known to be long lifetime durables. And so it's known that in the extensive margin in this case is uh, based on expectation about average weather conditions and not uh, just in response to short-term shocks. So that's why we use the uh, So you construct your correction term and you insert that in the demand equation. After that, we use clean this hour survey weights in order to uh, have population estimate and we start the cluster. So what do you obtain? So this are, is the response function that you obtain in our using example. So what you see here is that, so basically here is not, um, it's not significant, meaning that at very low level of wind degrees, you do not use the wood, you don't have an impact on retention of demand. Then you have an average marginal effect, which is 34%. So I mean, having the good increase, your electricity and annual increasing demand by 35%. And this average marginal effect increases as the green degree is so increases with climate, which makes sense. Utilization increases the more the hotter it is your okay? And it reached a peak around the 65%. Now, what we can also show with our result, with our data, is that looking, for instance, at some heterogeneity results. First of all, the income level here, we divided for each country, in country specific uh, quintile. So we, in, like in the first quintile, you have all the first quintile from all countries. So, um, and second, third, and fourth quintile, you notice some kind of difference, with, especially with respect to the third quintile, to the third quintile in the other uh, The first and the second consume the impact is higher than with respect to the fourth and the fifth, also in terms of utilization. Um, here, there are many mechanisms that we cannot really disentangle. You might have scale effect, meaning that, for instance, the fourth quintile might have similar technology to the third, but he might have more appliances. And so you have a scale effect, or in other case, you have a technological effect, so you have better technology, so uh, the impact which is small. Then you can look at the country level. So if you estimate at the country level instead, so when you look at the country heterogeneity, what you notice here, we have ordered the variable in total expenditure, in total expenditure per capita, and uh, the variable, sorry, the country, and you notice a decreasing trend in the heat that air conditioning might have. And this suggests this is more in line with that you're suggesting that in these areas there are better technology with respect to what you see. Okay. Now, another thing that you might uh, wonder, well, okay, air conditioning seems to be to have an important effect, fine, but there are many other variables that might be important and so leading it to uh, to be more important in the future for future is actually to see the map. Well, we try to see if it is true. Uh, if air condition really matters. So what we did here is to estimate for each country in our data set a, a specific model for that country in a standard, using standardized coefficients. And then to make, uh, let's say, a descriptive meta-analysis of these coefficients and understanding uh, how much they impact on it. 
And here in red is her conditioning, and this is the precise demand, so the average minus effort. And you see that he clearly emerges as the uh, main, really a main driver, or the main driver actually of the current retention of the demand. Now, first implications, and I'm almost done. Uh, the first implication is about household budget. So we use our two co our coefficients to construct a um, basically a percentage that for each household has been allocated to electricity consumption for her conditioning. And when we look at, we then multiply that for electricity prices and we look at the uh, respect to how much of the budget they have allocated. And basically what we notice that especially in some developing, developing world, like for instance in Africa or in Pakistan even more in, in uh, India, uh, in Brazil, you have country where you were in the lowest quintile in, uh, spend more than tools and they have an air conditioner and they spend more than 5% of their total expenditure on air conditioning expenditure. So this suggests that, first of all, it suggests for one of the reasons why it's so difficult in this country to actually close the gap in terms of cooling access. And second, it also shows, it clearly poses the problem that if this is the impact that it has today, uh, and there are, and clearly we rise the income, some of this impact, we have to understand, we are doing it here historically. We don't know how all the other expansion will evolve, okay? But clearly it suggests that there is a dimension of energy poverty, especially in some countries that are very, very hot, like, like in Africa or in Brazil. So in countries that are characterized by hot temperature that we need to understand. So not looking just at the heating dimension, but also the cooling dimension, because it covers a lot of expenditure, like in fact, since 10% of the minimum. For the lowest screen. Now, looking at the projections, I'll be quick. That's two slides and then lunch. So, uh, we look first of all, we try to project penetration rate of air conditioning. And we see, so in our assembly, the average is like 26%. And then we projected that and it goes to 14% in STP 2.5 at 2050. And in the worst case scenario, it goes to 52%. Uh, and what does it mean that? So clearly also because of how we have modeled air conditioning, we do not see a huge boost in the household specific electricity uh, demand for uh, air conditioning. But since we have more and more people that now have an air conditioner, you have more and more, you have, you have new people to, to, uh, to the equation when you sum up, you aggregated the country demand. And so that's why you have these two to 0.6 times boost in the electricity demand coming from air and where it comes from, mainly from the developing world, as we might imagine, like in India, especially in India or in uh, um, Indonesia, also in China. So where we have also the major boost in the penetration rate of the world. What are some of the implications? Again, very simple example that I brought for this presentation is like take India as an example. So in terms of peak generation capacity is as of today, around 230 gigawatt hour in 2023. And if you make some assumption, typical engineering assumption of how the electricity consumption is distributed in, in time, in a specific time period during the year for electricity, to cover that the increase that happened in India that we, we project in India in 2050, this peak generation capacity should increase by 150 to 200 gigawatt hours. So it might almost doubled just to avoid uh, basically continuously buying uh, electricity uh, so from, from uh, international, because that's the only way otherwise this respond. Or the other ways that we cannot observe, how do we might respond to this excess demand? It might be through increasing prices, but this is something that we cannot observe, but that's the other way. So or you increase capacity or you buy abroad or, uh, or you increase prices. So it's anyway, it's a cost that someone at the end will bear. And so we, we it's important to understand who's going to bear that. Finally, looking at the social cost of cooling, which is the last thing, clearly uh, what we estimate is around the current CO2 emission from AC electricity, I'm concluding, is 365 mm -hmm. million tons uh, of CO2, which corresponds to around the emissions from France. And we see a clear boost in emissions. This translates using the from related to this, the central body of carbon to around 128, 175 billion US dollars. Clearly, the positive, let's say, the positive results from Rodetal is that they show that 
we might expect that partially this cost will be balanced by the decreasing global energy use from heat. Okay, so, but the point is that understanding anyway, in terms of environmental justice, who is going to, uh, who is going to emit this type of emissions, so we might be especially to reach, and who is going then to prepare them. So that's another, however, aspect of this thing. And that's also, thank you for your attention. I think um, just so people know, there's going to be IDC countries and all the IDC countries in the foyer. They're going to sort of work with all the Um, great. So thank you very much for asking me to talk today. Uh, we're going to be talking about climate adaptation in developing countries. So let me start uh, by framing the conflict about why we need adaptation in developing countries. So this is a map of the world. And the colors essentially represent the impact of a one degree Celsius shock on, on GDP per capita. And the reason why countries are different sizes than you might expect is because it is proportioned to the population uh, uh, of the world. And so many people have made several versions of this map. This is a particular one from the IMF. And so what, from what I think strikes is quite striking is that the impact of water years on GDP per capita is on average higher for developing countries, which then starts to, I think, set up the need for adaptation. Today, 60% of the world's population lives in one of those red regions, and by 2100, 75% will. And therefore, even with deep emissions cuts, adaptation becomes starts to look quite critical. We can also take these estimates and the fact that the last 50 years have already seen some warming to start thinking about how climate change in the last 50 years has impacted global inequality. And there's already work that does that. And what it finds is that in the last half century or so, within country inequality has decreased, but it has decreased slower than what it would have had global warming not existed. And I think this starts to then put in context the fight against poverty and therefore the need for adaptation um, as well. And so this is, I'm just gonna start with an overview of the literature on what we know about hotter years, worse rainfall years and extreme events like hurricanes and floods and what they do to economic outcomes in developing countries. And so I already talked about how it affects GDP per capita. It also affects GDP growth and the impacts are much worse for developing countries. So we're looking at all the countries in the world on average. Uh, it affects mortality, including infant mortality. So this is uh, the Pierre paper uh, is looking at data from about 53 developing countries and, and about countries who find that the impact of hot days on infant mortality is an order of a magnitude larger in developing countries. It looks like what the impacts used to look like in the US before there was mass rollout of air pollution. Um, hotter years and worse rainfall years increase crime, conflict, and violence. So this paper is a review paper that talks about a large portion of sub-Saharan Africa, this work in other countries, in other developing countries as well. Uh, and it has particular implications for gender-based violence like dowry deaths and witch killings. It affects child health and educational attainment. Uh, so the Caruso paper looks at data from 15 Latin American countries and looks at the lifetime effect of being exposed to natural disasters early in life. Uh, it affects agricultural productivity, firm and worker productivity um, across many developing countries. It affects whether firms live or die as well. And so these effects on average are pretty large. They're worse for developing countries, as I said. And sometimes these impact last for decades. And so being exposed to a worse rainfall year or a natural disaster can affect your educational attainment over the course of your life, as well as your lifetime earnings. 
Income is often an important indicator. For instance, being exposed early in your life to a natural disaster is worse if you're born to a poor or not on average. That's what the producer paper tells us. But it is not the only mediator, and the impact would be more for people who are on average perhaps higher income. Okay, so with that, I hope everyone wants to talk about adaptation. Um, but so let me just start by giving you a little bit of a smattering of what are some things that we know from prior work helps adaptation and what are some of the costs of these adaptive behaviors because they are often, uh, more often than not, quite costly. So for instance, this is a paper that looks at um, a flood resistant variety in India and it finds that it can affect productivity in the course of flooding. And, and this is usually like really good news for agricultural technology, it is not lower return when it doesn't flood. So something that I think comes up pretty strongly from the literature and development economics over the last many years is that poor households and farmers and firms often undertake adaptive behaviors that trade off the volatility of income with the average income. And so when we think about adaptation, I think it's pretty important to keep that in mind as we're making policy recommendations is to know both what something does in the good year as well as in the market. There's uh, lots of other work that looks at, so irrigation is extremely uh, well, is a, is, a, is a technology that is really important for, for adaptation. Crop diversification also helps adaptation. Something very subtle, like even planting dates, uh, can increase the adaptive capacity of farmers. So that's sort of the, the good news. What are some things that I think need a lot more work and we should keep in mind? First, like all technologies, the performance in a lab or on a testing plot is very different than performance in the field. And so indeed, the DAR et al. paper has a, a pretty hopeful message where it finds that this is a very effective uh, a flood resistant technology for farmers, but it also points out that the agronomy returns in a test plot versus a plot when you actually do an RCT for farmers is much lower. And so it's good, but it's not as good as we would have thought when we were testing this thing out in the lab. And so taking these technologies out, looking at adoption, looking at returns, I think is quite important. So I already talked about how certain adaptive behaviors trade off mean and variance in returns. And then of course, there's equity implications. So the DAR paper finds that on average, because poorer farmers also happen to be in more flood prone areas, this technology has excellent equity implications. If we think that poorer households might also have lower access to networks via which knowledge regarding technology flows, that's something that we have to keep in mind again when we're making policy recommendations about the rollout of technologies. And then we have, again, several decades, you know, whether risk is something development economists have lost sleep over for a long time. And I think some of those lessons we can start to think about how an increased probability of worse years, an increased probability of a natural disaster, what that would do to income and death, or how we should think about mitigating. So things like risk sharing, but it's much less effective if entire villages and entire countries are struck by natural disasters. Asset choices for our households have assets that are lower variance, but also lower return. Migration, yeah, and Alan and Eva will talk more about it. So I'm just going to say migration and then wait for them to pick that up. Uh, and then, of course, like sectors in which people work. People switch from agriculture to non agriculture in the face of certain income shocks. And that, I think, when we're just thinking about the process of development and where people are working, has implications for comparative advantage and sorting uh, and the organization of what firms might look like in the future. All right, so that's some adaptations that we know about. What are some recent technologies, financial or otherwise, uh, that work would tell us as promised as adaptive technologies? So first, this work that shows that access to capital facilitates recovery and growth for firms. This study finds that firms that were given capital grants in Sri Lanka, very small firms, recovered about two years on average faster uh, because they have that access to capital. Weather-based index insurance, again, has been something that's really well studied by development economists, and yes, it has some promise, but it also has, 
I don't know if I would use the word per perplexingly because not many, some people are not perplexed by the low returns. Let's just say it has low returns and maybe we want to take a more look at, at how, to, um, how to make that take up higher. And then this is a very interesting recent paper from Bangladesh. And what this paper shows is that guaranteeing liquidity in the face of flooding ex ante can have really promising adaptive returns because it increases insurance. And so households can undertake ex ante greater levels of investment, as well as if the flooding happens, returns to ex post consumption smoothing as well. And I think this is like a really interesting example of a technology that has high take up and high returns and it's is quite promising. And then we can think about things like adaptive mitigation. Are there technologies that are real emissions that can also help us adapt? So in some of my work, I found that removing sort of really, um, removing kind of conventional lighting well, with and replacing that with LED lighting in garment factories can actually break the relationship between a hotter year, between a hotter day and worker productivity. And that's because conventional lighting dissipates a lot more heat. So your factory floor is on average about 1.5 degrees Celsius to 1.8 degrees Celsius hotter. And so LED kind of lowers the temperature and, and therefore has this uh, adaptive effect, even though it's actually a low emissions technology. I'm not saying these returns exist everywhere, but they probably exist a little bit more than we think. All right. So let me then kind of end in my last sort of four-ish minutes on by starting to talk about the role of policy, which my co-panelists will will do more about. So first of all, we don't have super like lots of policies in developing countries that are focused on climate change per se. But as I said, there are lots of policies that uh, in fact mitigate income shocks in the face of extreme weather. And so I think we can start to draw some lessons. Uh, so first, again, developing countries have lower access to social safety nets, which are perhaps not surprising to many more. But social protection programs like welfare programs in India can, in fact, attenuate the negative effect of rising temperatures on learning. So I think this is a pretty powerful example of a policy that is a good policy on average and also has adaptive uh, returns. There's also work that looks at, again, policies that are good on average that reduce poverty, such as banking expansion in rural areas, but also have adaptive returns, like breaking the relationship between temperature and mortality, similar with things like last mile healthcare delivery. And so this is um, a very recent paper that talks about how we can make households more drought resilient. And what these guys do is they look at cash transfers combined with either money for productive investments in non agricultural work or vocational training. And they find that both have adaptive returns, but via very different mechanisms. So vocational training increases the probability that you migrate or work in, in other, for other people, whereas productive in investment implies that you end up working more for yourself and, and therefore achieve adaptation in that way. So I think more interventions that, that test through different things and understand the mechanisms for adaptation um, would be really great to have in this debate. And then what I do want to point out is that this long literature in development economics and political economy also tells us that political economy concerns are pretty first order when it comes to things like uh, disaster aid, uh, etc. And so you know, the Cole et al. paper tells us that governments are more responsive to natural disasters during election years. And so what implications of these electoral cycles um, are there for adaptation? What is the role of international organizations with Berlin? So that's to become important. And then this is a really excellent paper that talks about how reducing vulnerability of households to rainfall shocks also reduces clientism. So it reduces the probability that they ask their local politician for favors. And I think this then starts to tell us that maybe that adaptation itself can reshape political relationships and that that has implications for further adaptation um, down the road. All right, so I'm just gonna sort of end where I began, which is climate change and weather shocks impact households, firms, and farmers along a variety of very first order outcomes like mortality, mobility, income, conflict, capital formation, so on and so forth. And 
households farmers and farmers are continually I'm gonna I'm gonna make it more upbeat. They're always trying to adapt, but in fact they're seldom able to mitigate the impacts completely, therefore setting up the role of the policy. And even though, of course, we've seen many examples of successful policies that facilitate adaptation, we do have, uh, have to think about political economy concerns and how they shape and are shaped by adaptation. And then I think the, the big kind of elephant in the room, or maybe it's a small elephant, I guess we don't know what adaptation financing would look like, but uh, thinking about how to best allocate that is, is extremely important. All right, I will stop there. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you very much. So, uh, Namar has given this uh, extremely clear uh, discussion, introduction to how uh, uh, to think about uh, how uh, economics uh, toolkits have been used to examine and, and sort of recent findings on adaptive behaviors by individual economic agents, so by farmers, by, by households, by firms. And what I'm gonna focus on in my 15 or so uh, minutes, apparently uh, very precisely uh, 15 minutes, uh, is to think a little bit about uh, how accounting for spatial linkages uh, might uh, influence our estimates of adaptation requirements, but also uh, adaptation mechanisms and, and the implications of, of adaptation. Uh, I'm going to be talking and sort of drawing on some recent advances, which I will mention, though not discuss in, in sort of great depth given, given the time limit, about some of the recent advances, both in terms of data, but also in terms of the types of theoretical toolkits that economists used to think about these things in advancing these sorts of uh, questions. But uh, really, I, I hope more of a focus here will be on uh, the fact that this is still very much a sort of nascent uh, literature, certainly using these types of tools to think about adaptation questions is, is uh, quite new, and I think there's really a lot of scope for continuing to make progress on this to leverage these sorts of tools to think about adaptation questions that I hope we can talk much more about in the policy session. In that context, uh, spatial linkages uh, are likely to be uh, very important in mediating climate change impacts. Uh, I'll talk through two sort of key dimensions of that. The first is uh, growing evidence that climate shocks are likely to be transmitted and indeed amplified by a spatial <laughs> linkages through trade and migration and, and uh, production network uh, linkages and so on. Um, but importantly, and perhaps more hopefully, uh, it may also be the case that spatial linkages might play a role in helping to facilitate adaptation, given the fact that uh, in, in many dimensions, uh, climate change is, is projected to have very heterogeneous impact across, uh, across space. So uh, there is, as I've, uh, I've mentioned already, this recent literature that tries to examine these effects, uh, drawing on uh, enormous recent advances in uh, global, spatially explicit, often very high resolution micro data sets. We saw some lovely examples of this this morning, uh, so I don't need to motivate that too much. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, detailed administrative data on uh, households, on linkages between firms and so on, and some of the references I'll talk about uh, will mention some of those data sets. And alongside that, uh, the sort of evolution and the types of spatial general equilibrium models that we can use to think about these linkages and to uh, take these types of questions uh, to do with welfare and policy counterfactuals to examine these. Importantly, and, and a focus of uh, some of my work and of, of some of what I will talk about today, uh, is the fact that in bringing these sorts of tools and data sets to thinking about adaptation, a particular challenge has been that adaptation is, of course, uh, you know, as, as, as is the case of long-run damages that, that Namrata um, uh, discussed, uh, a somewhat of a long-run phenomenon. Many of these uh, damages and the adaptive responses that respond to them uh, are going to evolve over time spans of sort of decades and centuries, and it is becoming increasingly um, sort of possible with these extra tools to think about uh, incorporating into temporal decision making across space, which is historically proved so difficult to make tractable. 
think so turning to the, the first of these spatial linkages and the transmission uh, of climate shocks, uh, there is a, a growing evidence base that the effects of climate shocks, of so extreme weather, uh, uh, temperature shocks and so on, may be transmitted across regions via general equilibrium adjustments uh, to economic activity. Uh, and the uh, growing evidence base here seems to suggest that accounting for these uh, can be really quite important quantitatively in our estimates of what climate damages uh, are going to be uh, and what the requirements for adaptation will be in the future. Uh, I'm not going to sort of go through all of these papers in detail, but to give some sense of some of the quite striking numbers here. Uh, so uh, some, some very nice recent papers looking at how trade uh, might propagate and amplify the impacts of natural disaster shocks. So if we look at uh, US natural disasters over a span of several decades, uh, we see that you know a dollar of lost uh, sales at the level of a supplier firm uh, results in you know nearly two and a half dollars worth of, of lost sales at the customer level. Uh, lots of evidence drawing on the Great East Japan earthquake suggesting that input output linkages also lead to sort of uh, large estimates there. And these effects are felt across uh, as well as within countries. So again, drawing on, on the same uh, natural disaster. Uh, evidence for uh, the impacts uh, in uh, uh, affecting the US production network partners. What I want to draw attention to here is again some elements of what we know, which points uh, largely to many things that we do not know about the complexity of these effects. And this is going to be very important in thinking about damage estimation uh, and consideration of adaptation is to account for these types of complexities. So we see, you know, some evidence in, in these and, and other related papers uh, mm -hmm. of. Uh, the, the nature of these propagation effects. So there's evidence for propagation both upstream and downstream in supply chains. We see uh, direct impacts as well as indirect impacts. So this is affecting a firm's suppliers and its suppliers, suppliers uh, and its customers and its customers' customers. And this becomes a very difficult sort of fixed point problem if you try to analyze it. Uh, we also see horizontal propagation to suppliers of the same firm and so on. So this isn't even a, even the sort of first order supplier link is a complicated problem, but in fact, it's much worse than that. Uh, and, uh, and of course, as we would expect and sort of consistent with anecdotal reporting of, of cases you've probably read about in the news, uh, input specificity is, is going to be very important. Uh, briefly, again, on, on migration, or as briefly as uh, I can be, which is never very brief, um, but uh, migration uh, is another channel that has received some attention. But again, this is a sort of fast evolving literature and there should be much more uh, on this, but there is uh, evidence of migration transmitting uh, the effects of climate disasters across regions. This is focused, uh, much of this literature has focused on, on looking at temperature extremes. Uh, again, I hope that the policy discussion, in the policy discussion, we will uh, uh, have time to talk about uh, sort of uh, data and, and the, the data requirements and the data opportunities in this space. But by virtue of the fact that these extreme events, uh, studying these empirically is very difficult. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, temperature has received uh, more attention here. I think it's, 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 it's other types of extreme events, perhaps for S. But uh, so we see um, uh, evidence that uh, temperatures deviating from moderate optimums do appear to, uh, at least with this paper finding, they lead to increases in asylum applications to the EU. Other papers um, sort of finding uh, interesting heterogeneity suggesting this is uh, driven predominantly by effects from agricultural regions and uh, consistent with that non-linearities in this relationship, sort of consistent with a, a pretty well-studied uh, relationship between temperatures and agricultural yields and so on. Um, and as I, as I mentioned, sort of uh, what literature there is on this suggesting uh, the, that there's likely to be heterogeneity across uh, disaster types. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, more muted evidence uh, of, of uh, relocation in response to flooding events and heat stress. But where I want to sort of uh, focus focus the rest of uh, my remarks is is beyond this uh, role potential role of spatial linkages in transmitting uh, climate shocks is the potential role that spatial linkages may play in adaptation. And the, the starting point for this is uh, some uh, very nice evidence from sort of across studies, across contexts, looking at uh, the projected impacts of climate change uh, on a set of outcomes. So on the left-hand side, this is uh, Arno and uh, Dave and Forrest uh, work looking at agricultural yields for wheat and rice, rice and wheat, wheat and rice um, across space under central climate scenarios. Uh, this is uh, Ishan's work uh, looking at uh, projected impacts across sectors rather than across crops. And, and what we see here is that across uh, crops on the left-hand side, uh, across uh, sectors, across space, 
uh, very heterogeneous projections for the impacts of climate change. And that heterogeneity you can see here is not just across countries, often it's within countries as well. Uh, so this suggests uh, that the fact that we are uh, sort of projected to see changes in comparative advantage across the base, across the uh, and across crops, suggests that general equilibrium adjustments might uh, potentially play, play a role in, in mediating climate change impacts if spatial linkages can uh, reduce the costs of reallocating consumption and production across space. Uh, of course, uh, as Alan has highlighted this morning, uh, this is not straightforward, um, but it's a, a sort of area that has received uh, recent attention uh, through a number of channels. So uh, some of these I've already mentioned, but looking at the potential implications of uh, decisions, for instance, around uh, crop production choices, trade flows, reallocation across sectors, uh, and migration. Uh, and these uh, the papers I mentioned here, and that I'll, I'll say a little bit about um, the findings of, uh, typically are combining these uh, sort of types of uh, uh, spatial general equilibrium models. Uh, what I cited at the beginning was sort of a review piece. This is an enormous uh, and enormously fast growing literature that, that it's a, the, oh, well, Okay, um, <laughs> right, uh, uh, with, with these sort of uh, data advances, let me just speed up. Um, the results here are going to suggest that the types of adjustments uh, mentioned here can have quantitatively important um, sort of implications uh, for, uh, for impacts. So the estimated global losses um, projected to uh, be reduced by, you know, two thirds if we account for different uh, problems. Adaptive crop production choices, more muted effects of export shares, uh, uh, again, higher effects of bilateral import shares. Uh, Ishan's work on uh, sectoral reallocation suggesting, in fact, increases driven by the social food problem that I'll ask you, let him ask you, let you ask him about in the break because I'm going to run out of time. Um, yes. I don't know if you one minute. Thank you. Well, five minutes. Five, I, I, I don't want to take five minutes of your time. I sort of have in mind I have until 10 past, but I, anyway, I'm making it up. So I, I, uh, my timing, I will follow your lead. Um, I, I just want to briefly mention uh, some recent evidence on firm level uh, adjustments and spatial linkages. This is something that, again, the sort of increasing availability of production network data is, is sort of facilitating. Um, very nice uh, recent papers looking at the spatial organization of firms and how that might respond to climate shocks, climate risk. So uh, uh, Juan uh, Castro Vincenzi's paper looking at um, uh, the global car industry and how the location of plants responds to flooding. Um, uh, network linkage is also shown to play a role in that. So customers uh, uh, being found to respond to perceived changes in the climate risk of their suppliers and sort of shifting towards less risky suppliers. I wanted to talk you briefly through uh, uh, some recent work we have on this. Let me just very briefly say, um, uh, here we are studying firm level adaptation uh, following uh, floods in Pakistan over a sort of 10 year period. And we find that network effects here are really key. So we're finding uh, around about a quarter of firms in our data are gonna see flooding in their premises, consistent with the papers I stated earlier on, about three quarters are going to see flooding of one of their supply chain partners, and about a half of pairs in a, in a buyer-supplier relationship are going to see uh, flooding of the, the transport route that connects them. So uh, accounting for these network effects can be very important, and we're gonna show evidence for these uh, sort of persistent adaptive responses along a series of really quite sophisticated margins that suggest that firms are taking those network linkages into account and making their adaptation decisions. Very uh, briefly then in my final minute or two um, on, uh, on the dynamics here, I've motivated this already. This is an inherently dynamic problem, um, but dynamic spatial general equilibrium modeling is difficult. Um, and uh, there have been these sort of recent innovations in uh, a number of different ways of thinking about making that dynamic problem tractable that have been started to uh, uh, see, uh, that are starting to see applications to questions of adaptation and where I think there's a lot of promise for more uh, work here. So this is some of my work that uh, uses such a model to think about how far uh, we would make different decisions or should make different decisions about where to allocate infrastructure and spatial policy according to whether or not we take into account future sea level rise. And I find that the dynamics are really important. So if I'm very short term, I want to you know, put the roads where the people are, but once they start accounting for the fact that some of these areas are going to uh, face future climate damages, I might make different decisions there. Um, uh, other work 
uh, looking at, so this is another paper looking at sea level rise here in the global context, uh, which uh, shows you, you get these really enormously uh, different estimates uh, of the welfare uh, costs of climate change once you account for general equilibrium adjustments uh, of migration and trade and innovation. Um, and uh, finally, this very nice recent um, work um, uh, drawing on the uh, sort of recent, sort of some of the recent innovations that account for uh, dynamic capital decisions as well as um, forward looking worker decisions, finding that anticipation effects really sort of amplify. Uh, uh, climate induced mobility um, and accounting for this. In fact, in the aggregate across the US, for reasons I'm happy to discuss with you uh, afterwards, um, the aggregate impacts are not really huge, but we see this very stark distributional impact. Uh, so let me stop there. Um, and I uh, really look forward to uh, discussing these themes in more detail in the policy session. I'm going to get as close to 2.20 as I can be so that we can have 10 minutes for the questions. Wonderful. So I'm going to talk about government policy in particular, and I'm going to focus first on domestic policy and then move from there to international policy. For domestic policy, there are some fundamental questions that arise once we take seriously that, as Claire hinted at and, and discussed, adaptation over the long run is a fundamentally dynamic process. Dynamics matter here. Once we take that seriously, these following questions arise. Do we adapt by migrating away from risky flood prone areas or do we try to adapt by staying in place? Is our horizon the immediate short run, short run here being if we're talking about sea level rise, for example, 30 to 50 years, long run being 200, 300, even 400 years. And then lastly, how do we think about public and private responses and how do we think about the interplay so as I hinted at, I'm going to use sea level rise as a bit of a case study to think about this issue in the domestic context, uh, partially because I've worked in this area. And from this uh, 19, sorry, uh, 2019 IPCC report, we see that in terms of mean kind of estimates, we're looking at maybe half a meter of sea level rise by 2100. That will be incredibly consequential for the more than 1 billion people living in low elevation coastal zones today. But as we think about the, especially the engineering science-based social cost of carbon kind of estimates that come from some sub-module that thinks about sea level rise, when we interrogate that sea level rise specific module, we tend to see that those damage estimates are often relatively small. Whether it be because there is a somewhat optimistic view of one's ability or our ability as a nation, as a world, to adapt in place by building seawalls, or if there is maybe an optimistic view of the ability of entire cities to simply move in. And connecting back to the, dyna to the dynamics here, uh, this is important because there is this fundamental trade off that's at play between the short and the long run. When we build the seawall, the protection is not permanent. First off, because we need to maintain the seawall. But even if we didn't, the sea level rise will continue to, to take hold. And so protection is something that needs to happen again and again over time, especially over the three, 400 year horizon. And so by building a seawall today, there's the short run protection, but there's a long run cost as the coastal population continues to grow. As the population at this sitting in this risky location is bigger and continues to get bigger. And as that city gets bigger, it becomes even more difficult in the future to move the city in. And that yeah. is the migration costs. So I think about this specifically in the context of Jakarta. In a recent paper where I'm really focused on the interplay between private efforts to adapt and public efforts to adapt. Do developers move inland or do they stay at the coast because the government is building but that same interplay shows up if we think about the interplay between what a local mayor will want to do, stay in Jakarta, because they're the mayor of Jakarta and not in land town, relative to what the national government wants them to do, or what a current government does, not accounting for the fact that continuing to build at the coast 
raises costs that a future government will need to do. And so in this paper, I'm interested in the moral hazard that arises from those uninternalized costs where the agent engages in risky activity at the coast. The principle is time inconsistent. Because of politics, the <laughs> principle cannot resist bailing them out. And in so doing, given that distortion, pays to defend the coast. And so there's nothing stopping people from continuing to build at the coast. And here, importantly, what's getting crowded out is inland migration, inland adaptation that is relatively cheap compared to that. Here you end up with coastal locking at high social costs. From there, I can show you this picture to think about the distributional effects as well. This is Waladuna Mosque, a, a mosque that was originally in a sort of poor area of town. Sea level rise happened. A uh, seawall was actually built, but you can see here the government decided what to protect and what not to protect. They built a seawall on the inside of this mosque that sat in a poor slum, in so doing allowed the mosque to be returned to nature, returned to the ocean. So the distributional effects are important here domestically, but will also be a fundamental challenge when I think about international policy. And there the global externalities will be incredibly important. And so moving to that international policy and kind of returning to some of the themes that Claire and Namrata brought up, you can think, for example, about migration and trade as mechanisms that will facilitate our ability to adapt to climate shocks to come. But what I want to point out is that both of them face frictions. And they're going to face frictions because each of these channels is fundamentally global in nature. There are global externalities involved here, but countries are optimizing domestically as they set these policies. As Claire hinted at, climate migration is going to be incredibly important. We need more research here. At LSE in particular, there's a lot of great research happening on climate adaptation and climate migration right now. What I want to point out here is that migration policy reinforces borders, and it's something that governments decide on. This 2018 World Bank report highlights that as a lower bound, 143 million people will be internally displaced over the next two and a half decades. And that's internal domestic displacement. But there's something fundamental here, which is that domestic migration fundamentally cannot avoid country-level aggregate risk. Bangladesh is a country that's already very densely populated. That land at the coast is land that is needed. There's a limited ability to simply move inland, perhaps. And so really international migration, that's the key channel through which migration can allow and facilitate adaptation. But of course, that international migration faces very fundamental political difficulties that refugee crises for non-climate reasons have already shown us. So that's migration. Migration is an important channel for adaptation in the future, but faces political friction. Trade policy I talked about just a, a couple of hours ago. This, this trade policy is another thing that can kind of create a barrier to this kind of adaptation. The typical view is that trade is going to allow, as I, as a domestic country, get hit with a domestic production shock because my climate has changed or my weather has become more extreme. I need more food because I don't produce it now. Trade is going to be my way out. I can import from other countries. After that domestic production shock, trade is going to help, but it's going to help consumers. It's not going to help your domestic producers. Your domestic producers want the price to go up as the supply goes down so that they don't lose quite so much money. So there's a fundamental within country distributional effect happening here. And then in this paper with Jacob and Kartik, I'm interested in what that means for trade policy set endogenously that reflects domestic concerns, where governments may respond to shocks, taking into account these very distributional effects, and in some cases will put in protection because they have a specific distributional preference. By putting in protection, they reduce trade and they're reducing their way out in a national sense to adapt to the climate. So trade policy is an important dimension, uh, an avenue for climate adaptation, <laughs> but it too will face important pressure. And so to return back to this important theme of distributional effects, both within a country and across countries, let me close on climate finance, with which Namrata 
brought up just at the very beginning. This fundamental question of who will pay for losses and damages. And here there's not actually so much interesting economics in the sense that it's not really a sort of an uninternalized externality bit, externality bit. At this point, what is needed for equity reasons is a transfer from wealthy countries to less wealthy countries. In, in some sense, the questions here are more moral, ethical, philosophical than economic. But that's where we are. Okay, we have promises by wealthy nations at COP15 in Copenhagen in 2009. This stated goal of $100 billion per year in pledges by 2020. It is now 2023. We do not have the $100 billion, which maybe is not even enough to begin with. We have 80 that's been pledged at face value. That 80 includes loans. It is not only loans. And this is important because these losses and damages are no longer hypothetical. They are happening now. These equity concerns are already fighting. And so, of course, this is therefore a very active area of discussion and policy debate. Scotland uh, stepped up with a somewhat symbolic but important pledge uh, in Glasgow. And at COP27, there was the formal establishment of a loss and damage fund. There are climate adaptation projects being funded by the World Bank and the IMF. Uh, but I will leave you with that. These important distributional effects that we need to take seriously. We now have time for questions from the audience. I think it can probably make some regular. It will become very unruly. It's not in my thoughts. Maybe you can play with it. Yeah. Ariana, I'm enjoying your time. We're having the QA with the academics, but given that we are shuffling things, why don't you come? Say just what so we don't have to redo the sharp thing. So we just want to shop. Thank you. The logistic in one go because this is <laughs> having the room. Um, so, what's going to happen now? Yeah. 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 Now that we have microphone, uh, we're going to do a QA with uh, the academic presenters. Well, first, let me thank them for some fantastic presentations despite loud phones. Confusing briefs. <laughs> Somebody was told they had 20 minutes to tell me as well. <laughs> and uh, the confusion, but all went there, all were there as well. And he ends with questions from the audience. And then I will introduce uh, the three policymakers who kindly joined us today. And uh, they will talk a bit and then we'll have a general discussion. So I'm sure you remember all of that. Let's start with part one, which is questions from the audience. So I actually really like that it ended with your presentation, Alan, because I have a question and I'm really happy that we did it on adaptation. Given the fact that a lot of the global north has to do more equitable distribution and there's a push towards greater funding for climate change adaptation, I'd be curious to hear from all three of you, given that you're in this space, how much of the push from these donors has framed the question of education and how much of, is that part of the conversation versus the push towards adaptation? Um, as I hinted that, I think some of this transfer that needs to happen is going to, be, that's a sort of moral ethical obligation. But then as we kind of dig down, as you have in your question, uh, adaptation, at least, you know, and I don't interface with policymakers every single day, whereas the policymakers over here do. But my sense is that what is on the agenda is often on the adaptation side, because that is, as we are confronted with the reality today, what can we do? And here, what I want to highlight in terms of the 
ability for academics to contribute is let me note that the, the majority the majority of climate damages will be borne by cities in developing countries. And yet there is very little research on climate adaptation in cities in developing countries. My Jakarta paper attempts to kind of add to the efforts to do more work there. But I think in general that not only within the climate adaptation space can we do more, but in uh, lower income countries and cities in lower income countries, I think that's really an important place. For me. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure, as Alan said, I think the policymaker is probably a better place to, to opine on this, certainly, than I am. But I, I think there is a set of really interesting questions about how can we as researchers contribute to this very, very important debate. Um, I think there's a, some of the, particularly the references in Amrata's presentation around sort of the, the interesting political economy questions that we've only started to scratch the surface on in some of the recent literature on this topic, and what more can we sort of learn from this intersection of political economy and, and uh, climate adaptation and indeed mitigation, uh, these, these very nice examples. And there are others that one sort of sees popping up in the literature of potential complementarities between mitigation and adaptation. Perhaps it's optimistic to think that's gonna get us much of the way on, the, on that debate. But uh, I think I'd, and I'd, I'd love to hear from the, the policymakers and, and, and also those in the audience about what you think researchers can contribute to this debate. I think as Alan says, the huge, huge, share of this of course is, is political and, and a sort of ethical debate here uh, but I think that the economics literature on this set of topics is starting to work on themes that are at least adjacent to those questions and if we can move those more into the sort of central set of questions that's something that's very valuable to think about. So I think like third vote for hearing more from from <laughs> but I think what it seems to me at this stage is that the contours of the precise nature of these transfers is still being decided and it brings up ethical questions. I think it also brings up welfare questions such as like the map that I showed you clearly shows, for instance, that India has these large damages. However, small island nations may well like a large proportion of land might cease to exist. And so the transfers then become really quite complex. Um, in addition to the, the political economy concerns. I think some things that we didn't talk about here, but uh, should have a lot more work on it, is uh, helping developing countries who are also large emitters with mitigation. And I think in the policy space, there is now a pretty clear message that it is going to require resources that are distinct from adaptation um, financing. And so, and the contours of that as well are pretty amorphous at this uh, stage. So I think there's this natural desire to just tie it to mitigation and then make that. But I think when you look at where the welfare implications are, like small island nations are a very tiny portion of emissions, those questions start to become quite, so it's very complicated. And uh, I think is the uh, word of the day for me, but to Claire's point, I'd love to hear more about how we can contribute. Part of this is contributing to damages of welfare return to the policy, but I'm sure there's lots more. That's a share. I think I have the right to change the rules when <laughs> the expression grants it. And as there is a lot of demand for a more integrated um, discussion, I will now introduce our three policymakers, well, representative policymakers. Uh, no, I'll stop there. Um, because I think it, this division is kind of artificial. I think it's, it pays off to have a, com a common discussion here. And then we, we keep with the questions. And then I say, you do some concluding remarks at the very end. Is this new set of rules not for you? Excellent. So we have, starting from, it would be helpful to know left and right. So starting from this side, close to Adam. <laughs> Rohini Kamal, who is an assistant professor at Brack University at the Institute of Governance and Development. Um, Chipo, no, Stephanie Brockroff, who's a global lead for program design and impact of Brack International, and Chipo Malnata, who's a policy advisor to the president in Zambia. So if you want to come in to this question, please do. So um, the link, so the difference between adaptation and mitigation from a development, multilateral development financing uh, and financing uh, angle about 
twice as much amount is going into mitigation than adaptation. But also, when we're thinking about the time horizon, at what at what point does adaptation not work anymore? So, in which case, and that that separation is not it's not a separation anymore. Mitigation is adaptation, then, because at some point you cannot adapt anymore. We think. Um, on the second, I think on equity, what I would say is that often we, I don't think there was a very interesting debate on who should pay for it. Maybe countries uh, that have been historical emitters and have gained from the emissions should pay. But I think what we fail to answer is what are the mechanisms through which this should happen? And also developing countries who are, uh, who are, who are vulnerable, it's not a monolith. Within the developing countries, there are a lot of difference between who's getting the money and how the money gets distributed and so on. So unless we look at the mechanisms through which this is happening, and it's just who is paying and who's not paying, which is sort of uh, a, a, a static vision rather than looking at the mechanisms as more dynamic. So you're not just, okay, this happened, so this person um, suffered, let me just give that one-off transfer versus if you're starting looking at the mechanisms, it's harder work, but it's also ensuring that those inequalities and process processes don't keep playing out. Maybe you can also contribute and maybe just give a few numbers for context to think about. So between now and 2030, Africa is expected to contribute about 2.8 trillion dollars um, based on their commitments to the Paris Agreement. And currently, um, is about wealthier nations are giving about they're supposed to give the hundred billion that we heard, but the current number is about sixteen point seven billion. So we already have a huge disparity there. Now by twenty thirty, it is projected that Africa will need to at least spend three hundred billion dollars on adaptation. So financing is like the issue here, and I thought I would just give those numbers for context and for us to keep in mind. You may also wish to note that only 21% of the current 16.7 billion actually goes to Africa as a, as a continent, and yet we are the most impacted, and we are also expected to be the ones to solve it. So I just wanted to share that. And maybe for me to just say like the final word, and full disclosure, I'm not a climate change expert. I, I work on social protection, um, the work we do is with governments, supporting governments um, in social protection and poverty programming. And uh, what I what I find is like that everything that we've said is undoubtedly true, right? And for me, the main concern of how do we get more funding to the ground, right? How do we get funding to the communities that are affected now? Because all of this research, all of this modeling, all of this debate is obviously necessary. We need to think about the long horizon. But climate change is here already, right? And communities are affected now. And I think often these debate, poverty research, social protection, climate change, they happen almost in silos, right? And I'm interested in how can we connect them so that we can make the case that actually social protection and poverty programming is a way of climate adaptation, right? And I think that is something to focus a little bit more energy on, um, you know, and uh, not get sidetracked by all the other big issues like just transition, all of these other things that we're grappling with, and making the case sort of for real on the ground programming, um, whilst we figure out some of the other bigger issues that we also need to around equity and who pays for it and all of these other things. It's so easy to go into a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tempted to jump in. But yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for the talk. It was really great to see all the three papers. Um, my question was around law, uh, jobs and livelihoods. So, of course, when we're talking about climate adaptation in, a, in developing countries, which itself is so tough to like club into one. Um, but of course, you have things like caste, gender, class, race, all of these things affecting um, jobs or livelihoods. And with something like migration, or you spoke about like firms relocating as an adaptive measure, um, or technology and agriculture. Uh, I think my question is, has there been any conversation around ensuring dignity of livelihoods and jobs during this transition? Because some of these adaptive measures obviously mean that people move from livelihoods to jobs. 
And on the other hand, you see a huge push from communities and people working on ground to move jobs to livelihoods. Um, so how do those interact? And um, has there been any conversation, especially from the economic side? That would be great. Thank you. So I think, so I work with policymakers and a lot of policymakers, and these are issues that are already very, very visible in terms of the market. You mentioned that we are already facing impacts of climate change, one. The second, because of our baseline historical situation with flooding, the hot humid country, we actually know we already have very long experience of some of these impacts. Um, and what we see is exactly what you said, that depending on the context, sometimes some of these adaptive responses impact different groups of people differently. So for very vulnerable people, maybe uh, it's not very possible, lower income groups, it's not possible to migrate. Who's migrating? It's not the same people who are migrating. Who can access uh, the more formal sectors? Not everyone can access the more formal sectors. Sometimes uh, wage work is actually less uh, beneficial than <clears throat> informal livelihood kind of job opportunities. So these are questions that are that have that have already arisen, I think, in impacted communities, but there's definitely more research needed to see specifically what you said, because it's complex, pretending that it's uh, the same impacts on everyone or maybe the same solution is uh, not forward. From the policymakers, I think what you're saying is let's give more range of options and see how four, five, six things interact and work for different groups of people. And by generating more evidence on that would be very helpful to understand what uh, mechanism works for me. Yeah, I mean, maybe just to, to add to that, I mean, in, in quite a few countries where we work at the moment, we're seeing that the, that livelihood, you know, or that job doesn't seem to exist in the same way it used to exist, right? So, you know, people have traditionally say being rearing chicken and now in India, it's so hot, the chickens die. So what is the livelihood, you know, or in Northern Kenya, you know, okay, you could sort about just get by. And if you like to research now, what do people do? But they're investing in a, in a range of livelihood activities, right? Peaceful work, everything around the clock, linked to the cycle of the seasons and so on, just to get by. So I think there's this issue about does a firm relocate and then can you relocate with it? What, a, what is the impact if you go from a livelihood to a job? And, you know, we could almost do things there. We can put policies in place that uh, protect people and so on. But I, for me, the bigger issue that we are seeing is actually that what is that job and that livelihood in a more fragile and vulnerable world? Right? Yeah? And like, like Rohini was saying just now, is it actually the reality that households start to have to do a range of diverse diversified activities at the same time and how can we support that right is there the silver bullet that we can regulate for that we can find that we can support or or is it actually that you know life has become too fragile and that's where a lot of the the thinking the experimentation that we're working on i'm sure also in zambia is actually sort of going right um and when you then think about the impacts on the economy i can't remember who said this um but that the the entire economy changes and all of this right it becomes even more and the even bigger question of what is the structure of our economy going to be like anyways right so i think if i can just pick up on that there's lots of really great work that shows that the responses to these shocks um, are worse for certain groups. So for instance, uh, in India, women rarely move for work. They mostly move for, for to get married. That's what the census will tell us. Um, and there's work that shows that essentially uh, sectors that are maybe disproportionately, where certain groups are disproportionately represented uh, do worse with weather shocks. So it affects like economic outcomes, it affects marriage markets, it affects um, human capital accumulation by gender as well. Um, I think there's maybe a little bit less work that is telling us about interventions that can increase adaptation for certain groups. So the DAR et al. paper, you know, it talks about the equity implications of this flood resistant price. And so in development, as I said, we know that often, at least in a place like India, information about technologies might flow via cast networks. 
So if information now happens to be an adaptation technology, we have to take that into account. And I think for like my two cents on this is that the best version of this work is going to bring in people who not necessarily work on climate, but have worked on gender and can tell us about like reaching women in times of crisis um, and leverage like expertise for people who work on, on climate. So I think definitely lots of work on the impacts, perhaps a little bit less work on interventions, uh, but certainly rich ground for, for impactful work. I, I mean, I'd second that with a, a very sort of complimentary thoughts, really. But I think from the perspective of kind of empirical, I think probably it's, it's you know, uh, uh, many of the papers in the Miranda cited in particular, beginning to look at individual decision making, firm decision making around the sets of uh, behaviors that are related to, uh, to climate adaptation, but, but really thinking about the set of normative questions and policy interventions and so on, as I tried to outline, there are some of the tools there at the point at which we understand what's driving decision making, but that's really where the evidence is evolving pretty fast and the types of predictions we'd make would be very different. And, you know, uh, Garrett and Robin have some work looking at you know, uh, people's perceptions of climate risk, their uh, propensity to migrate under different circumstances. It's quite, as some of the papers I cited show, even knowing that firms are responding in certain ways by relocating, by changing their supply decisions uh, and so on, it, it, sort of understanding that these are the margins we'd even want to incorporate in our models is something that's sort of new and, and evolving quite fast. I, I'm somewhat hopeful about once we start to make progress on empirical estimates of these types of margins that we have some of the tools to then say interesting things about policy. Uh, but identifying the margins and in particular these type, the sort of heterogeneity across different groups uh, is something where we're still, our understanding is changing pretty fast. And the intersectionality. Sorry. There's one super brief thought here, which is for this question in particular, I think there is a fundamental data collection challenge that I think as development economists, we in particular have the advantage to address that challenge. Well, thanks so much. I have an observation and also a question. The observation goes back to your observation. <laughs> which is very limited finance, very limited external finance. I think if you look back in the last, I would say, 80 years, um, massive transfer of resources have occurred during wars and post-wars. Marshall Plan, post-war, and then during wars. This was initially during cataclysmatic events and mobilized for political opinion. Uh, I'm extremely skeptical, and I think I'm not the only one, lots of policymakers mm -hmm. which we interact with, both in the country uh, program which I direct in the UNDC, which is Mozambique, in my own country, Brazil, we're very skeptical about the possibility of massive transfer of resources related to climate change. The corollary, massive external <coughs> transfer. The corollary of this is that a lot of the resources have to be mobilized domestically, <laughs> even for our food projects. So um, the question I have, in fact, is that A, do you concur or do you disagree with the statement? And you say, no, no, that's not the case, Corbin You know, this is such a high, you know, high impact, not event, but phenomenon. And we certainly are not on the right track. We're not in 1.5 degree track. We're much closer to the two degree track at this point. Um, uh, or trajectory is that this is not going to be the case anymore. But so far, and I concur with you, we're not seeing this. We're not really seeing this kind of effort that's going to take, particularly for our countries, the poorer countries, which are in the are in the receiving end, and therefore adaptation finance is absolutely critical. And Optimizing adaptation finance, it, that's the very end of, uh, of your talk, is, is even more critical sense. So I'd like maybe to say, concur or not, that's not the case. We actually see potentially massive transfer of resources. It's just a question of time. And then if that's not the case, you know, how are we going to mobilize resources in countries? We're discussing earlier on issues of property tax. You know, but, but at the end of the day, we have to think of mobilize, I think, to mobilize our domestic resources despite all the difficulties. Thank you. And, and thank you for your 
question. I actually sat there, especially during um, Alan's presentation, very, feeling very overwhelmed because everything that you were describing, you were actually experiencing as a, as a government. It's like a catch-22. So we might even be able, as countries in the global south or countries in Africa, we might even be able to mobilize that funding if we were actually allowed to rip the ground open. But you want to industrialize, you want to open up the, the, um, the forests into agriculture, uh, large-scale farms, but being told, oh no, you have to contribute to the climate uh, conversation. So it's a cash uh, 22. So where, the, where is this money going to come from? You know, at the same time, we are also expected to, re to solve uh, this issue. So I am also skeptical. In fact, with all due respect to people who trade in Bitcoin, in Zambia, we actually say, oh, this climate conversation and financing is like Bitcoin. <laughs> we can't see, we just hear about it. And we... <laughs> so we actually never see it. Oh, it's coming, but it's so minuscule that even when it comes, the impact is so, so little. So we have a very beautiful situation here. And I think for researchers, um, it would be good for us to do a bit of work and get some data and evidence going of what is a sweet spot? You know, how much can um, countries in the global south actually be, um, I don't like this word allowed, but you know, should be let to actually industrialize and make sure they have food security before you say, no, you can't do that. You know, it's very difficult. Um, let me just give you an, a, a scenario. So you have um, a villager or someone from a, low economic high density area who is struggling to make a living in a debt ridden country that's trying to restructure its its debt and you're telling them oh you you can't um, you have to keep the coal the oil and the gas in the in the ground and yet it's the same oil and gas you know that is actually needed uh, also to improve uh, to to develop a country and provide for economic transformation you know, you can't cut down the trees to be able to, you know, be food secure and grow your own food. But it's the same food security issue we are grappling with from a climate perspective. And also we're impacted by the war in Russia, Ukraine. So back to the question you raised, Alan, you know, do we adapt by staying in or do we go out? Where are we going to go? <laughs> <laughs> we, I actually am a proponent of we actually have to adapt where we are in station. So if I had to speak, I'll speak more of that. So we are in a catch-22, and I think people working in this space would do well to find us that sweet um, spot, because right now it's very skewed that we can't rip the grounds uh, open, um, at the same time uh, protect uh, the biodiversity and, and other components that basically keep um, the climate uh, balance. I had two thoughts, one, one prompted by the question and one prompted by the response. I'll start with the response. Indeed, there's this stark trade-off between immediate economic growth in certain countries in particular, and uh, now outside voices are telling them not to cut down the trees. I think it's important to recognize that. I think it's important to quantify the foregone economic growth that is needed to not cut down the trees and to recognize that in a sense these countries are providing ecosystem services and therefore have grounds to demand payments for ecosystem services uh, so that those asking them not to cut down the trees can compensate them for the benefits that they bring to the U.S. A thought prompted by the question. This is a little bit, I'm also relatively skeptical about these transfers happening, and this is kind of what I meant when I said that the issue here is not so much an economic one as an ethical, moral, philosophical one. In terms of the economics, it's just a transfer. The person paying doesn't want to pay. The person being paid wants to be paid. It's kind of as simple as that, and in the simple model that I've just laid out, the transfer is not going to happen. The reason why we're talking about the transfers is because there is a clear moral, moral, moral ethical obligation. But, but then that's maybe not so optimistic for the national equilibrium. 
One more word to the list you gave there, which is political, which is this is not my area of research, but this came up in the discussion on evolution last night. It hasn't come up too much in the debate yet, but it's the, the role of public perceptions and uh, the sort of um, discussion around the political drivers of this. We had, uh, in fact, um, before the, the panel, but didn't get time to get to too much of it during the discussion on evolution yesterday, uh, how much can we sort of think about the, the differences or, or lessons from the, some of the challenges with public perceptions and thinking about air pollution and, and thinking about climate damages and to your, your comparison with the response to wars and sort of other uh, big shocks and challenges is I think a very interesting one in thinking about the role right of course this this comes down to a, a, a question of, of, of ethics but the political drivers of that and the interaction with public perceptions public demand is I think not well understood um and, and surely plays an important role and if I can just say um, so you mentioned war and post-war um, transfers that have been run in the institution. And that's very interesting because from a literature perspective, there was a whole conversation about seven, eight years ago that the amount of financing for uh, with the Brett, especially in infrastructure uh, with the Bretton Woods institutions, was more than matched by, by the amount of financing coming from Chinese, uh, from China on infrastructure investments globally. And often, I think developing countries are uh, inside closed doors just think that West is no longer where we look for financing, rather looking to China, uh, for Bangladesh, we look to China, to India, for Russia to leverage those. And that's where we're realistically, uh, that kind of mechanisms are being put in place. Uh, but again, unless I think there is a risk that that financing stream is also might be well, not welfare enhancing for the poorest people, unless there are certain checks and balances in place. But yes, the feeling is very much that from the West, that's no longer where the financing, even if it's from, it, it might come, might not come. But now we're looking more at, at southern countries. I think if I can just pick up on the very last part of it, I think it's my sort of happy role to inject a little bit of hope, maybe, which is for once, uh, not usually my role. But um, I think there's already research, and I think future research should think about how you best allocate a dollar towards adaptation. And that can be domestic resources and how you mobilize that with taxes, et cetera, or that can be international resources. But there is already work. There needs to be more work. And I think regardless of the pot of money, we need to think about that. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that it's not really a matter of asking that. Yeah. Like a lot of these discourses, <laughs> uh, we have to give the transfers to make justice. But here it's a matter of all of us. We're all in the same boat. Mm -hmm. So, and it seems to me that the international organizations are not looking for that. It's a matter, and you know, economic, economics can only give you so far when externalities are so big, you know, the market doesn't work. So, we do need to set in place the organizations that favor the coordination. And the idea of like paying for the services, if you want places to remain unchanged, you have to pay for them. Is absolutely right. So I think yes. Um, so I wanted to actually pick up on on our last point. Um, so as we've always said, I mean, all very interesting. Uh, climate change adaptation very costly, and it has general like ramifications for all sorts of linkages across firms, industry, space. Um, so as we're thinking about policy led climate change adaptation, my question is. Whose government institutions should climate change and education be at the core? Is this uh, something that the central banks should have as a core mission? Is, is the Ministry of Labor? Uh, should the Ministry of Labor have climate change adaptation? So it's kind of this idea that if we have a certain pot of money that are dedicated towards climate change adaptation, how are we going to put our money where? So there are all these different ways in which we could do it. Um, there could be all sorts of redundancies if everyone can this is their core mission. So I'm just curious uh, what your hands are. Yeah, I can. Is that, and you might need some alternative thoughts, but coming from government. Um, when, so our approach usually in, in Zambia, when you have an issue like that, and it's a big problem. I think the best approach would be to have an inter-institutional or inter-ministerial approach. So you basically take 
call the government agencies or departments and say, how are you going to contribute to resolving this problem? And you basically budget in your financing to say, how much are you allocating um, to solve this problem? And what impact do you envisage to come um, from the money that is being allocated? Because it's not, all, it's not you know, one country or one person's problem, and neither is it the central bank's problem. So it's interministerial, interinstitutional. So I would say we would have to have a much better approach to it. Just agree with the general manager. Well, then we're looking at what is kind of the policy? In your presentation, when you're looking at the impact, it's on health, it's on mortality, it's on trade. So what is climate policy if each of those go into it? So I think for most developing countries, when uh, they have uh, interagency, so all the theoretically, practically the, the work for how it's implemented is maybe not as great, but at least the way we're setting up is that the financial, um, the finance ministry, the trade, the trade policies, uh, the health policies, all of that, the environmental ministry, all of all of them are um, working towards looking at the issue, and I think that's the only way to go about it because. You know, health. And of course, strengthening health and access to health, that is the best way. We're looking at livelihoods, uh, markets, uh, looking at seeds, what kind of varieties of different seeds, what allows farmers to take the risks of that, adopting new seeds, all of that, that yes. then uh, go into climate policy. But do you reference also the Ministry of Labour? And I, I think right. I would also yes. have this noted to myself to mention that slide of Namrat is that list every time a version of this comes out, it's got another sector. There's new evidence on the set of I think that I, I struggle to think of a ministry that would not have an interest in this. And I think it, it, this has to be the question, uh, which is that this is not a kind of siloed income stream where we think this should go to the Ministry of Health, this should go to the Ministry of Labour, but that list will continue to expand as we have more and more evidence on the range of sectors affected by this, but it's already essentially across all ministries more continual. Okay. Yeah, no. I was I was gonna say like the forgetting politics and ideology, right? Um, in all of all of our responses here, right? Because whichever part of government you put in charge will focus on something specific, right? Just because of their mandate and who works there, and whether they're economists or social workers or something, right? And I think, like Chipo was saying, as a result, you you need to sort of try to mainstream it, but at the same time, and that goes to what we were debating beforehand every government that comes into power is by definition going to focus on something else because of where they come from, right? Because there's not going to be enough money. So you either will focus on trying to future-proof, uh, say, your labor market or maybe your agricultural policy or your industrial policy, because that's where the government focuses, or on helping households adapt and helping them um, deal with the current impact, right? And I think we need to, all of these are sort of, valid responses, right? And in an ideal world, governments would have enough money to go to your point to do it all. But like you, I agree, I, I doubt it will ever be the case, right? So mm -hmm. the reality is that the policy makers we work with always have to prioritize certain things over other things, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's really understanding that political process and that it's it's not just about evidence and what is right and what makes sense, but there's the, the actual politics in, in these decisions that influence what gets done. and trying to, in that political process, make the case for some of the things for which we're generating evidence that, mm -hmm. that needs to happen regardless and trying to build a consensus around a certain set of policies that for, <laughs> for which we need to do some work, what they might be, that sort of become consensus and are not driven by the sort of the different things. Mm -hmm. uh, I, we recently at the Central Bank of Malaysia and I posed them this more or less the same question. And I found it really interesting how they thought about it. They said that on the one hand, the central bank is limited in the sense that the central bank's key mandate is inflation and employment. They try to, you know, climate impacts the two indirectly, so they try to minimize. On the other hand, the issue practically that they face is that the top brightest minds in the country, the top human capital, the analytical data analysis kind of firepower is at the central bank. It's not at the Ministry of Labor. It's not at the Ministry of Health. So they have to, on the ground in practice, navigate this kind of 
Yeah, I'm just going to add to what was being said about the politics and ideology. And I think this should be something that as researchers and analytics people, data people, keep bear in mind that we don't really have uh, the luxury of, of time, generally as a global community, but more so from a political perspective. You know, there's no time for pre visibility, then visibility, then another report. So if you can just condense, you know, the time frame to produce this this work, it would really be helpful. So we need data, we need speed, and we need scale really, really fast. Can we make it short? Oh, can I just a point from you? When we talk about something delivering something or uh we always forget like Professional aspects or the politics of the government isn't necessarily a benefit of the constitution, neither is an institution like right. There are mechanisms and checks and balances in the participation of communities that ensure that those um, transfers aren't indeed going there or they are being able to access um, whatever the innovation, innovative solution is. So, the part of the policy is also has to go into how to increase that. Um, access and strengthening communities to be able to access and hold various parties accountable mm -hmm. well, you know, I'm sorry, but imagine this were a site mm -hmm. and there were aliens who look in the earth mm -hmm. and we all get together. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. But the aliens is basically out in the past. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just had one good question. Uh, Mainly for the policy makers, which is if you're that I was recently in Bangladesh, you know, in the World Bank, everybody said climate change is the most important thing. Every bit of government, said, you know, whatever ministry you're in, there's some climate change thing going. Same in the World Bank, different bits. But the truth is that not a lot's happening. Um, so there are also a lot of goals and no. Achievement of those goals. Yeah. I guess the question for you is do you need to kind of rethink the, the architecture of government so that you have one body? Like, I guess it could be a climate change commission, it could be something like that, but across government departments, and it's hard to be very kind of people that Sharon uh, pointed to that then says, okay, this is the plan to confront climate change, whether it's adaptation, mitigation, whatever. Because what was coming out a lot from the academic presentation, these things unfold over a very long period of decarbonized cement, you have to decarbonize aviation, shipping, and so on. But the adaptation stuff is right here and right now. And so you need to get something that will channel money into the most effective uses that it comes. And what I hear is an awful lot of my green plan and sustainability, it's all going to happen. And nothing is happening. I mean, for some first approximation. So does, do we need to think more carefully about the architecture of government? So if it's sort of like a war on this thing, you have to, you know, countries at war, they bring together different people from different government departments and sort of war and push, you know, how we're going to defeat Germany or that. It feels a little bit like you need that level of attention as opposed to this very diffuse, well-meaning, left-wing talk, which is not actually getting us anywhere. So I don't know if you have any views of whether such an institution, whether maybe some countries there are, there's certainly a climate change institution in this country, but is this happening? Are people thinking about this? I think that's a really good question, and I'll throw it back to the academics to look into. But I'll, <laughs> I'll share some thoughts and experiences from Zambia. So uh, well, in my, I've been in my role for two years with a new president, so a new administration, never been in office before. And one of the things that the new president introduced in Zambia is actually a ministry of green economy and environment, which never existed before. Now, if you ask me whether that's functioning uh, effectively and whether we've seen some dramatic transformationary change, you know, that you would get from a commission. I'm not sure, but that was actually the the intention. Maybe it's too early to say, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure it's working quite well. And I think maybe to provide some thoughts on anyone who would be looking into this, I think it's important to simplify yeah. what a vehicle like that would actually, you know, need to do to be able to uh, have, um, to see impact 
the other thing that I would look into is that this discussion we're having seems so innocent and you know like mm -hmm. it's easy, but actually it's a very lucrative uh, mm -hmm. area. You know mm -hmm. the climate conversation, and there's a lot of corruption um, there. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of uh, illegal trade of of logs. You know rosewood. We are one of the producers, and that you would be surprised the cartels involved in just moving illegal uh, trees, but they're the same people who also have the mandate to protect um, these areas. So I think that's a question also to look into if you set up such a vehicle, to what extent does it work and how is it actually supposed to work? But most importantly, I think um, the first point from a policy perspective is to have political will to actually get it done. Yeah. So I think Xavier has shown this political will by setting up the, the vehicle, but we'll probably need to make that a bit more effective. Um, and so I was invited. Um, I think uh, that does sound very tempting, Robert. I guess my concern, having seen at least the conversation about something like red and red plus and now red with three deals and multiple <laughs> plus at the end of it, is that, during war, it's that we need to do this tomorrow, and therefore the people in that room have more power than usual. And I think I, one kind of concern I have about like a climate change commission is if that's the structure that's great, but if you're putting all the well-meaning sort of left-leaning people in one room and then no one else will talk to them in the Ministry of Labor and the etc., I think that that could backfire. So I think that, that urgency and political will has to be. I have something scratched because now from the audience they want to contribute specifically on this point. <laughs> Go, but if we can just connect our discussion with last night's discussion, as you did, Claire, mm -hmm. is surely a crucial element here is building popular demand for action mm -hmm. because politicians want to get reelected. Mm -hmm. right? And so, so in order to really secure strong political leadership, I think you have to have popular demand. And so then I think we should be asking ourselves the question how do we simulate that, mm -hmm. right? more information is clearly needed, more analysis, more understanding are all clearly needed, and then we have to think about how we feed that into the public debate as well. Yeah, I just wanted to say, in addition to this demand, right, and and to get back to your question, I think in the ideal world, yes, we would want to have the super ministry that mainstreams across all policy and every country has this great holistic approach, but I think in reality, in a lot of countries where we work, state capacity is very weak, right? And this, I'm very skeptical of these super ministries uh, that uh, manage to transform everything, right? And you see it as has been tried for poverty reduction and, you know, like in let's stick with, uh, Indonesia, you know, where you have like a, a, a new think tank uh, is developed to unlock the sort of the problems of the different ministries and so on. So it's been tried or planning ministries under the president of finance. So it always comes from the same idea that if you could just get rid of your old structure, you make something new, it coordinates the possible solve it. And it, it does, right? But- um, I feel like that's a direction to me. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, we need to keep trying, right? But I think we need, to, <laughs> we need to be realistic of whether it can work, right? And maybe it will work sometimes. But I think I think the truth is the help, it works in exceptional circumstances and for short term, right? So for the COVID pandemic was another one where everyone got together and a lot of stuff that used to not work was possible all of a sudden for a short period of time, war, et cetera. But I think what we do need to push policymakers for in countries, and that would be more my challenge to what you're saying, is to have a holistic <laughs> strategy for a country, right? That includes prioritizing across the different aspects of policy, uh, legislation, uh, mitigating the impact on the ground, adaptation, international engagement. And I think that is still missing in a lot of cases. And that is something more realistic to expect, right? Because it actually means that you, you lift that up a level and say, okay, what is the plan here really? And then everyone sort of, you can, uh, you can delegate down the delivery mechanism to the existing structures. But yeah. Can I quickly respond? So we, so we now have a research hub at our university in Bangladesh called Feasible Transition. And it's literally talking about who gets um, feasible. So what is feasible within a political economy? We don't need transfer, you know, 
doesn't we don't need transparency. We don't we don't need some of the bigger words. But what is feasible given the political economy within the reality? Because we're not going to transform magically. Like whatever is happening happens within the existing structures. So so working around that, have the better you know goals. Of course, work towards that in parallel to actually doing things that maybe taking it piecemeal. Like piece, you know, exactly. <laughs> They should call it that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so many questions. How do I choose? You already asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> so no repeat. Uh, okay. You go. You go first. Yeah. Thank you very much. So um, you talk about sweet spots earlier, and Alan also talked about. Yeah, it's a moral issue. I think morality matters, but it will not take us very far. Other mitigation or adaptation to not take us far. Incentives, the incentives of the individual, the community, of the individual countries, both global south, global north, and the multinationals. That is where we are going to get the sweet spots. That also means that when we are presenting our findings, we need to think about framing them in a way that is incentive compatible with our specific audience. Thank you. Uh, yes, my observation about changing the architecture of government uh, I'm a civil servant, so we as a community of civil servants always discuss our next move, where our next job is going to be. And the Ministry of Climate Change always comes in the conversation. And, uh, you know, Pakistan has experimented with various type of architectures on how to do, um, tackle, uh, you know, climate change. But the civil servant's response, and this is a human response, is that, yes, but there's no work there. So, you know, uh, you know the, the issue is how to create that type of a work or that sort of a performance inducement that you, you actually want to work in the Ministry of Climate Change. I'm, I mean, this particular civil servant who responded to me when I said, why don't you move to the Climate Change Ministry? You're senior enough. And by the way, he's a LSE graduate. And he, <laughs> you know, he said that, you know, Umar, if they were building a dam or doing something like that, I would love to work over there. But I just don't want to work where there's no definition of work. Mm -hmm. You know, I think this is, this is very critical when you talk about higher echelons of civil service, that how do you induce them to be placed in an architecture where where there is work in which they feel motivated that they are actually contributing to something. Uh, that's, I, I, you know, I think is a very important thing. I think we take some opinions from our panel here. I don't know if it answers your question exactly, but just to say that I recognize what you're saying by interacting recently with many civil servants. And my boss, the president, always tells me, don't become a civil servant. <laughs> With all due respect, but I'm one now. <laughs> um, and I think maybe it's the lack of understanding of the work we're actually supposed to be doing if you find yourself in a commission or a ministry like that. Mm -hmm. Because I think anyone who finds themselves in the Ministry of Green Economy or Climate Change and Environment, they have an opportunity to make like some, to do some transformationary uh, work. So you find, and because civil servants move around a lot, and maybe that's also the problem, is that you are trained to be like a labor expert. And then you are now going to look at climate change more broadly, look at all these red flags. You're like misplaced, or you're like a health, public health uh, person. And then you are now supposed to look at deforestation and reforestation. So I think maybe from the perspective of um, those of us who work in that space, not to just put people in spaces where they are not supposed to be, like where the actual training that they have and the, what the role is required, they actually have to, to match. And maybe that's why there's like a lack of motivation to be in those uh, spaces. There are very few people like in the Ministry of Green Economy in Zambia who are actually trained 
you know, environmentalists or climate change experts. We have like a permanent secretary who is like PhD, you know, climate change, but his staff, his team around him isn't quite. So maybe that's something to think about. And then the employees there will be more motivated because they're supposed to be in that space and area of work rather than just transferring people anyhow. I don't think it's a controversial thing to your children that duality that we have to live in. Forget about climate change or using climate change. What is climate change? It's flood response. It's agricultural extension. It's management. It's health. It's what to do when your soil and water salinity increases, what to do with your feet and so on. So I feel like there's so much resources being put into something which is um, unnecessary. And sort of just strengthening those mechanisms would be just in the very least. I think that's a couple of observations very sort of aligned with the previous reports. I, I mean, I think the first on that is that this is really very tied to the point I'm saying. And the remit and the, the sort of desirability of these partners are surely linked to the capacity that they have to act, which is very tied to the earlier financing debate. But uh, on this question of, uh, of sort of remit and scope, I think that becomes a little bit circular, if you like. Robin's question about the design of the architecture is inherently very tied to the, uh, what is it that a civil servant in this department can do? How does it interact with the other departments, the sort of hierarchy or authority that we have to engage on this set of issues? It seems very difficult to disentangle that from the desirability of the departments. I think it ties back to many of you. I'm afraid that provides absolutely nothing of a sort of helpful solution to the question, but I, I, I think it's very tied to some of the earlier uh, themes. During the presentation at the beginning, you have to speak up. Sorry. Uh, the presentation at the beginning kind of um, framed it in terms of private adaptation to public adaptation. And I would just be interested in hearing how the panel sees the third sector in figuring into all this, especially because governments are incredibly so slow and sclerotic, where charities are pretty quick at just like implementing stuff. So I'm interested in hearing whether the panel thinks that. There are ways in which kind of charity-led ad adaptation can be used. have positive feedback on the public sector and private sector, but also negative feedback. Um, so how you could probably like think of promoting the formal, or whether it's just a second order thing, is it really just something that's not really the major? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I, I, I have a go at answering that. <laughs> I think uh, charities and NGOs and so on can play a huge role in helping us figure out how to deal with a lot of these things. Right? I think what uh, we at Brack are increasingly thinking is that governments are root to scale, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so I think, you know, we, we all have a role to play in trying to come up with solutions to this because as we've discussed, there are a magnitude of different uh, both technical solutions that are not governance aspects, economic aspects, etc. We need to grapple with, right? But I think I think NGOs should see themselves as contributing to that, and we do need to not forget about governments because a they are elected, you know, and then secondly they didn't just get to see it; they have a mandate, and there are going to be difficult trade offs here, right? And it's good to embed those in the political discourse as well in a country. And maybe that's just because I'm a political mm -hmm. scientist, not an economist, but I think. You know, think, yeah, we all have a role to play. I don't think it's an either or. Can I, yes, and I think it's a really good question and it might go back to what I was sharing earlier about, you know, so we have this ministry, but is it actually doing, you know, what we think it, it can do? And the problem is multifaceted. Something else I didn't mention also is that whilst we have that ministry, it's also not one of the top five, um, like, most uh, budgeted for, you know, it doesn't sit very close to Ministry of Health, which is like your leading um, ministry in terms of budgeting and resources, you know, so it goes back again to the political will. Is it a priority for that government? Is it a priority for the leaders there? And then it will sit in the place where when you're implementing interventions or you're actually getting things done, these things are prioritized. To bring it closer to home in terms of Zambia, so and it goes back to what you were saying about creating all these vehicles. Um, so the, in Zambia, the president recently created a presidential delivery unit about three months ago, of which I'm the deputy head of the delivery unit. 
Now, if you ask me to say, is it sitting in the top 15 priority areas as a standalone? No. Have we dropped it completely? No, but we are making sure that it's, it's sitting across all these priority areas. So when we have like um, the IGC uh, team that's uh, working in Zambia, we'll recognize like, on the agriculture interventions, there's specific aspects in there about climate adaptation, you know, so getting in the irrigation that you were talking about, bringing in, you know, double crops in, in the year to sort of have food security. And that's actually from a backdrop of political will of actually wanting to get things done, but we could do more. We're not doing enough. You know, maybe if we were doing enough specifically on this subject, it would be one of the most resourced uh, ministries, and maybe it would be a standalone priority area in the presidential um, delivery unit, but also to the point that you can't say, oh, the private sector or the NGOs, the civil society would do it and government won't. So one of the most organized institutions in most countries is the government. In Zambia in particular, the second most organized before you even get to NGOs is the church. You know, so you already get to see that this will be a multifaceted intervention where you need everybody, you know, whether it's the church, civil society, NGOs and government itself to get um, implementation going. You uh, I think I promised you three that you would have some time to discuss the observations that you have prepared. Yes. In case you haven't covered it already with the, uh, with the answer to the questions, is there, have you covered everything or would you like to answer? In responding to this specific thing. And wherever we have seen progress, we have made dramatic progress in that flood response. It is all these different players acting mm -hmm. together. We've had uh, mosques coming in and giving you know, what to do. You have aid agencies, you have uh, Red Cross, Red Crescent, we have the government, we have big NGOs, uh, including in maternal health and ch uh, child health mortality. So having the different series coming is very important because. Uh, there are certain things that only the government can do, building better embankments, maybe using satellite to give better, uh, more accurate warning or information for crop insurance or whatever. Those need big institutional, um, then you need community responses in some cases. And in some cases, it, it is more individual, how to access that financing, um, graduation uh, model, uh, which you can maybe speak a little bit more about. So because of all these different factors, I think, um, the only thing I would want to add is that uh, looking at how different players actually work in a very complementary fashion, I think, is very important. And also, the coordination is something I think the Climate Change Commission could do. The actual work, I think, we already have a lot of things in place to be able to do all that work. We've covered so much ground, right? It's almost a bit difficult. I think. I think the main point I would say is like it can feel a bit daunting, right? Because there's so much to do. Uh, it's so difficult, as you're saying, like whatever route you go down as a country, whether you to try a delivery unit or a big, you know, big ministry like they did in Germany now, whatever you try, right? It seems like this big daunting task. And I think as we try to grapple with those global challenges, generate the evidence, try to figure out what works and so on, my my plea, given where where I work would be to not forget that the impact is already happening now, right? And it goes to what I was saying at the beginning. And we we almost need this too, you you had this juxtaposition, short term, long term, you know, um, adapt in place or relocate. And I think the truth is we have to do both it, at the moment and then figure out which of the two actually works and which we then double down on, right? But we don't have the sort of the luxury to to put all our eggs in one basket or just focus on one because there's so many people already dying now, starving, affected, don't know where, you know. And uh, uh, so I think a little bit, yeah, not getting sort of uh, <laughs> overwhelmed by the challenge, not looking for a silver bullet. I just don't think they exist, right? And experimenting and setting ourselves to learn and, and learn about uh, what works and having sort of several pronged approaches in countries, some which are short term because they have to be, governments need to deliver for their citizens, people are dying, they affect Mozambique, you know, like people are uh, like affected right now by some of this. Um, and at the same time, looking for long term future proof solutions, like you were alluding to Alan, you know, that makes sense in the long term. 
Um, yeah, like we were saying, a lot has been covered, but my thoughts have been evolving also just listening to everyone's contributions. But maybe just to uh, switch it up together, a couple of things from me, good for thought um, for the researchers, is um, the issue of financing. So the question that Narata asked, you know, how do we best allocate that dollar, you know? So, and, and I think something that didn't come up and, I, and as policymakers and also researchers in this space, I would actually say we should also start thinking about using nature-based solutions. So staying in situ, in place, how do you actually protect the ecosystem and the biodiversity in that area? And when you put money in that space, what actually um, happens? So I don't think we are allocating enough resources to protecting the biodiversity and ecosystem, which actually has a ripple effect on all these things we are talking about. So if you actually protect the biodiversity and the ecosystem, then you know you, you solve or you solution for the droughts, you solution for the the uh, floods that you could possibly get, and consequently the food security questions. So I think we are there's not there's data and evidence uh, gaps in that um, space, and it would be good to see a bit more there. And then um, the issue of of um, and or before I get of financing, so we heard a bit about social cash um, transfers and social um, protection. So in Zambia, we've actually increased the social protection. It's now sitting at uh, just over a million. We're a country of just about twenty million people, so a million uh, people uh, are sitting on the social cash transfer, and it's projected to increase by December to one point three million. Mm -hmm. Now. That's a small fraction for, you know, a uh, economically challenged country. And we also have challenges of who's sitting on that database. You know, are they the right people? And they get uh, about $10 per household. An average household is five to 10 people and the disabled get like $40. Does that really, you know, <laughs> it's not, for me, I think it's not sustainable what you have the social protection and the, the um, systems around that. So we need to look at, you know, things broadly and have sustainable impacts through the looking into protecting the biodiversity and the ecosystems. Last but not least, which I mentioned before, is that we don't have time generally as a global community, uh, but also from a political perspective, if you, you know, are fortunate to be working in a country that actually has the political will to solve for this. The other way to actually help them is to get these results and this data really, really quickly so that they can at least keep the systems in place, even if there was a change of, of, of government. So we actually don't have the luxury of, of time. And uh, the IGC team in Zambia will share with you that uh, we've had a, an interesting uh, journey of actually trying to get the government appreciate appreciate data and evidence. So the trick, as I have learned in my little years of being in government, just two years, is that if you don't want a politician to make a wrong decision, you need to be ahead of them with data, you know, because they actually don't have the time to wait. So the data has to be ahead of the decision making. So when they want to make a wrong decision, you say, oh, but have you looked at this, you know, or they should be looking at the data before they make the decision. So if you are fortunate enough to be working in a country office and you have really good relations in the government, let's get ahead of the bad decisions and provide the data and evidence for these governments to make good decisions. Thank you. With one reflection, which is that we've been talking about every single ministry from the Ministry of Labor to a specialized Ministry of Environment. I come to your point about incentives. We have not been talking about the one ministry that has the more incentive power of them all, right. which is the tax authority. Yes. Right? We have to completely revolutionize the way I think we tax people. And this has to be done on each single person. It's not anymore like, where is this money coming from? It has become mass. You know, the environment is the air that we breathe. We cannot have a department that only gets that. And uh, on this, I'd like to thank Dr. Kaiser for his presentation.
and with me and thank you so much everybody for a wonderful discussion there's much more to be done uh, and trust you all <laughs> And our patients So, the paper is motivated by their desire to understand how can we change the leather location of our sectors in the United countries. So, the movement of workers and agriculture to other sectors of the economy appears as one of the key features in our markets. And developing countries are often characterized by a large informal sector with high labor flows into and out of market impact. This, uh, these countries are also disproportionately affected by climate change, resulting in different patterns of labor relocation across sectors. Even then, <laughs> increasing uh, temperature is associated with a decrease in agricultural exchange in the short run. There's some suggested evidence that most of the relocation is into small farms in informal sectors. In some settings, very similar conditions are more associated with <laughs> less engaging in an agricultural work, both in the short and long run. So, the goal of this paper is first to provide a simple theoretical model to reconcile the seemingly conflicting results by empowering. The role of trade openness and industry switching production. And second, I provide new evidence capturing the heterogeneity in climate impacts on labor relocation across sectors that are consistent with the model. As my group analysis, the focus is Vietnam, a lower middle income country that has experienced rapid structural transformation, with most of that happening within provinces. So we can think about uh, response to climate shocks as a response of local labor markets. The country has also a significant variation in market integration across spaces, as well as in sexual employment change across age groups. I employ two empirical strategies, exploiting short and long run weather employment variations. So I documented three findings. First, there are different effects of extremely hot temperatures on labor relocations across sectors. In areas that are well integrated to the global market, hot temperatures is associated with an airflow of labor from agriculture. However, in remote areas, the relocation effect runs in the opposite direction. And I find supporting evidence consistent with this being driven by relative <laughs> labor productivity loss meaning that temperature change disproportionately affect agricultural labor productivity. And second, most of the relocation takes place among agriculture and informal and agriculture. Finally, there are significant heterogeneous effects by age group depending on the destination job, even controlling for differences in educational attainment. While workers of all age groups are equally likely to get an informal job, for example, self-employment, or work as an employee in other household business, younger workers comprise most of those shifts to a formal manual college job. And I find evidence consistent with this being driven by non-uniform labor market frictions. So, the theoretical framework is developed uh, as a simple model of frictional labor relocation. This is a two-sector economy um, with competitive labor markets. Workers supply labor in elastic way, and labor in uh, efficiency unit is the sole input to production. There are one-sided heterogeneity in individual level productivity in the non-agricultural sector. Um, I also assume that homostatic utility consumption of uh, agriculture and non agricultural goods and working in the non agricultural sectors is associated with a per period cost that reduces the earnings in that sector by a fraction between zero and one. <clears throat> and I apologize that this cost is highly, uh, is slightly higher for other workers because of age based discrimination practices in the hiring and firing process especially among low-skilled, labor-intensive 
uh, employment in the hormone and agriculture sector. So the model generates two testable predictions. If temperature change disproportionately affect agricultural fertility, then in the case of small open economies, when the relative price is relatively fixed at a lower time, and changing relative labor productivity will induce workers to move out of agriculture. However, in the case of closed economies, because now the relative price is endogenously determined by the supply and demand forces, such a change in relative productivity might actually push workers into agriculture. The second prediction is that the relocation effect in terms of magnitude is a decreasing function in the cost of working in an agriculture sector. And this cost can be inferred from the observed gains in labor earnings from the amount of sample of workers who change sectors of employment. So to test these predictions, I use data from Vietnam. The most important one is the household labor service. It covers not only individual employment, but also household production um, in agriculture, as well as in common and agriculture. I supplement this with the Vietnam Enterprise Census and other province level data set on migration and crop production. And for weather data, I rely on Air 5, and my focus is on well bulb temperature, that is to capture the potentially combined effects of heat and uh, humidity on. Um, uh, labor productivity. So this figure basically presents the distribution of global temperatures and agricultural labor share over time. Sorry, I was just wondering. I guess I was thinking that, that I was think, I think thought you were thinking about temperatures as a shock to agriculture rather than a shock to labor productivity. So does that change skew the balance of whether it makes sense to look at wet bulb temperatures or? Uh, I will go back to okay. this point. <laughs> so the left panel uh, shows the distribution of daily world of temperature over time. As we can see, there's not only a kind of rival shift of the entire distribution to the um, meaning a, a change in the mean of the distribution, but also change in the shape of the distribution with more frequency of um, hot and cold days. Um, on the right panel, there's steady decrease in the share of workers in agricultural um, over time. In terms of spatial distribution, the province that experienced um, in increased risk of extreme temperatures are those that experienced larger decrease in agricultural labor share. And, this, uh, and that negative association seems most pronounced in um, areas that are close to the major seaports of the country. And here, the left panel basically just confirmed that negative association. On the right panel, I use a more conventional measure of extreme temperatures, which is the um, degree days above the 27 Celsius degree. This is <coughs> according to ergonomic literature. Once um, we reach above the, that cutoff, there's a significant drop in level of activity of human test performance. Interestingly, that association varies a lot, uh, a lot across age groups. When we move from the left to the right, we're moving from the group of younger workers to other workers. And we can see that the older the workers, the less responsive they are to temperature change. So, to identify the cause and effects of temperatures on intersectional labor relocation, I rely on two approach, um, pan approach and long differences approach. As for pan approach, the unit of analysis is province by age group by year. And besides that unit uh, fixed effect, I also control for region by age group by year fixed effect. Region here is the <clears throat> climatic region, which also coincides with economic regions of the city of the country. Correspondingly, uh, in a long differences approach, the unit of analysis is province by age group, and I control for region by age group is effect. The key difference between these two approaches is that while panel approach explore year to year variation in weather distribution, uh, the long differences approach, when we look at, at the data over a long period of time, that, that might better reflect how 
people responds to anthropogenic uh, climate change. So with respect to average temperature effects, here yeah, I only present the results in the most testimonials model where the temperature reductions are represented by degree by the degree days above 27 Celsius or degree days below 9 Celsius. In the paper, I do show that all of the following results are robust to different functional form of temperatures, including cross out of polynomials, uh, cumulative beams of uh, degree day beams. <laughs> So here from the plan approach, we can see that uh, our temperature is associated with a decrease in agricultural labor share and increase in inform informal and formal and agricultural labor shares. It does not um, have any significant impact on the share of workers in um, the inactive and employed. And similarly, I do not observe any significant impacts of cold temperatures. And I have a very similar pattern uh, with the long differences approach. When looking at the data over a long period of time, I can also examine the relative importance of change in the shape of the distribution, meaning uh, increased risk of extreme temperatures versus change in the mean of the temperature. And so here we can see from um, the right panel, most of the relocation is really just driven by change in extreme temperatures. Now, just to recap, um, hot temperatures significantly reduce the share of workers in agriculture and increase the share of workers in informal and formal and agriculture. Clarifying what the acronym is given off. Um, is HDD harmful or heating degree days? And CBD cooling degree days or cold degree days? And hot degree days and cold degree days. Um, I would see a little bit that the HDD is commonly used as heating degree days, which refers to cold temperatures, and cooling degree days refers to hot temperatures. So uh, just, yeah, good. Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> Do you see any spatial reallocation? Um, yeah, I. I conducted a analysis on interprovincial migration and there's not much um, evidence on it. So that's why I focus on local labor market response. On average, even though hot temperatures are associated with the movement of workers out of, the, out of agriculture, these effects are entirely concentrated in well integrated areas. For this heterogeneity analysis, I construct an indicator of tray openness based on the distance to the nearest uh, major seaport of the country. And in the paper, I have another um, measure, which is the correlation coefficient between local rice price and the world market rice price. And the uh, effects and the results are very similar. As we can see here, there is very different effects um, across kind of well integrated areas and less uh, integrated area. And such differential effects become even more pronounced when I look um, <laughs> when I use the long differences approach. And across two approaches, the effect in terms of magnitude are much larger for the informal and agriculture sector relative to formal and agriculture sector. Is there an intuitive way to interpret the magnitudes? Is, is, it, obvious? is it like obvious? Is it obvious? Sorry. Oh, so uh, this is like the effects of um, one standard deviation okay. uh, increase in degree days above 27 Celsius. Okay. So, as for age heterogeneous temperature effects, um, across the two approaches, I can't really um, re reject the hypothesis that there is no differential effects on informal uh, non agricultural labor share. However, um, for formal non agricultural labor share, effects are largest among, um, among younger workers. So, so far I have documented three findings. 
first is that there are differential effects on labor relocation across um, geographic areas. And second, most of the relocation happens among agriculture and in component agriculture. And third, there are differential effects across age groups, again, depending on the type of jobs they take after leaving agriculture. So according to the model, these are very consistent with the hypothesis that uh, temperature change disproportionately affects agricultural like uh, agricultural labor productivity. So I directly examined this hypothesis by constructing a, a province year um, panel data set of production in three sectors, agriculture, formal and informal and agriculture. And I estimate uh, this regression where the outcome is the law revenue per worker. And I use this as a proxy for labor productivity. So what I can see is that our temperature significantly reduce agricultural labor productivity, but does not have any significant impact on labor productivity in the, uh, in the other sectors. The, compar the comparable effects for crop production is much lower. For example, the one degree days about 27 Celsius is associated with roughly 1% decrease in agricultural revenue per worker. However, it's associated with only 0.3 to 0.4% decrease in rice yields, which is the major sta staple food um, of the country. And um, in some climate exposed industries, such as mining uh, constructions, I do find evidence of a negative effects of temperature on labor productivity, especially among small and low firms. So these kind of suggest that the heat impacts on labor relocation across sectors really is beyond the commonly studied mechanism in the literature, which focus on crop productivity or land productivity. Right, but is that suggesting that if the rice yields are only dropping a little bit, but agriculture revenue dropping a lot, does that suggest that there's an extensive margin effect? That people are, is there less land cultivated or harvested? Uh, I, did, I didn't find any effects on like cultivated land, but I do find effect on significant drop in the, the hours they work. So I guess part of the reason is the drop in the labor supply to, to that sector. And here, because the outcome is per worker, it's not like per hour of work. So. <clears throat> do that within households intensive markets? So maybe they spend, so they're still doing agriculture, but they now do a bit more time in informal non agriculture. Are you able to look at that? Um, or is it really just like primary occupation? I, yeah, that's, uh, that's the, the hours of work I okay, yeah. talked about. So. I can see significant drop in the hours worked in agriculture and increase in the hours worked in informal and formal agriculture, and that mostly happens at the extensive. So just to follow up on that, so when you're de defining like the labor share, how are you? I'm using the, the primary job. Okay. Um. I'm just wondering if you know where the former agricultural workers go within the formal, you know, informal non-agriculture, just to understand whether those declining productivity mining on construction could be because they receive a lot of former agricultural workers. You see what I mean? That they get relocated, they're absorbed by these sectors when they move to non-agriculture. Yeah, so um, as for agriculture, here it basically includes both informal and formal agricultural workers, because the share of the formal agricultural workforce is too small. And so I just group them together as agriculture. I guess what I mean is like which sectors among the non-agricultural sector absorb them, if, if they are those two or? They mostly move to either low uh, intensive uh, industries, including constructions and low skill services. The, the second set of results is the um, differential effects across the age and sector dimensions. And here I argue that this 
this can be explained by the existence of non-uniform labor market conditions. So what I meant is that uh, one of the prediction from the model is that the relocation effect in terms of magnitude is a decreasing function in the cost of working in an agriculture. And that cost can be inferred from the gains in earnings among a sample of workers who change sectors of employment. So I directly uh, estimate those observed gains in earnings using the sample of individual um, who switch sectors. So the most important thing here is to include the individual fixed effect in order to minimize the role of selection. So what I find is that when workers uh, move from agriculture, then the gains in earnings are much larger in the formal sector relative to uh, informal and agriculture sector. So through the lens of the model, this suggests that there's a low cost of switching from agriculture to informal agriculture. And that explains the larger temperature effects on the share of workers in informal agriculture relative to formal um, and, agriculture. and second, even within the formal and agriculture sectors, the gains in earnings are largest among the older workers. So that suggests that, again, through the lens of, model, uh, of the model, other workers incur most more cost if getting a formal and agriculture job. That explains why the younger workers comprise most of those who shift into this sector. And finally, finally, with the informal and agriculture, there is no differences in the gains across the groups. And again, that suggests similar cost of getting an informal and net job when workers move from agriculture. And that explains why workers of all age groups are equally likely to move to the sectors in response to temperature change. So, just to conclude in this paper, I present a single theoretical model to <clears throat> reconcile the different findings in the prior climate employment literature. I also provide new evidence consistent with the model's prediction using data from Vietnam. How <clears throat> temperatures can impede structure transformation in remote areas and accelerate it in areas that are well integrated to the world markets. So that suggests that reducing trade barriers might be critical to mitigate climate damages in low and middle income countries. However, because of the existence of non uniform labor market frictions, most of the labor flows is among the two low productivity sectors agriculture and informal agriculture. And that suggests that these climate induced labor relocation might reinforce the country's comparative advantage in these less skill intensive industries. And that is combined with lower rates of innovation naturally result in lower labor flow. And finally, the effects also depend on switching frictions that again vary across demographic groups. And that has important implications for within country inequality with respect to labor markets outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you, very cool. Um, very interesting project. One of the things that uh, you sort of allude to is this idea of uh, sort of switching sectors so that they're working in agriculture and then they're working in manufacturing. I wonder, you know, whether you can sort of get at the idea that people hold multiple jobs. So we know it's common that, you know, in these contexts that people work in multiple sectors at sort of the same time or that within the year they're sort of moving from one job to the other job seasonally and so it would be interesting to understand the extent to which you can you said you have hours work the extent to which there is extensive margin switching versus intensive margin adjustments because one another interpretation for the sort of low frictions is that they're just adjusting the number of hours that they're working across the types of activities they're already engaged with it'd be really interesting to to be able to sort of get at that a little bit more precisely if you can thank you very much for the suggestion yeah, so right now I base um, um, the outcome is based on the primary jobs. And I do observe that people work two jobs. A lot of people work two, two jobs at the same time. 
So that would be very interesting to look at that intensive watching. Um, I thought it was very interesting that um, I think if I remember the magnitudes correctly between the long run approach and the year to year variation, the magnitudes of the year to year variation were about half of the long run effect. And I think that's very interesting, right? Because it means that people can adopt very, uh, can adapt very quickly in, in the short run. Uh, and I was also su surprised a bit by that. It would be interesting to have some anecdotal evidence um, how that works in Vietnam. Yeah. So, um... The, the larger magnitude from the long differences approach relative to shop, shop, um, to the panel approach, I think it actually has two different interpretations as for the areas that are remote. It's kind of support the uh, intensification hypothesis where over the long run, like people cannot really um, Smooth egg consumption, and because of that, uh, liquidity constraints, more workers are now uh, working in agriculture. But for areas that are close to the major seaports of the country, it kind of reflects now that workers are more forward looking and they might have adopted some other adaptation strategies, and therefore they just, you know, they're more likely to move over the long run. And, and the second interpretation is actually supported by the fact that I observed a larger effects in areas that are that has um, higher long higher long run temperature mean. It's like when you are already in the in the hot areas and you know that in the future it might be getting even hotter, and with that damages larger damages in hot areas, they are more forward looking and therefore um, I observe even higher effects in the short run among among that hot areas relative to the Any sense of where uh, the workers are going in the non in the informal uh, non-agricultural sector are going into separate first you mentioned manufacturing uh previous class but interesting to know uh, what people are doing? Uh, do you have any sense of construction? Mm -hmm. or yeah, uh, so um, um, in the paper, I show that most of them move to other low uh, skill intensive industries. And that includes construction, mining, and other low skilled services. But uh, I don't have the data to look at which type of Industries within the those huge services. You reconcile that with the model of trade versus the non tradable uh, integration of the thing, and you compare them with the non tradable industries that have been like the I think one of the different interpretations for the remote sector is that uh, the informal and agricultural sector basically they mostly produce kind of non tradable things. These are most affected by the yeah, so kind of another interpretation for why there's much more people Um, thanks again for uh, having me in the session. Uh, this is I'm a macro person getting into uh, microclimates, uh, so I'm very excited to hear your thoughts about uh, the paper. Please don't work with Victoria Nogueira at the IDP, so usual disclaimer applies. Uh, from a macro standpoint, there are two key issues that arise when we think about discussions of policies to tackle climate change. The first one is thinking about the impact of these types of policies on job creation firms and more broadly employment and GDP. And also I should add distributional effects. Uh, I know that some of you are working on those and those are also increasingly important. This is uh, a focus mostly on you know, thinking about uh, medium to, to long run. 
There's also an issue that has to do with the cost of the transition to a lower carbon environment. Uh, these are issues that you know we started to tackle in the context of advanced economies, so US, Europe, and obviously now in the context of, of emerging economies. Now, in um, the last couple of years, there's been an emphasis on the fact that uh, the reductions that you're going to see in carbon emissions by advanced economies are not going to be sufficient to be able to actually limit the damages from climate change, meaning that you need other countries, developing countries and emerging economies, to actually play a role in the reduction of, of these emissions. Okay. Spe uh, specifically thinking about emerging economies, uh, so thinking about, again, uh, upper, um, upper income developing countries. Uh, these are the largest contributor to global emissions after the US, China, and effectively uh, the EU 28 countries. So these are roughly 10% of global emissions. These are countries that, that rely more heavily on building sources of energy, relative to advanced economies. And these are countries that whose share of global economic activity has been fairly constant in the last uh, 15 years, but whose share of global emissions has been increasing. Okay, so these are countries that, again, at the same time, are considering the introduction of carbon pricing or other types of climate policies. Now, focusing more on these economies, um, these economies also have a distinct employment infrastructure. So this is something that Trin alluded to in the context of Vietnam, but this also applies to basically uh, mature developing countries. So think about Mexico, Brazil, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, Turkey. So there's a high prevalence of small, less productive informal firms, of high tires to formality. We have low formal job creation and large shares of self-employment relative to advanced economies. And one of the things that we want to get at in this paper is the fact that climate policies, and specifically in this context, uh, a notion of carbon pricing, is bound to affect this structure. Mm -hmm. So what we end up doing in this paper is trying to understand to what extent is carbon pricing in the energy sector going to affect the labor market uh, and the market economy in a context where you have effectively uh, high informality, which is what we see in emerging economies. So how do we do this? Again, a lot of EMEs don't have carbon pricing, so we need a model. And so what we're going to do here is basically consider a standard macro model. We're going to introduce search and matching frictions for think about the labor market. And this model is going to feature a notion of endogenous salary employment, what you would see in, in an advanced economy model. It's going to feature endogenous self-employment, which is going to play a key role uh, for some of the results that I'm going to be presenting, endogenous level of participation, and also a notion of eff effectively firm entry in the salary sector, and basically selection into, into per month. That's at least from a firm and employment uh, standpoint. Now, from the perspective of thinking about a macro climate model, um, we're going to have an energy sector that is going to feature pollution externalities. And one of the novelties relative to the papers out there is that there's going to be a choice for the energy producers to basically choose which production technology they use, whether they use something that generates emissions as a byproduct, or whether they're actually able to adopt green technologies. And this is something that we're starting to see a lot in, in emerging economies. Right? And it's actually going to play a role, at least quantitatively, when it comes to thinking about the effects of carbon. With this model, we end up basically matching um, the average EME firm employment and energy mix structure. And then what we consider is effectively increasing a carbon tax to generate a reduction in emissions uh, by 25%. The 25% number is a little bit arbitrary. It's what the IMF has been uh, using when it comes to thinking about these issues in the context of um, uh, developing countries. Uh, but you can obviously choose a different number. Uh, and then consider how that increase in the carbon tax focused on the polluting energy sector economy is going to basically affect the labor market and affect the macroeconomy. Uh, we have effectively four results. I'm going to be focusing on the long run simply because I have half an hour. If I had an hour, I would be able to also talk about transitional dynamics. That's something that I have in the paper, uh, and I'm more than happy to talk to you about this if you're interested. Uh, the effects are actually different for the transition relative to wins in the in the long run, uh, but I think you get a lot of really good intuition about what's happening if you focus on the steady state, uh, which is what I'm going to deep into. So we have four results from a long run standpoint. The first one, and this is not going to be very surprising for you, is that when you introduce this carbon tax, one of the things that's going to happen is that you're going to have an increase in the share of energy producers that adopt green technologies. So have this extensive margin of technology adoption. And that's also going to result in an increase in the share of green energy. Okay, so again, in a context where you have green energy, this is not very surprising. Now, 
the Ethereum price of energy is comprised of what happens to the price of polluting energy and the price of green energy. It happens to be the case that in equilibrium, you actually end up seeing an increase in energy prices. Now, if you're a firm and you end up using energy to produce, which is the case in this model, you're going to have higher costs. That is going to lead to basically lower salary firm creation, and less capital being used. There's going to be a reduction in the number of formal firms in the economy and a reduction in the formal employment. One of the things that's happening here is that salary firms are creating fewer uh, salary jobs. So then households end up reallocating their search effort away from salary jobs into self-employment. So you get this increase in self-employment, which is effectively informal. You get this increase in informality, an increase in participation in the labor force that stems from the increase in self-employment, and a slight increase in unemployment. Also, you end up getting a reduction in consumption, a reduction in welfare, and a reduction in health. So that's more or less aligned with a lot of the models that we have out there for <coughs> advanced economies. The novelty here being the fact that we're actually looking at the informal sector. Sorry, it's fine to ask a question. I mean, you, you said you're looking at the long run. So is the reason why energy prices increase? Are you assuming that the average cost of green energy is higher? Or what leads to the uh, it doesn't it doesn't have to I can see like in the transition yeah. that of course it would be, but I mean Yeah, so know? that depends on how responsive the green uh, energy producers are when it comes to actually because the there's an increase in the in the production of green energy and that basically reduces the price of green energy but there's uh, a larger increase in the price of energy that's polluting because basically the because oh, of the extensive yeah. margin yeah. and again you can play around with this in our response of the, the green energy producers yeah do you have climate damages Yes, I do. So there's a standard uh, damages function that doesn't really do all that much when it comes to uh, actually affecting these results. Uh, but I'll get to that. Yeah. As a small country, which I think that. Uh, so the cost is, I think, we calibrate it so you get, you know, if there's like a, a an increase in temperature by one degree Celsius, you get like a 1.25 reduction, 1.5 uh, 25 percent reduction in GDP. So that that itself, the damages function doesn't really play that much of a role at this point. Okay, so this is again not that surprising between one. Uh, the second point I want to make, and again, this goes back to the, the models that we have out there, is that the ability of energy producers to actually switch technology. So, this is again the extensive margin of adoption actually matters a lot for limiting the adverse effects of the policy. So, this is not just about changing the inputs that you use in the polluting sector and in the green sector, it's about being able to actually change things. So, adopting, you know, more solar panels. Uh, building more uh, wind farms, etc. If you think about a model that doesn't have this adoption margin, you still have polluting and green energy, but those are basically two representative sectors. The output and welfare losses are twice as large relative to the model where you actually have this adoption margin. Yeah. Um, and again, this is important because we are seeing that not only in advanced economies, but also in. The third fact, moving more towards again, thinking about informality, is that. Self-employment plays a key role in shaping the labor market and aggregate effects of tax. In particular, as I mentioned earlier, if you think about an increase in energy prices, salary firms end up hiring less, uh, fewer workers, salary workers. Uh, so that basically moves resources away from the salary sector into self-employment, where self-employment is less developed. Again, you get a, an increase in search for self-employment opportunities that overall contribute to an increase in participation and a reduction in welfare because we don't like to participate in the labor at least in the context of the Now, if you compare this, so, you know, what happens to self-employment and output to a model that doesn't have self-employment, so think about a model basically for the US or for Europe or the existing models, the output and welfare losses when you have self-employment are 60% greater compared to that model. So again, this margin of self-employment matters a lot. This is surprising because usually we think about self-employment as sort of a buffer to whatever shocks you might be receiving or policy changes. In this context, it's actually exacerbating uh, uh, the, the effect of the policy. And I'll get to that once I show you quantitatively the, uh, the results of the model. Okay. Now, with this third result in mind, one of the things that we can think about is, okay, self-employment seems to make things a little bit worse when it comes to the policy. How can we think about a joint policy that not only reduces emissions, but also prevents sort of what's happening in the self-employment sector to actually help? So we consider a policy that reduces emissions with this carbon tax, and at the same time, makes it easier for salary firms to become formal. So there's this regulatory cost of becoming a formal firm. You can reduce that cost with structural reforms, be government policies, et cetera. 
that effectively eliminates the upward and welfare losses from the families. Now, do I truly believe this result? No, but it's about relative to what happens when you actually have said the more increasing. And that's actually the point that we want to make. Not necessarily about the quantitative effects, but about these two margins that actually matter for emerging economies. Now, the one point about this, um, the fact that you're actually able to truly minimize the output and welfare effects from the carbon tax depends heavily on whether you have this adoption margin in the energy sector. Why? Because of what happens to be price of energy. With okay, so I'll get to this in detail with a nice little table that compares models. Uh, I don't think I'm going to have time to talk about transitional dynamics. That's in the paper, and I'm more than happy to talk to you about this uh, later. Okay. So with this in mind, is, yeah. Is there increase in labor force participation? Is there some assumption that you made for it? But it, it doesn't. No. So that's that's or... endogenous, and that's driven by the fact that there's this sharp increase in self-employment. Why, why why would there be sharp increase? So people are trying bring out the jobs. Those people are looking for self-employment. So uh, there must so, be some assumption you're making loss of income, people trying to recover the income and more people trying to join in. Right, but so that would be a feature of the model. So we're letting the model tell us whether there's going to be an increase. Uh, if you're talking about the magnitude of the increase, that depends on basically the elasticity of participation. And you can play around with that parameter and see and to what extent you actually get. Go down, participation increases. Uh, so it's mostly about the fact that if Salary job creation falls, then as a household, you move, you know, if you have, you know, household members that are looking for salary jobs, they say, ah, there's nothing. So you move towards self employment. And that, that view allocation is actually strong enough to overall boost participation in the labor force. And participation, remember, is both unemployment, so people searching and well, people well, actually unemployment working. Unemployment including as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, so okay. participation does include both. All right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you get a slight uptick in unemployment that's not very large. Okay. And that's consistent with existing models that don't really, you know, it's very difficult to get a sharp increase in unemployment in, uh, when it comes to like carbon taxation. Okay. So just as more yeah. clarification, is there a difference between self-employment and informality here? Or is there so informality includes both informal salary workers, so workers that, that get a, a salary uh, that work for basically informal firms that are associated with basically low productivity and the self-employed. So that, that those are the two categories. Right. So that makes sense. So think about people working in small firms with salary workers and also the self employed as basically comprising labor income. But all of the self employed, self -employed are not formal. I mean, there's a very small fraction, you know, like five, ten percent at most of the self employed that are formal, like lawyers and doctors. Most of the but here they are most of the self employed are included. Yeah, in this context, they are. Yes, they are. Is this uh, elasticity that he was yes. talking about, uh, where the firms, uh, the energy prices decrease formal employment opportunities, is that empirically founded? Because I've, I've seen other papers where, you know, increases in energy prices shift employment to more efficient firms relative to less efficient firms. And it might be the case that those more efficient firms are more likely to be formal. So, so um, I'd be interested to see, to talk about that evidence. Um, in this context, it's more about, so the evidence that I can give you is about the connection between the growth in emissions uh, and, and the growth in self-employment. And actually the model that, that we build is consistent with that evidence. There's a, a negative relationship. So the, our model actually ends up generating uh, things that are consistent with, uh, with the data. Uh, but let's talk more about that. Okay. Uh, contributions, again, we have this macro search climate framework that is tailored to thinking about um, basically the firm and employment structure of emerging economies. This is not a model that you can use for like India or low income economies where agriculture and self employment and agriculture is really important. You can modify the model to have that, but I don't think this model can speak to issues, you know, uh, associated with employment in, in India where you do have a large share of, of employment in agriculture. So keep that in mind. Another component of, of this model is the fact that, again, we are thinking about the extensive margin of technology adoption when it comes to polluting versus green technology. Again, that ends up mattering a lot for the quantitative effects of carbon tax. You can limit the damages from a carbon tax from an economic standpoint if you actually end up accounting for this, for this margin, which, again, we do see in the data. Uh, the second point is, again, highlighting the relevance of self-employment as a marginal adjustment to shocks, but also to policy in this context. Because it does seem to actually uh, play an important role in, in quantifying 
the, the effects of the policy. And that implies that if you were to grab an off-the-shelf, you know, macro MMR for advanced economies, and you want to use it for EMEs, you're gonna have an you're gonna get an incomplete picture with this. Okay. Let me just give you many of you know these facts because if you do work in development, this is not gonna be surprising. I just wanna highlight the differences between EMEs and, and advanced economies in, in the context of informality and then a little bit about carbon policy. Uh, the first fact that again, many of you already know is that employment is much more prevalent in emerging economies relative to advanced economies. Uh, so again, almost 40% of total employment in, in a group of basically 12 EMEs. Uh, versus 40% in advanced economies. That also implies that the size of the informal sector as a share of GDP is also larger in, in, in emerging economies. Uh, the second fact is that the share of energy from fossil fuels in emerging economies is greater compared to what you see in advanced economies. That 10 percentage point difference might not seem like, like a lot, but it actually matters when you think about the effects of a carbon tax. Uh, and this is something that we've seen in, in the model. Now, if you don't like the focus on energy and you want to focus on electricity, you basically get a similar picture. Just a quick clarification, you might have said, this doesn't merging include low income? No, this is basically middle and upper income development. Yes. Does it make sense to distinguish between uh, countries that have fossil fuel resources and those that don't? Uh, I, if, yes, um, the way to deal with that is basically you're thinking about within emerging economies, like yeah. some like Mexico versus. versus yeah, I mean, that, that would imply then that, um, you know, for example, I don't know, Brazil has a very hard, high share of energy coming from renewables versus, for example, Mexico that doesn't have much. Um, the way to look with this is basically to calibrate the model to the two countries instead of considering the average. Here, again, it's mostly about making a point about the prevalence of employment, which is the case in both countries. You can then play around with to what extent is the share of energy that comes from the resources important, uh, but that's sort of a secondary aspect. You can also imagine that this is correlated with whether clean technologies are really cheaper or more. Ah, uh, yes, absolutely. Yes. And so in the context of the model, we're going to say basically effectively you're importing the technologies that like to produce uh, uh, green energy. Um, and that's something that you know you can reduce the cost and see and, and see what happens when it comes to the adoption and then how that plays out when it comes to the price. Sorry, just a quick follow up. Talking about these Latin American countries, these yes. countries like for example Colombia, yeah. um, they have um, a lot of um, illegal mining. Yes. So those workers, how do we consider those workers self-employed or? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, I'd say probably informal. Yeah. I guess uh, they whether they're self-employed or not. I mean, that's a good question. I think that's uh, somewhat sector specific, but again, here we're looking at aggregates. Yeah. So if you start to think of, about sectoral differences, then you need to be a little bit more careful. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't know how we'd label that uh, um, yeah. either, uh, in any formal setting. Yeah, because there's a big share of that. In yes. Yes. Legal. yes. Okay. Um, obviously, you know, damages from climate change greater in emerging economies. Advanced economies. One thing to note again is that carbon prices are effectively zero in these economies, but these countries are considering the introduction of these carbon taxes or expanding them. The last thing that I think is relevant, given the discussions that we've had uh, yesterday and today, the revenue potential from carbon reforms is greater in emerging economies. In terms of actually generating resources, this potentially seems to be a way to generate extra resources and then potentially compensate uh, new losers. It's like, again, when you assume that there is no loss, from there is no loss for in developed countries, is there something special? In loss in terms of? Uh, this uh, speed centigrade increase in uh, temperatures on GDP. I, so, yeah, so this is something that if you take a look at the, the overall group of advanced economies, uh, most of them actually end up benefiting from tourism. If, if temperatures rise, people that like countries that have, you know, very rough winters are going to have milder winters. And then people are gonna have, you know, that again varies across countries, you know, like Norway is probably benefiting. Uh, the US is sort of like on that not matter. This is again a figure that you know more about this, right? But it's more about the relative uh, costs. <clears throat> okay, now let's skip this. Two page model summary, and then we're gonna I'm gonna show you some results. No equations, I'm just gonna give you a structure of the model in the most simplest uh, terms. So think about the macro model that you know you've all learned. 
uh, households. There's going to be a notion of salary and self-employment goods producing firms. There's going to be some imperfect substitutability between the production of output from the self-employment and the salary sector. Again, you can control that with an CCP and then later on with an how things change, things don't change all that, all that much, and energy producers. Okay. Um, salary from entry is endogenous and subject to, to, to some costs. So you enter and then you actually get to choose whether you become formal or informal based on a productivity draw. I'll, I'll mention a couple of things about this in, in a second. Uh, salary search frictions to generate frictional unemployment. And again, a decision by the household to send individuals to search for both salaried uh, positions and basically self-employment opportunities. And then the energy, uh, energy producers are gonna be supplying energy to salaried firms and households. You can say, well, that one, you're assuming that the self employed don't, don't use energy. If you modify them all to have that, same conclusions. So it's really, you know, what's happening to, to the salaries. So the production technology trade off, that doesn't incorporate any possibility for differences in like energy production. Uh, you can. So you can change uh, the, the energy share and energy productivity. So thinking about, you know, formal firms maybe are a little bit more efficient because they can invest in, you know, the latest technology. Mm -hmm. uh, we've tried basically playing around with that. The, the main conclusions remain the same. Quantitatively, things change a little bit, but, but again, it's pretty, pretty robust. Okay. Second slide of the, of the model, and then again, results. Sally firm is going to be using labor, capital, and, and energy to produce. The so self-employed only use labor, again, our results are robust, including energy in the production of supplement output. There's this notion of, again, you enter as a salary firm, you try your productivity, and based on that productivity, you decide whether you stay informal, which means that you have access to a technology that uses capital, but it's less capital intensive and less productive, or you pay this cost, the F, that's the cost of basically becoming a formal firm, that captures, you know, very simple things, um, think about access to credit, et cetera, that allows you to then become a productive. And, and have a more capital uh, intensive technology. Uh, self employment is endogenous, and that's based on the decisions of the household to send individuals to search for self employment. And then again, the most important aspect here is there's this endogenous following green energy structure whereby energy producers decide to adopt a following technology that uses regular capital to produce, generates harmful PFP reducing uh, emissions. So that, that goes back to the damage function, right? Um, it's going to be subject to a carbon tax, and it can also choose to abate emissions, uh, so an intensive margin of abatement. Uh, uh, and then you have the green technology where you use a specific type of capital that, that I'm going to call green. It's emissions free and it's subject to a fixed cost of adoption. As a baseline, the carbon tax revenue is going to be going back to the household in a lump sum way. You can play around with different uh, you know, revenue recycling. Uh, Yes. Sorry, I know you're running out of time. Yeah. Is it that they, so the productivity draws, I guess, determine how many people go green? Is it that, does you need a high productivity draw to overcome the fixed cost? Effectively, you? yes. So in this case, you basically the green the green uh, technology is a little bit where you have to be more productive to basically adopt the green technology. That's the only way you, in which you can actually homogenize this. Is our green energy producers more productive? I if you have evidence, I, I would be I would love to see it. I just my, my sense is that maybe at the merchant they are. Does the emissions reduce productivity of the green firm or only of the- it, it Basically for everyone, for production firms, for the self-employed and for energy producers, for everyone in the economy. Is there like a rest of the world? Like should I be- uh, No, so let's think about this as a closed economy. Uh, there's gonna be an, an rest of the world emissions, but that's, that's just a parameter. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, results in the last three minutes and a half. Zero car carbon tax uh, as, a, as a baseline, we basically calibrate the model to match the facts that actually about emerging economies. And then again, the idea here is to increase the carbon tax to reduce emissions by 25% in the world. What do we get? Forget about these two columns. This is the pre-tax and the post-tax levels and, and percents. These are basically the numbers that matter. So you end up getting a sharp increase in the price of energy, roughly 12%. Uh, by reducting the number of salary firms, a reduction in output and welfare. And again, the reduction in welfare is significant, it's roughly 2% of city states. Uh, you get a reduction in the share of basically the, the title of formal economy from a GDP standpoint, reduction in the formal employment share, increase in self employment, not that much of a change in unemployment. The 0.15 percentage points relative to the baseline level, not, so not very high. <laughs> now, what happens if you remove the uh, the technology adoption margin in the energy sector. That's basically this column. 
This is the benchmark result, and then I'll just come up in a second. What you see is that without the green technology adoption margin, the price of energy goes up by more. And that implies that then the output and welfare costs are going to be greater. Okay, so all, the effects really come from how the price of energy is affecting the other factors behaving. And in turn, how then the self employment are going to respond to it. Notice that the environment increases by more, but I think the baseline model. And then you get basically these large amounts. If you were to use the tax revenue to subsidize the adoption of green technologies, notice that you end up getting a smaller increase in the price of energy and therefore smaller output and welfare costs because partly again, self employment is not increasing as much. In the last two minutes, one minute. What happens if you think about self-employment? So this is a model that forgets about self-employment. So put everyone who's self-employed into the informal salary firms, or you can also basically keep the share of self-employed fixed at its baseline. You get exactly the same results. The price of energy increases roughly by the same amount, given the, the reduction of the metrics that we're targeting. But the number of salary firms followed by less the output and welfare losses are smaller. And again, this has to do with the fact that when you think about self transforming here, you have a first round effect that comes from the carbon tax that increases the price of energy, reduces the incentive to create salary jobs, and therefore individuals have to search for self employment. When individuals search for self employment, that's further increasing the marginal cost of creating a salary job via market tactics. And that's basically where the amplification comes in when it comes to the cutting self-employment in the model and basically getting sharper output and welfare costs. So you don't only have that the carbon tax hits you via the price of energy, but then you have fewer people, if you're a firm and you're searching for jobs or workers, you have fewer people searching for those jobs and therefore it's more costly for you to hire. So you cut back vacancies even more and job creation even in the salary sector. So in the 30 seconds that I have left, maybe, Ah, oh, two minutes. Okay, great. I've been I've been pacing around like crazy. Okay, so with this in mind, then we know that again, self-employment is an important margin of adjustment. So let's think about a policy that reduces again emissions with the carbon tax. But then let's make it easier for firms to register and become formal. This is again a very simple exercise just to highlight the role of self-employment. Okay, we reduce the cost of becoming a formal firm by eight point. 5% relative to its baseline. So it's not a very you know, large reduction. That's based on the average reduction that we've seen in the group of EMEs that, I fo that we focus on. The price of energy in a equilibrium increased by the same amount. But what you're doing is you're saying, okay, easier to become a formal firm. So you're not going to cut the creation of salary jobs as much. You're not going to have an incentive to actually have fewer, uh, less salary uh, firm creation. So the number of salary firms followed by less. So you're effectively keeping more economic activity in the salary sector, both formal and informal, uh -huh, but still keeping people away from something. So on that, you actually end up seeing virtually no output or welfare costs. If you were more aggressive with this policy, obviously you would get gains, but that can also be costly from other perspectives uh, from a political economic standpoint. But again, what's important here is that by keeping more people in the salary sector, and again, this includes both salary, uh, formal and informal salary firms, you can actually limit the extent to which the carbon tax can have adverse effects. Does this mean that again, you reduce your take any two? Not really, but it's again, highlighting the role of self employment as an important margin of adjustment and the role of complementary policies when you think about acting, um, emissions in an emerging market. I'm going to skip transitional dynamics, so let me just not do it because I think I'm on time. So again, what we end up doing is studying the labor market and macro effects of a carbon tax in the energy sector in emerging economies by focusing on the firm and employment structure that characterizes these economies that makes it different from advanced economies. One of the key highlights uh, of the model is, again, this endogenous energy production structure and the role of self-employment, and we highlight the fact that if you want to tackle you know, uh, climate change with a carbon tax in these economies, you have to think about the employment structure, in particular self-employment, uh, when it comes to uh, determining the, the potential costs of these costs. So let me end there. Uh, thank you so much.
I'm just thinking about the directed technological change, yes. and the transition dynamics. I just wonder maybe if there's some dynamic where you know the benefit of the carbon tax could be that it pushes in for green now, which could then bring down the six costs in the future. And right. But does that so that's what's happening in the model in the sense that you get more adoption? You look at innovation in the sense that most of the innovation in technology is happening in advanced economies. So if anything, it will lead you to you know more imports. Um, or, you know, in some countries, you are starting to see more domestic innovation, mm -hmm. but the technologies that we have now, they will come from, you know, Germany, the US, mm -hmm. China is also obviously innovating. Uh, we, we don't have China in the US, uh, but this is more about the fact that you're adopting existing technologies. It's not about necessarily innovation. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking, yeah, the adoption costs themselves. Yeah, Absolutely. So in this case, we have it fixed. Yeah, yeah. So it could be even better for you for you if, if yeah. the cost is increasing. So if you consider a reduction in solar panel prices, yeah. that would be a reduction in the fixed cost of adopting technology. Mm -hmm. Plus, you have the carbon tax, so that would actually accelerate uh, the. Um, it would basically be used in this environment. Uh, or it's, you actually basically limit significant interest. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you so much for um, the uh, last presentation of the day, and uh, I promise to keep it on mic. So, uh, my name is Michi, I am a postdoc at the Sada Institute for Harvard University. Uh, my talk is about the value of weather. So the motivation for doing this research is based on the high demand for accurate weather forecasts throughout the human history. Mm -hmm. So basically, human beings request to have a higher, uh, uh, better information about what's going to happen for the exogenous shock of weathers from a real Asian times. And for nowadays, you know, because of the technology change and also the science development, weather forecasting has become quite popular as well as quite accurate across the years. So for example, if we look at the US weather forecast for uh, daily maximum temperature for three days ahead and seven days ahead from, 20, uh, from 1972 to 2017, the uh, trend of focus arrows in absolute uh, in mean absolute terms is decreasing continuously for about 35% uh, over this 45 uh, period of time. However, so accurate weather forecast is uh, quite useful and uh, in high demand for the society, they are also quite uh, costly. So most countries set up their own uh, weather stations or meteorological associations in charge of generating the most state-of-art weather forecast and deliver them to the public as a public good. The annual spending is not uh, ignorable. For China, the uh, amount is about 4 billion USD and the US is about 5 billion US. Uh, as a result, I think knowing this social value generated by more accurate weather forecasts can be quite useful for the policymakers as well as researchers who want to know what will be the social gains in developing better, better technologies to incorporate, uh, to, uh, incorporate into providing the better information about the uh, exogenous shock of weather. Is most of the spending public? I'm kind of surprised there is it. It isn't mostly private spending on weather forecasting. Uh, public. So these are the uh, national associate. So the so basically, it's the government agency that have to make the forecast. Right, right. My question is like, is that most of the spending, or is there also private spending on? Yeah, private spendings. Uh, I haven't summarizing that because I focus on the uh, public spending, which is fine. But there is a weather forecast market, especially in the U.S. So they provide like. Uh, more specified focus for industries that request them and request like a, more high frequency predictions rather than public. But like what I get on my weather app, that's like from some public source you do? Um, it depends on the weather app. So the, in the US, the weather app, I think is different. <laughs> for China, um, because, uh, so I choose the setting in China as part of a reason because the national center to generate the weather forecast is a quite uniform source for a couple of decades, only until recently when apps like Apple is providing a different source of weather forecast. Yeah. 
but uh, there is a paper studying the US NOAA source of weather forecast and also showing that is kind of important for the US mortality. I'm sure. I guess for the second bullet point about knowing the social value, it might be uh, it might be interesting if you have to take a stand on whether it should be public or private. Like, is it seems like something you can internalize the value? Yeah, of it's itself. like whether it should be a public good or whether we should have a market. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. So, just a really brief review. Um, previous uh, studies around weather forecast are mostly review uh, are mostly um, contingent valuation, so stated preference or view preference focusing on medium one focused about the rainfalls and their impact on specific industries that are more prone to climate risk, such as fishery and uh, agriculture. The more recent paper, uh, Shredder Limon and Mackinson 2023, is a paper that also focused on short-term weather forecast, day ahead weather forecast in the United States, and showing that the accuracy of this kind of forecast have a positive impact of reducing the mortality rate in the United States. I focus in this paper on the labor sectors because labor responses has been quite of a focus for climate economists. So in the previous three papers, all have been showing that across the world, the uh, labor studies uh, have, been, uh, have been indicating that the choice of how many hours to work per day is in response of extreme temperatures. Basically, when there are extreme temperatures, such as extreme heat, then there is a decrease in labor, in labor supply because people want to preserve their utility or health utilities, such that they will not be um, wasting their health when working under uncomfortable temperatures. I just a study in China, uh, part of the reason that I described that the country have a pretty uniform source of weather forecasting. And also, like by their uh, national surveys conducting by the agency that do the weather forecasting, uh, the, by stated preference, the value of weather forecast is pretty large, about 50 billion in 2015, and that's about 8 billion USD per year, much higher than the end budget of the uh, China Meteorological Association. So um, now, just a quick preview of my results. So uh, first question I want to answer, what is the impact of weather forecast on labor decisions? Basically, I found that the daily working hours is going to decrease upon receiving uncomfortable temperature forecast, but only when these forecasts are accurate enough. And second question, what will be the social value of more accurate weather forecast? And with a preference model that I incorporate in the empirical <laughs> results that I found, I discovered that the annual um, the annual social benefit generated by 3.9% increase of weather forecast accuracy is going to be enough or uh, almost enough to cover the annual cost spent by developing all this forecast. Uh, now going to the data collection. So for this project, I collect a novel data set by transcribing the videos of Ch the Chinese um, most popular weather forecast program on TV. And this process will provide me direct daily focus, uh, the information directly coming from the agent to the public for 34 provincial capital or centrally administrated, uh, administered municipalities for the year of 2010 and 12. Um, the temperature focus for non-capital cities are approximated because videos for those focused are not, uh, are not stored regularly on the website. However, I do run a statistical test um, with the existing videos of this non-capital city focused with my approximation and found no statistical difference. So in the end, my focus sample is restricted to mainland. It's about 31 uh, provincial capital cities and 311. So here's a, a very brief illustration of how I collect my weather focus data. So I have the video, I convert that to audio and put that in Google speech to text API, which reads what's broadcast in these videos. And then I can clean up these scripts, these scripts to achieve this kind of data set where I have the data of the focus, the CD of the focus and the content of the <clears> focus, <throat> which include a uh, temperature range uh, the, the minimum temperature and maximum temperature of focus and the categorical weather focus. For realized temperature, I use the ERA interim reanalysis 
uh, aggregated by population weights. The labor data, yeah. I understand. Are you using those transcripts because the data is not available, or is is there some kind of issue that they might be risk misrepresenting the data? Uh, so the uh, general way of generating random forecast in, uh, in modern world is that there are numerical models generating like the forecast for the whole country and also the surrounding area or even globally at once. And then this model itself is fed into local weather forecasters who will be judging like, for example, we have six models and then they would be discussing what will be the best focus based on our experience and then output to the public. So uh, that's general process. So there should be like some differences between the model for the model output and the one the information that's delivered finally to the public. But uh, uh, as you said, it's true also that I use this process to collect my data because um, they said the city level weather forecast is a frequently generating uh, data products, and uh, because of limiting space, <laughs> they are not stored. Do you not want to just use this information because it's the information that people are being given? Yeah, that's also one one uh one one reason for this. And it's like a it's a widely received received like information from like a TV program that's being evidenced by the highest viewership steps. Is this the same type of information that would be in like a newspaper or like online? Yeah. Or is it just a yeah, so like the, the, the same agency delivered okay. the data, and every media is going to throw that data. But like over, but in recent years, there are apps and apples. Uh, for the labor data, I use the uh, survey sample from the China Health Nutrition Survey for 2011-2013. I restrict them to the working age of 16 to 65. Uh, that covers 52 cities with a range of months from uh, summer to winter. Um, the control variables, I include the city year uh, demographic and macroeconomic variable from the city yearbook and uh, geographic characteristics by the State Bureau of Serial and There's a uh, summary statistics of my sample, which is uh, about 11,000. Um, so the sample covers a large range of reported hours of work last week from zero to like fully working. But all of these uh, workers are employed and none of them are not employed. So they are not just not working, not because they are in your jobs. The daily maximum temperature ranges from below zero to um, above 30, which is a pretty high range from the cold end to the high end. And uh, the age of the uh, average sample is like 43, uh, 44, and uh, more males uh, than females. The college degree holders take up 21.5%. That's much higher than the national average, by the way. And uh, there is a range of monthly uh, work, uh, the, the, the working time and the uh, wages that they earned. So this uh, sample represents a spectrum of workers from low income to high income. No, oh, it's, it's a little bit of a, of, a, of a difficult and annoying question, but why wouldn't you use ground truth monitor data in this context rather than, say, ERA interim? Like, it, given that the interim data is reanalysis, it's going to be using the types of models that are going into the forecasting as well as ground truth data. Do you not, when you're working at the city level, would you not just want city by day observe recorded temperature as the deviation from? Like oh yeah, yeah. Like, uh, why do I not use the station? Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, uh, I do think through that question. So, the realized data, uh, for uh, like uh, the uh, the real analysis data set I used. Um, uh, for one thing, uh, I can I'm able to like aggregate by population weight, which will show like the population that's being surveyed probably is going to face that like realized weather more often. And secondly, like um, uh, I'm trying to avoid this sort of like uh, manipulation, possible manipulation issues with station. Uh, it's going pretty far back from 2011 to 2015. Um, I'm not suspect. I'm not saying like there should be manipulation issues, but normally there is like suspicions that like for cities that are richer, they are able to find their local stations better, so their records is better. It may not be intentional. Okay. 
So uh, now going to that in strategy. So um, the uh, more uh, classical ways of doing uh, labor economics research on the climate contents is the graph CV and needle model. We are just uh, where we just uh, represent the daily uh, working hours as a flexible function of the maximum temperature, and, uh, and uh, controlling for a certain uh, a certain degree or a certain degree polynomials of precipitations and uh, fixed effects. However, if I use this model to show whether there is a response of foc of flavors to focus temperatures, the results I sh I see will be quite similar. To the, to the previous results that the, that the previous uh, literature is recorded, where there is a small and a statistically insignificant, in this case of my sample, decrease of labor working hours under the extreme hot, under the extreme hot days. However, this do not represent that the labor response is in response to focus temperatures, because focus temperatures and real life temperatures are over 95% correlated in my sample. So this only shows that labor is responding to temperatures, but it's not showing that whether laborers is recording what's going to be happening for tomorrow for the forecast. And I don't really know from this regression whether forecast is playing an important role. So to solve this question, I consider the <laughs> model adding a second treatment, which I call the perceived accuracy of weather forecast from the historical forecast. So what I do this is I take the units where arrows of the daily maximum temperature forecast for each city, taking back 183 days or so half a year. So this is the average metric of how accurate this weather forecast is for each city at each state. By design, this is both spatially and temporally varied. However, the spatial variation will be dominated because the averaging take away much of the temporal effects. Um, there are also economic and physical factors contributing to these variations. But however, um, from, from, well, firstly, uh, this is a special variation. Um, even with the sample, the uh, difference to the RSD, to the room square error metric that I take is up to two to three degrees Celsius. So when I run these RMSE metrics with uh, achievable observable economic and uh, environmental factors that may be affecting by the focus accuracy, I found that everything is playing only below 70% uh, of the variations, with the other 30% probably attributing to the limitation of focusing technology and uncontrollable, um, unpredictable events like the air and among, so, uh, among most of these uh, control variables that I uh, included, the blue being um, environmental factors like average climate and uh, uh, length of river bodies and also elevations. And the red ones, including some of the socioeconomic variables such as GDP per capita and population, uh, most of them only have a uh, statistically insignificant contribution to the variation in and uh, there are small ones, there are some, some that may be having some impacts to the RMSC metrics, but overall uh, the variations are not really uh, captured by all these factors. So uh, going to the main specification strategy. Um, so from the global regression, I add an interaction term of the uh, flexible function of the maximum temperature forecast with the RMSC metrics. In this case, I allow the uh, response of flavor to focus temperatures, not only varying under focus temperatures, but also varying under the accuracy of that focus. So the main result is as I illustrated over here. Um, so this is a three panel um, illustrations where each panel illustrates when scenarios of the focus temps. Going from left to right, the leftmost panel is the case when focus is inaccurate, when RMS equals three degrees Celsius. And the rightmost panel is my sample minimum, where RMS equals to one degree Celsius. So the, uh, so the plus indicates what's the relative labor working hours relative to the comfortable working hour, uh, what relative to the comfortable temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. Um, under different horizontal focus daily maximum temperatures. So in the rightmost case, when focus are inaccurate, then the labor response is almost flat or statistically insignificant from when they are at comfortable temperatures. However, when we go into the left, when focus become accurate, 
then there are statistically significant labor decrease on the two range of uncomfortable temperatures. One is the extreme heat, when daily maximum temperature forecast is about 30 degrees Celsius, and the other one is the medium cold, when the forecast is about 20 degrees Celsius. Taking into numbers, uh, it comes that when the forecast is 35 degrees Celsius, if RMS is only is 3 degrees, then the labor decrease is only 0.02 hours. But when this uh, RMSC is 1 degree Celsius, this labor decrease come to up to 2.29 hours. Pardon. Yeah. Just uh, Yeah. 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 Because on the left, they work more when it's meaningful. Yeah, I've seen later. Sorry. So, and the similar styles shows up in the modular effects plot, which is uh, what's the impact on daily working hours relative to 25 degrees Celsius when there is one degree Celsius increase in RMS. And I have the positive modular effects for these two temperature ranges. So now I'll go to the heterogeneity analysis, where I try to explore the mechanism behind um, what's happening for these labor responses. So um, the intuition and the theory goes that the uh, labors working under uncomfortable temperatures gains these utilities because of higher, higher health risk. So if you provide them with adequate information about what's going to be happening for the future, there may be better response in adaptation to extreme weathers by, decre by decreasing their labors. In this case, we'll be expecting to see this labor response to weather forecast more significant for the group of labors that are more sensitive to climate risk. So firstly, uh, so I basically, I run this regression by separating the labors into groups and allowing different labor responses. First, um, I run this uh, segregation by the uh, location of the labors. Uh, the one group of labors is uh, located on the northern part of the country, and the other is on the southern part of the country, uh, which is a pretty um, classical uh, Qing Huai line uh, separations, where the northern part of the country have the uh, greatest accessibility to heating, and the southern one do not. So what I see is the uh, response to the median cold range is only persisting in, a southern, in the southern part of the country. Which indicates that, which implies that for the uh, colder range, which is below 15 degrees Celsius, both south and northern, uh, both south and northern cities will have more access to heatings, so they are less sensible to weather forecast. But when the cold is not that cold, then this only then the southern uh, then the southern city workers do not have that access, so they will be responding to forecast um, as as a, as a substitute. And the next one I had to do is well, separating the workers by groups of two, where I found that vulnerable workers are among the ones that um, are responding most, most seriously to weather forecast. So basically, uh, those are the workers with lower than college degrees, and the workers uh, with age about 40, and also the workers with a lower household income, a lower individual incomes, and a uh, uh, smaller working hour or, or, or hourly working wage, and as well as those workers that's in the, urban, in the rural instead of the urban areas. So this match the uh, mechanism that uh, the workers that are more vulnerable uh, on the climate risk, like the ones that are older, or the ones that are earning less from their normal workings, such as the one who is a uh, lower hourly wage, uh, the other ones that mostly responding to weather forecasts because um, changing their behaviors under accurate weather forecasts is giving them the most trade off under uncomfortable temperature shocks. So um, you, you, you might have shown, but is there any correlation between the, the root mean spread error and like the economic structure of that area? So I'm just thinking about yeah, what actually, major would respond so. Sensitively to that, yeah, exactly. Yeah, seeing the uh, second part, so the yeah. red bars. So most of them are statistically insignificant, except for the city area. And and, yeah, I scale scale them to fit in this way. Uh, but I also have uh, actually seen the robustness check slides, but I only have three minutes. So um, I also add these economic controls into the regression uh, in controlling of the RMSE, and uh, the other effects is not. 
So uh, just briefly, uh, my evaluation model. So based on my empirical findings, um, I uh, assume a single peer to utility maximization models where laborers will make their next day's uh, decisions of how many hours to work per day based on today's information of weather forecast and the uh, perceived accuracy of that forecast. So I uh, uh, simplify the model with a quadratic form of the utility function uh, allowing the workers to solve the expected utility maxim maximization problem and solve the two parameters of the utility functions using either the um, empirical found, uh, the empirical estimated response function that I found, uh, assuming a good enough forecast, and uh, uh, also correcting the uh, labor supply elasticity from the previous Chinese literatures. Uh, from that, I'm able to do some integration and estimate the value of forecast as a function of the accuracy of weather forecast. So um, this is the main result relative to the um, most optimal case in my sample where RMSE equals to one, there is, a, uh, there is a continuously decreasing function of the value of weather forecast when the RMSE, in this case A, is increasing. Uh, when I run the 95% uh, confidence interval with MC and C Monte Carlos, uh, uh, they are comfortably below, um, they are comfortably below uh, B0 axis. And uh, in general, basically the evaluation found the value of decreasing with greater RMSC. Uh, and on average, the per unit RMSC decrease contributes about 930 Chinese yuan per person per year. And that's about one third to one fourth of the monthly wage in the sample. And it's the same, also same, the same order of magnitudes as the gains of one degree increase in focus accuracy in the uh, shader ATL paper, uh, which is about 150 USD. Uh, and uh, when aggregated to the national level, um, considering a 3.9% decrease of CT year average focus room square arrows from 2011 to 2015, which is a real life scenario then this result is uh, implying the social gains of, uh, of about 25.3 billion Chinese yuan or 4.43 billion USD every year. And uh, that's also like a similar magnitude of the total expenditure of the CMA, which generates the benefits. So um, just a brief summary. Um, I'm also running the other projects showing the positive impacts of accurate weather forecast for decreasing road congestions and decreasing the electric second shocks. And I think this uh, work will be quite uh, interesting to policymakers under the perspective of climate change, where more extreme weather is going to be expected. And knowing that we should be uh, investing more into focusing technologies and providing the most up-to-date information about future extreme, uh, extreme weather to the public. And uh, that will be a pretty good way to assess like what will be the cost and what will be the additional benefit of trying to incorporate technologies in mitigating climate change risk. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Since this deals mainly with the urban labor market, and my question is, if you were to extrapolate the results to the, uh, you had some information on rural labor market, particularly agriculture, uh, I would have thought that uh, uh, the conclusion would be that China is massively underinvesting in weather forecasting technology, viewed from the standpoint of agricultural productivity and agricultural labor. Right. So your conclusion is, hey, this is we're spending about the right. As I understand your data. We're spending about the right amount for the urban labor market. But when you think about spending that same amount, which they obviously are, for the whole country. And you have agriculture out there where we know that weather forecast information for agriculture is terribly important for agricultural productivity. They are massively underspending what they should. Is that a fair interpretation of your data, do you think? Um, I would say it's hard to say because this is like the most generalized public level of weather forecast. Mm -hmm. The agriculture sector, both for the China and US, there is additional like new work in the US about that, the agriculture sector will see some additional information. So it's like the farmers have their like connections with these stations where like people are like, hey, today is not a good day to go work. <laughs> today is the right day. Please go like see. And without these conditions, you may have to wait another year. So yeah, there is like a difference in the products that we're trying to assess. 
uh, I'm not sure whether that sort of investment is incorporated in the um, CMA, CMA, which is generating the public level by the focus, or actually in the agriculture department. But I'm assuming like, yeah, like that's also like quite important and the effects will be much more significant among those groups. I mean, maybe to build on that, you could maybe look at the, how much the farm that seeing not just during the growing season. I don't yes. know how much that matters in general for people. Yeah, that, that will be quite interesting because the growth season will also vary across regions. Yes, but that could be. Yeah. If you, if you have a somewhat longer weather forecast, a, would, would you consider that farmers in rural areas or workers in urban areas would adjust their labor hours? So that you would have more work when when if, if if the weather is deteriorating two days away, then they would perhaps do more work tomorrow because they expect to do lower work day after tomorrow. Do you allow for that kind of response? Um, so the current one I use the twenty four hour ahead forecast, but the long term impact impacts is of quite a lot of interest because as you said, there is this intertemporal substitution. In yes. Um, because the increased villagers, they do found that though there is probably labor responses to weather forecast, there is a positive, positive impact on the uh, employment benefit and firm benefit from more accurate weather forecast in the media. So it do indicates that though there are these decreasing of like labors on extreme temperatures, it seems like the total like productivity is not impacted as much. So um, there is quite a possibility of these intertemporal substitutions, but um, currently I do not have a high frequency data set to support that claim. So I can only look at the aggregate levels of employment and GDPs and stuff like that to show like, okay, the aggregate impact is not negative. So it's probably going to happen. So like the intertemporal substitution is likely uh, a side effect. Because, because from, from rain forecasts, this is happening all the time. You expect that it will rain day after tomorrow. Therefore, you spend more working hours uh, tomorrow. So that kind of adjustment is being done all the time. Mm -hmm. So if you could just have reliable forecasts two or three days down the road, you may see a, a more interesting labor response. Okay. Yeah, that's really interesting. I should consider like combining both the shot and a little bit longer run forecast in the next step. 